Hansen only has eight seconds. This is where we're staying until we have a result. This is this is uh this is where the action is right here. Play work to D6. Okay, there's been one wrap. He's gonna Time repeat to once and it may end up being just a whole bunch of, Ooh! Oh, oh 96! He just misses this! Just blunders oh. his rook! Wow! Huge, oh. huge comeback by Hansen. A devastating loss there for Fernandez, who, if you're just joining us, had had a clear advantage earlier as Black. Um, I don't know if it was ever winning, but was definitely better. But handed handed to Hansen, who managed to work his way back in this game. Okay. And we are here, week three of the 2019 Pro Chess League getting set to begin. Alongside me, the wonderful, the amazing Jennifer Shahadi. And uh, we, are, we have the privilege and the honor of calling the Atlantic Division here. So to, uh, to jump right into that, Jen, Nor you spend a lot of time in St. Louis. How impressed have you been so far with the St. Louis Archbishops and their performance in 2019 as we look at the standings or... Uh, or are you, are, is this sort of what we should expect out of them as we see they're taking on the uh, windmills this week and once again going to be led by Fabiano Caruana? Well, yeah, I think that we always got to expect a lot from St. Louis. I spend, it's my second home. Um, they're so much for commentary. Um, they really have put a lot of thought and passion into creating um, the most competitive team they can. But I, at the same time, today, I'm going to try to be at least somewhat objective. This is going to be a really tough match. It absolutely I is. I called you Yaz, by the way. Hey, that's okay. If, uh, it, would be, it would be a compliment and an honor to be called Yaz, so I'll take that. Um, but okay, let, let's take a look at this as we see everybody. The 2019 standings as they currently stand, in case you haven't been following the league as closely as you intend to from here on out. Moving left to right, we see that the Eastern Division... We have two teams deadlocked there with 19 and a half games apiece. Mumbai Movers, a name that has been here since 2017. And then the brand new Moscow Wizards. In the Central Division, Jen, we have a, uh, another new team leading the way. This time in clear first, the Barcelona Raptors are a half a point ahead of the Amsterdam Mosquitoes there. So that's, that's been impressive. But in the Atlantic Division, we have the Bishops right there at top. And, and, but perhaps the most surprising thing, or, or not, depending on how closely uh, you follow Twitch, is that the Montreal Chess Bras are right there with the Bishops as it currently stands going into Week 3 play here. And uh, with, 
with 20 and a half points apiece, the fact that they're keeping pace with the juggernaut led by Carwana and So on boards one and two, you got to be impressed with the chess bras so far. That's right, and that's a match that we're going to get to call today as well. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> the uh, let's let's move into the schedule here and remind everybody of uh, what the full season is. Of course, uh, those of you who've been following from week one, you'll notice there in the uh, the red section, the playoffs, that uh, we have had a date change or two. Uh, rather than all of the playoffs concluding in March, we will now actually roll into April, just one day in April, April 2nd there. Uh, we, we coordinated that actually with the team in St. Louis. Jen, you'll be happy to know while you're there covering the U.S. Championship. With Yaz and Maurice, uh, we will be avoiding conflicting coverage, both for the purposes of having the strongest players compete in the Pro Chess League, and then also to avoid, of course, uh, fans having to be torn between their favorite chess shows. So if you've been following the schedule closely, everybody, there you go. Um, another thing everyone's following closely, Jan, I don't know how, how much you're involved, but are you playing Fantasy Pro Chess League this year? I, yes, I am. I gotta, I gotta break my brother, Danny. Yeah, Nothing of course. Nothing like more than to collect that $10,000 in person. Yeah. I actually would just take like uh, two minutes to walk over to his house, knock on his door, and say, "Hey, Greg, write me that check." Greg, write the check, or or you could prefer, you know, small bills or twenty, whatever, right? I mean, you could you could have hundreds, you could have any sort of. I, I would take cash if I was knocking on the door. I guess if uh, if I was going to visit Greg myself, but all right, well, um, if you haven't been playing fantasy chess, everybody get involved. Uh, I think it's. Is it too late now to fill out a bracket this week? Probably is, but go ahead and use the fantasy command in Twitch. That's exclamation point fantasy, and um, learn all about it. We also have a new command this week, Jen, before we dive into the chess that I want to tell all the fans about because it's actually a very, very useful thing both for commentators and those following the league. If you type the command slash follow with the hashtag PCL in live chess, you will instantly be following all games at once. So I know you guys will be saying it took you three years to finally get it right, chess.com, with, uh, with an efficient way to follow all of these crazy games as they're going. But now it's a, it's a simple command, and our mods in Twitch or Chess TV will help you with exactly what I just said. But it is a slash follow command with a hashtag PCL that will instantly have you locked in to following all the games in progress, no longer having to scroll through and find them one by one. So that's good news. Oh, wow, so I just got some um, interesting news. I'm, I'm checking out the Twitch chat, and Greg says that actually you have uh, about 15 more minutes to fill out your bracket, so jump oh. in there. And what's really interesting is that that means that you can actually check out the openings before you click send. Danny, I actually I actually had no idea of this. So you can is, that, is that legal? I mean... It... If that's legal from now on, I'm going to start filling out my bracket on air. I'm going to watch the openings and then just quickly switch and fill up my bracket at the deadline. So that could be the future right there. I like that. I think so. That's the, that's the GTO way to do it, Danny. Um, that said, of course, the, um, the later matches, you'd, have to, you'd, you'd pick it out in advance, and then you'd just um, fix up your first four based on the openings of the game. That's true. That's true. So you'd have to do it the way everyone else does, with them, but you could get an advantage there. Uh, the matchups that are going to be going down, everyone, you see the standings right below us, or sorry, not the standings, the pairings for this week. We have the Lions taking on the Sopranos. As we've said, we have the Crosstown St. Louis battle going on there with the Archbishops taking on the Webster Windmills. That's pretty big. You've got the Pawn Grabbers taking on the Marshals, and then the Champions taking on the Chess Bras. Jen, obviously the St. Louis matchup has everyone's attention, not just because it's, it's our only real Crosstown, Crosstown rival match this week, uh, but, but also just because of the names competing. But other than the St. Louis match, give us, give us a, a matchup that you're looking forward to here uh, before the games get, get set here. Well, it's a lot about individual players that I'm really excited about. I, I see that uh, my, my fellow, my name twin, Jennifer Yu, is going to be um, playing for the Pittsburgh Pawn Grabbers, so I'm really excited about that. I also um, am really close by to the Montclair Sopranos, so okay. that's kind of like the closest thing that I have to a hometown team besides, of course, my second home, St. Louis. So Michael Rode, Alex Lenderman, Sam Sevian, and Tommy Bartel, and recently announced that Ho Yi Fan is joining um, that team as well. Mm -hmm. it, really strong. Too bad she's not playing tonight, but I'm going to be really interested in this match. London Lions um, headed up by Grandmaster Ramon Edward, who is really a fantastic player and writer. So this, this match really intrigues me as well. Yeah. 
No, that's a great one, and, and uh, I didn't know about your ties there with the with the Sopranos. Obviously, you have a lot of friends in the chess world, but uh, good good to know that uh, the Sopranos have have some backing there. Jen Shahadi's a fan. All right, looking at the standings again, everybody, there you have it. We are about to cover the Atlantic Division, so a reminder of just how big this matchup that's about to go down between the Bishops and the Windmills is. It's not just that they're both from St. Louis, really the unofficial, unofficial, that's a word, nope, first first, <laughs> first mouse slip, tongue, tongue uh, tie of the day. The uh, What we've got here is St. Louis and Webster throwing down. It's big because of the names playing and... Webster is in third place right now. They're only one point behind the Bishop. So an upset victory, which is something I would consider an upset, if uh, if Ray Robson can and Ilya Nizhnik can kind of help lead the windmills over Fabiano Caruana and Wesley So in the Archbishop. So uh, that's really that's really the biggest matchup I think of the day. But if the Chess Bras can take advantage of the fact, Jen, that the Bishops have a tough one, maybe they get an even more dominant victory and, and can leapfrog the Bishops in the standings when all is said and done here. Yeah, that would be interesting. I mean, and you can never count out Webster. I mean, really that epic number of championship titles, seven in a row, Danny. Um, and that, and maybe in the beginning it was like quite easy, but now the competition is so fierce with um, other college teams really um, amping up their ran rosters with top grandmasters like yep. um, St. Louis University. So yeah, and um, I really feel like there's something special about Webster in their team spirit. If you're not familiar with uh, the event Jen is referring to, it is the Pan American Collegiate Chess Championship, uh, and uh, that that event actually just concluded around the holidays. And uh, you you should follow the Webster Windmills and and Susan Polgar's program a little more closely if you weren't aware of uh, that. As you said, Jen, seven national titles. That's 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 redunculous. That's redunculous. I think that's what the kids would say. Um, all right, the games start in about 30 seconds, I believe, Ooh. or they're getting and, you close. Know, I one of the exciting things to me about the Montclair Sopranos roster is that uh, it's it's so female friendly. Half the squad is is women, Danny. Yeah, let's go back one more time, real quick, to the pairings today, showing the Sopranos and who they are uh, who they're throwing out there uh, today. Today, no no female players on on the docket, but as you said, their full roster includes a lot of them, and uh, people should be aware that you can check out. Everything about these teams at ProChessLeague.com. That is the uh, official website and where you can dive into a little more details. And uh, there you have it, though. As you said, Jennifer Yu will be playing for the Pawn Grabbers. So uh, that's, uh, that's, that's one uh, female or especially even a rising star, I think you would say, in the chess world as a whole. Maybe, uh, maybe some U.S. Women's Championship titles in her future. But there you have it right there. The Chess Bras, once again, are led by Sarge and Van Kampen. And I believe games are about to start throwing down here in just a well, moment almost luckily i've got the slash follow hashtag pcl so as soon as those um games uh start they're gonna pop up on my screen and, and um as you mentioned earlier danny er anyone can do that yep so and, you don't have to manually follow people anymore I, i'm nervous about it because i haven't used this command yet myself in live action i've been confirmed by uh, uh by the team that all seems to be well and we've got this amazing new uh quick tool that'll help us as the, uh, the most exciting chess event of the week throws down, which can be also overwhelming for commentators and fans to follow, and that's the purpose of that tool, is to make, make following it a little bit easier. So as soon as the games get underway, we will be, hopefully, treated with, uh, with the, uh, the pop-up of the board. But let's give our first shout-out to Twitch Chat. Jen, I saw you hanging out there earlier, just to say hey to everybody that's in there. All of our oh, mods. Oh, yeah. I see, I see Danny Road, certainly rooting for the Sopranos. I see Crypto Chess, Alexander Katz. Um, I see uh, Chess Bay, of course. Um, Lady Macbeth. Just uh, lots of people. And then also, by the way, I'm also monitoring the chess.com TV chat. So I'll, I'll kind of uh, pop over to both streams when we have yep. a very rare law in the action. Yep. And uh, I am also following both chess. Not sure who the name Sweden is on Twitch, but I agree. We should bring a team uh, back to Sweden. We had a team from Stockholm uh, that has currently, that had actually transferred now uh, the Baden-Baden snowballs in the central division. So if you're looking for something kind of close by or with sort of loose, loose roots, maybe, maybe that, maybe that suits your fancy there, Sweden, whoever, whoever you are there. But uh, yeah, uh, we, a we are actually getting very close to announcing what the qualifier system will be for the 2020 season, getting a little bit more ahead of things every year that we do the Pro Chess League. And uh, your brother, 
the commissioner himself, Greg Shahadi, has thought up what I think is actually going to be our best format yet by far in regards to the qualifier system and how we give more teams the opportunity to get in, um, but also make sure it's still difficult and prestigious. Last year, Jen, I don't know if you, I don't know if he told you, but we had we had to deny teams who wanted to qualify for the league. We had to deny them even a chance to play. Um, and so this year we're going to try not to do that, but in order to do that, we had to kind of think of a creative way for the qualifier system to become uh, more than just a, a single day event. So we're pretty excited about that. I won't say much more until Greg is ready, but uh, should be announced fairly soon. Speaking of fairly soon, guess what we have? We have the chess game games. Underway. Michael Road, a grandmaster, playing for the Sopranos against Ravi Haria for the Lions. And look at that. This tool is amazing. I'm not even clicking anything, and we just have games being followed. We uh, we bow down before the uh, the chess.com live chess architect. Uh, Piot, thank you, buddy. Thank you for throwing this one around. And, like, like, literally, I requested this idea, Jen, on, like, Sunday night. So he turned it around in less than 48 hours. I was like, you know what would be really cool if we just stop all these shenanigans and just make a single command that all people have to type? And it was like, boom. So, love it. Um, You've got a team there, don't you? <laughs> well, where do you want to go first? As you said, we've got Alexander Lenderman playing for the Sopranos. Uh, currently looks like he's about to throw down in a... A Petrov uh, defense here. We have. Um, We've got Marcus Harvey versus Sam Sevian. This game looks like it's going to be interesting. Uh huh. I'm um, re ready variation. Um, yeah, we're, we're covering. And... Where do you want to go? I mean, yeah, we've got a ready variation here of Marcus Harvey versus Sevian, which is, which is unique, I guess. Um, not necessarily unique, but you don't you don't always see strong players having to face an opening like the ready, but I think you see it a lot more in online blitz formats these days. Um, we'll see what Sevion comes up with here against this well, B3, the, Bishop B2 system. Maybe the Robertson Lenderman game is a good one to start with, as you mentioned. It's a Petrov, and that's the kind of opening that's either going to sizzle or fizzle. Right. So, you know, it's either going to be like a bunch of trades and kind of dull, or something exciting is going to happen real soon. So, we're going to we're going to dive into the analysis here on this Petrov game. Let me remind the fans really quick of the format. Um just being uh, asked to uh to remind the fans of that just in case you're new to the league again. This is a global affair. The Pro Chess League has teams from 32 teams from five different continents and uh it's uh it's busy two days a week here on twitch.tv/chess chess.com tv. The time control is 15:2. In the head-to-head -head matches, you get 10 points for winning a match, but also one point for each game, which is a storyline story line we keep coming back to because it's something that will pay dividends if you make sure your team, even if they lose a match, doesn't get blown out, right? The ability to keep it close will eventually pay off because you may get yourself in the playoffs or prevent your team from being relegated by your consistent performance, even if you do lose some close and heartbreaking matches. So keep that in mind, everyone, as you, as you follow the league this year. All right, Jen. I'm I'm on the uh, I'm on the Petrov game. What do you know about this line that you can uh, that we can share with everybody? Uh, let's take a look at it from the beginning. It yep. uh, Looks like yeah. This this is obviously not one of the most typical lines. We didn't see a knight takes e5. We didn't see the really trendy knight c3 lines. Uh huh. So bishop d3, and then after knight takes e5. I, I don't know a whole lot about this right now, but I, I like that the structure is a little bit more um, imbalanced than some of the things that we sometimes see in the Petra. Yeah, and I think from Black's perspective, okay, Lenderman, obviously the the, the stronger player, favored in this game, I guess on paper, um, is, you know, he seems to be playing uh, playing quickly enough that he's comfortable. I guess he is down a little bit on the clock, but Black Black's first goal is to equalize, even if you are the stronger player. So you can't be trying to make things too crazy at first. And I think that if Black can trade on d3, getting the bishop pair, and then a move like d6 is trying to ensure that he'll have an open board. Uh, I think Black should be fine. One of the one of the dangers of this structure, if you're Black, is if you leave White with this pawn on e5, uh, in a lot of positions where, by definition, that means there's no knight on f6. This bishop on d3 is poking at h7. The, the bigger picture here is you could get in trouble on the king's side if you're black. So that's one of the things about d6. I think black just wants to open the position and simplify it at the same time. And white is going gonna to do his best to keep the pieces on the board here. Rookie 1 has an immediate threat, uh, of course, that Alex uh, stopped there with d takes e5. 
That's after, right. And even night, even night takes D3 would have been possible because after uh, takes on D6 discovered check, you can meet that with knight takes E1. Yep. And I was wondering if he was going to do that. He didn't. He decided he decided he didn't need that and instead takes quickly and plays bishop E6. But I, I like this too, Jim, because how does white avoid the loss of this bishop on D3? I think that it looks to me like black is going to get the bishop pair and possibly a very quick castle's queen side. And I'm already liking Linderman's chances in this game. I see what you mean. And the other thing is that rook takes e5 could also be a liability because there's a reason that we don't usually centralize our rooks. Right. We put them on centaur files but not center squares. And that's because a move like bishop d6, queen f6 is going to gain a tempo right. on that rook. No, it's so, a great point. Yeah, bishop d6, queen h4, castle's queen side. Um, it could end up being really fun. Almost, dare I say, like... Uh, improve Scandinavian. Yeah, I was gonna say. Well, I mean, Scandinavian is is not is not too bad, I don't think. But it is. Uh, I thought you were gonna say an improved French with some sort of. Anyway, that worried me a little bit. But no. Um, yeah, I agree. And it looks to me like White has other problems to deal with even before the move like Bishop D6. Now, now Lenderman can play C6, and if something like, in fact, he's already played it. And if Queen takes D8, Rook takes D8, White has to come back with Bishop E. Okay, Bishop E2 or Bishop F1. But how is Okay, rook d1 is met by knight c3. I guess that's the key. White can both defend the bishop and gain a tempo on the rook at the same time. So that's key. But it does seem like black is in, is completely comfortable here. Um, I, I would be choosing between ideas like g6 and bishop g7, because the bishop on that diagonal could be really irritating for black to deal with. Or your move, Jen, just bishop d6 right now, gain a quick tempo, get the king out of the center, and, and have an easy time with black in the middle game. Yeah, um, Alexander Katz, I think, is already saying that he thinks this is, looks really crushing for Black. Um, perhaps crushing, an crushing a, I think crushing might be a little too much, but but I, I agree that Black Black should be pushing. I mean, only because I don't see how Rook D1 wins on the spot. So if Rook D1 isn't winning, I don't. I think that White will complete development. The question is, will there be other issues for for White in the process of trying to get developed? Bishop E7 is nice because I think Knight C3 might might have to run into things like bishop f6 at some point, like a skewer you got to watch out for. Okay, not right away, the knight's hanging, but something like that. So meanwhile, Spinal Tap has uh, started his game, which is, of course, Roman Edouard. The top board for the London Lions yep. is playing against international master Tommy Bartel, who's from my neck of the woods. Of course, New Jersey and Philadelphia are are really close to each other. That's why I know so many, and I'm, I'm friendly with so many members of the Sopranos. Um, so that game actually looks really exciting, Danny. Yeah, it's so uh, Spinal Tap is Thomas Bartel, by the way. Shout out, one of the greatest movies of all time. Real quick, got to say that. Um, but Muggsy, uh, Romaine Ed Edward, as you said, is... Has oh, been... I'm sorry, I think I said that wrong. Yeah, no, it's okay. Uh, Mug uh, he's, uh, he's, he performed well for the Lions, even in their week one uh, where they, where they lost. Um, but uh, he's, he's played well so far. Here he's going to have his work cut out for him, I think, because Bartel is good not only in these formats. He's been playing in the league since before it was the Pro Chess League, all the way back in the U.S. Chess League days, and I think he, I think he feels confident in this sort of team setting. And I, I, I kind of like White's position here. The bishop on e5 uh, is completely in contrast to the knight on a6 in a very great dominant square. The knight on a6 can't move without the c7 pawn falling. Um, if uh, if White wants, White can even play a move like B4 and try to keep this knight on the edge for even even longer. So uh, Queen E7 was uh, the choice of Roman Edouard trying yep. to kind of gain some coordination as the Queen E8 wasn't doing anything anymore. So yeah, Rook, Queen... I, I like Rook E1, but this looks like it could be tough. So I think the key is can Edward move the knight from F6 and try to force away White's grip on these on these central dark squares. Okay, or and, and on that note, indeed, he plays knight e4 trying to simplify and get rid of white's strong grip here, but let's see if we can try to guess what Bartel's up to. Well, yeah, I like what you're saying here, Danny, because if we can force, for instance, bishop takes g7, then it's nice because we suddenly have potential control over the e5 square again. Mm -hmm. If if we if we take with the queen, for instance, we're we're you, we have control. But the problem with queen takes is then there's some other things we might have to worry about, 
like the weakness of the e6 square yep. is there a way to take advantage of it luckily knight takes e4 bishop takes e4 gains a tempo so we don't have time for knight g5 but, but i'm still really but, worried about that square in general but your idea of knight g5 might be possible right away because the knight is sort of pinned if the knight takes on g5 bishop takes b7 and okay i I don't know if that's a trade that White's thrilled about, but it is leaving White with the only uh, bishop on the board and, and some dominant control over the light squares. So I like that tactic, and I like the idea of knight g5. Yeah, other... it's interesting. It seems like a good idea, but that said, White's position looks so tempting. Is it the best thing we can do? Yeah. I'm not sure. Rook takes d8 played um, immediately, forcing rook takes d8. Maybe he's trying to do it with the insertion of that move. Nope. Ooh, wow, that's interesting. White is... Fighting for the d-file and laughing in the face of danger on c3. The main point here, everyone, is that if rook takes, queen takes, knight takes c3, white has queen d8 check, I think, in her mizzo. But then, but then queen f8. Is it? Is this really great? Because after takes, I mean... Oh, okay, uh, Bartel's already taken back on d1 with the knight, so he's not going to go for that line. But, but if this is the case, I feel like Edward has completely turned this around from my initial evaluation that I liked white's grip. I mean, yeah, I agree. I, I, it surprises me that he went for this because it seems like maybe there was something a little better, right? I, yeah. Or hard to imagine that this is the best that White could have done. I uh, agree. You know what move I was thinking might have been possible on. all the way back on like move 15 was a move like knight to b5 hitting the a7 pawn, which, okay, kind of feels weird to go pawn grabbing with a pawn on a7, but that's not the easiest pawn for black to defend without giving up the d-file. So, okay, we don't have a computer... I just feel like I liked white, now we don't, and that with this knight going backwards and you've lost control over the center, looks like Edward is, is pulling out of this one. All right, so do you want to um, pop over to another game? Yeah, I mean, um, we can we quickly quickly just yeah. point out that Alexander L. Lenderman is, you know, like we said, it's not really great for, not no real great winning chances, easy, easy equalizing effort by, by Alex as black, but nothing... I don't know that without white cooperating that this has great winning chances for black, but okay, we'll keep an eye on it. Where do you want to go, Jen? Uh, Marcus Harvey versus Sam Savion. Okay. I, uh, I also want to give a shout out to the fact that we've got all three Shahadis on the stream. As uh, I, I noticed that my, my dad uh, gave a shout out to, to little Fabian <laughs> in, in the chat. So FM Mike Shahadi is also in there. And meanwhile, we're looking at FM Marcus Harvey's game against Sam. Yep. What do you think? Who do you take here? Don't ignore the ratings. Do you like yeah. white or do you like Fox? No, I, I have to ignore the ratings because I like white. I, uh, the first first thought I have is that, okay, so in the, in this structure, if, if white can get B5 and this bishop has to retreat, you've got, you've got some easier access to the central light squares, and maybe then you can manufacture E4. So, for example, if... You know, let's say Sevion does something silly just to illustrate the point, and b5 comes in, the bishop goes back to d7. Now white can get e4, and what you're looking at is a very big center, a Meroxy bind structure where white just has a lot of space and enough pieces to use the space, right? If you have a lot of space and no miners, then it's no big deal. But So I think that's the danger for black here. Um, of course, the drawback of something like that, everyone, is that if you overextend on the queen side something like b5 and the bishop comes around from d7 to e6, then a pawn on c4 is a weakness on the semi-open file. So it's a little double-edged, but my instincts say that Harvey has held his own so far in the first stage. I agree. And, you know, he is white and he's a strong FM, so it kind of makes sense. I mean, I'm not shocked that he gets a good position with white. Yeah. But... Well, that's a good move right there by Sam, actually. It highlights kind of the point we were just saying. With b6, black is saying, yeah, you can play b5, but I will make sure I keep the bishop on this all-important kind of h1 a diagonal to keep preventing e4 so I, I b6 is a strong move there i think by sevion and, and this one has a lot left a lot left and, to that, play. and of course b5 could be a, a big positional error if right. you don't have your follow-up because and then the, the c5 square is so golden yeah bishop just moves back and says unfortunately you can't move that pawn backwards and i'm going to stick a knight on c5 right. however long it takes me and d5, of course, could be a potential plan for black. Yeah, that's a great point. So what do we do here for what? I mean, you'd almost like to play a move. Okay, you can't do this, but if you could if you could get your bishop to f3 or some sort of piece that supports e4, you would like to keep driving for the center. Um, but you the always got to look at, look at the move knight d5, right? That's knight a, d5 that's right a, away, right? Yeah. 
Yeah, because the thing about B6 is there's a slight edge for it in some of these knight D5 lines in that we uh, can have more control over the C6 square right. if we have a pawn on D5. Right. No, that's like a huge this, point. I love that the move that uh, Marcus played as well. He played um, bishop D3. I, I think he's cooking up something on the E4 square. Yeah. Well, I was highlighting that um, as we were as as I was trying to say that that would be one way to try to force e4. But the risk of that move is you do block the queen and rook. So Sevion is gonna have to calculate a move like d5 himself now. Um, obviously, these players are probably calculating tactics a little deeper than us, Jen. Let's hope they are. Let's hope they're calculating tactics deeper than we are. Um, <laughs> and uh, and if so, if Sam decides he can safely play d5, then he will. But I, I liked your move, knight d5, and it's a really instructive point, I think, for the uh, fans and members who maybe don't know these positions as well, that that's like a little alarm clock that you just said there. When, whenever you're playing Maroxy Bind and the pawn goes to b6, be aware of the weaknesses on the c6 square that become available, and, and, and in a move like knight d5 could open up ideas where you, where you really execute what Jen was saying and try to take advantage of the light squares as kind of a long-term endgame advantage. So, okay, Harvey didn't go for that. He played bishop d3, but... But we'll see if Sevion tries to tries to punish him with d5 here in just a moment. Let's let's go over to this one, Jen. The uh, the game between Grandmaster Michael Rode and Ravi Haria. This is an isolated queen pawn that could be about to get nutty here with all kinds of tactics coming over here to the queen side. Oh, sorry, the king side. Ooh, indeed. So this is fun. So the move queen c6 was just played, and now it's Michael Rode on move. And the big question is, why don't we just uh, take right snatch a pawn right on h7? It makes me feel like, uh, why is this not just mate and two? Did we just come to, this is like a clip of a yeah. moment, just mate and two. We, queen c6 what? was a horrible blunder. The queen gave up f7. Oh and my now, gosh. And there it is. We looked at the board, and I'm like, I'm about to start highlighting isolated queen pawn principles about how you can get an attack on the king side in some positions. And on the board, it's literally mate. Um, That's right. Bishop takes h7 check. You can't take with the knight because queen h7 made, and that is a bishop on f8, not a rook. So king h8, knight takes f7 is made. This was hilarious, and I feel I feel like an idiot for the first time. I guess I'll get used to it. That happens a lot when I do shows. But Jen, that was pretty funny, right? I mean, we're we're waiting to highlight principles, and just like that, it's mate and two. So if you're ever playing black and isolated queen pawn, now you know the danger of tactics if you're not careful about the way white's minor pieces can come to life. And thank you, Michael Rode, for the instructive moment. Tactics are king. And speaking of kings, the St. Louis Art Cups underway is their match with the windmills on board one. To kick it off, we've got Fabiano, Fabiano versus Talia Cervantes. And when when yeah, you said right. speaking of kings, I knew who you were talking about, right? The highest rated player in action right now, of course, is Fabiano. Um, and uh, uh, by the way, again, he's employing this sort of queen's pawn two knights, Jen. I don't know if you followed week one, but Fabi played this same opening as black um, in, uh, in that week as well. And if players are, are watching this and trying to help prepare their team for an eventual battle with the bishops this year, they might want to start taking notice of Fabiano's liking of this line because he's now employed it at least two times that I've seen. <laughs> but he knows that they know, right? Right. Well, I, I mean, I'm, you know, I'm trying to give advice for how to play against Fabiano Caruana, right? I mean, it's not the easiest thing to do. So, um, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but, uh, well, well, but okay, I mean, let's be honest, right, to uh, provide instructive, for the, instructive moments for the fans, regardless of the fact that this is Fabiano Caruana playing black, there's a reason this isn't the most popular line, everybody, if we back up and go through the opening. Typically, a very, very basic rule for beginner chess is don't lead the way with your knights in front of pawns when, you, when your opponent has a big, a big center because of what you see here where white can play moves like, like d5 and, and are immediately start gaining space. And with ideal play, if you put stockfish versus stockfish here, you're looking at a position where white is almost half a pawn better with this kind of big space advantage. Now, Talia, for whatever reason, goes um, for the e3 line, doesn't want to play the really aggressive big space with e4. Um, Uncle Yermo always told me the problem with playing e3 is that as soon as you play it, you just want to play e4. That was Uncle Yermo's advice, but anyway. Um, but you can, at least you can. It's better than playing e3 and wanting to play e2. That's true. Good point, good point, right? Um, anyway, so this is a line that I think unbiasedly uh, White's okay, but Fabiano clearly knows the positions well. He, he almost has more time than he started with, and, and I don't think that Talia has played the most aggressive approach in where you might try to really punish this two knights. Um, kind of Indian game here for, for Black. 
And meanwhile, uh, we've got Wesley So versus Emilio um, Cordova. So yep. all Grandmaster battle. You know, really just an incredible lineup today for the St. Louis Archbishops, Danny. Um, it, it would take, it's quite, it would take quite a feat for them uh, not to win this. I What do you think? I mean, this oh, is a I, I agree. I mean, I think they're going to be posing some incredible lineups all year, but I, I don't disagree with you. If you look at, obviously, here we have three GMs, boards one, two, and three, you know car one and so. Some of you may not be as aware that Ali Morandi is actually a well-known streamer on chess.com. Last Samurai 7, or Last 7 Samurai, I don't remember. He needs... JJ Chess, yeah, he needs to... I'm glad he changed that. Anyway, uh, but Ali, uh, shout out to you, and we know uh, he's got his own following um, on Twitch and plays regularly in our in our weekly streaming prize events like Arena King. So so that's a very well-known and a very top-heavy lineup with three GMs, Jen. Indeed, and uh, most of those games are already uh, underway, as you point out. The the last seven Samurai, Brazilian Nizhnik, um, going to be a real tough. Yeah, you want to go to that one? Down. I mean, ooh, that yeah, one. Yeah, that looks like a good one. Yeah, it's moved along very quickly. So, wh what do we think here? White, White's got a White's nice. Go yeah, ahead. White. White was, you know, potentially thinking about uh, sticking something on e5 uh, after playing rookie one. Bishop f6 played by Ilya. Uh, and now the question is, okay, so White's got a little bit more space, and how do they take advantage of it? Like, what moves are you thinking of here candidate-wise? Are you looking at something like Bishop G5, potentially uh, running Bishop takes F6 and... Uh, yeah, uh, trying invite... to force your way through. Yeah. I like this Think... idea. Bishop G5. Yeah, it's the most forcey move, right? Mm-hmm. And Black can't meet it with a move like Queen to D8, just trying to completely, uh, you know, win the staring contest. I'm not going to take on G5 to let your knight come closer to my king. But, but here Black can't play Queen D8, as we said. And if you do take, one crazy line, Jen, is if Bishop takes G5, do I have the Greek gift intermezzo before I take back on G5? Something like Bishop H7 takes and then Knight takes G5. And we might see immediate problems for Black with the, uh, with the very well-known mating net getting launched here. Yeah, I was looking at that. I wasn't sure if it was going to work, but yeah. uh, let's let's take a look. Oh, and Bishop oh, G5 Oh, he what? goes for it. This could so be Bishop another King. another very exciting one quickly here. Again, everybody, if you haven't uh, if you don't have familiarity with that term I just said the Greek gift, then you need to do your tactics. There's a I have a video series on chess.com called Pattern Recognition in Chess. A lot of people have covered this type of mating net where you're aware that when the, when a lone king doesn't have the normal minor pieces around it, you start to look at these types of tactics and you want to be as familiar as possible of when these mating nets work and when they don't. And one of the biggest indicators that it might work is that your opponent has all their pieces on the other side of the board because even even other moves uh, that are sort of... Oh, we're going to find out. Even other moves might just run into Queen G4. Um, well, that's the question, though. After Bishop takes G5, play quickly. After Bishop H7, King takes H7, Knight takes G5, check. Mm -hmm. It looks like... E8 does, it doesn't look good to me um, because it's too difficult to defend to F7 and H7. Right, this is the but typical pattern. what about um, King G6? That's what we got to analyze, and you're looking at that right now after Queen G4, aren't you? Yeah, and, I, and I, I don't know. I feel like this could be a super exciting start to the day. We've already had a crazy mate in two, and I think that I think this is winning. I mean, okay, I'm, I love to attack. You know that, Jen. Um, I was being made fun of today on the Tata Steel broadcast because one of my favorite players is Kromnik, and Lawrence said, well, Danny clearly doesn't play like Kromnik because I sacrifice pieces too much. But anyway, the uh, the attack here to me looks really good for White, and I think, I think these have all the indicators of when a Greek gift can normally work. The pieces aren't quickly coming to the defense. Um... You don't even have to have checkmate on the spot in order to probably start winning back a lot of material, Jen, after queen g4. Um, That's the problem. You know, one other thing is that it's really good to have lots of control over the e6 square uh -huh. when you're defending against a Greek gift. Great point. Because that way, after knight g5, king g6, queen g4, after the move f5, you can meet queen h4, uh -huh. with rook, right? Rook h8 I... fails to rook e6 checkmate, right? Exactly, and and that's that's a big problem because then how are you going to deal with all of this uh, this fun that I'm having? Yeah, and, and AJ goes for it. Seven. We have liftoff. I think this is going to be a very exciting start to the day, and unfortunately for the windmills, uh, a very a very very quick bad sign because if board three 
for the Archbishops is getting victories like this, Jen, against Ilya Nizhnik, that's a that's a problem, right? You have Karwana and So on boards one and two. Um, wow, we got lucky to be looking at this game at this exact moment, Danny. Yeah. <laughs> this bodes well, and thanks to Michael Rode for priming us for some of the yeah. tactics. Right? No, seriously, we've we've had good timing so far, um, which I feel was the opposite of. I feel like the show with Alexandra, we kept being one step behind the exciting moment, but you and I so far have been lucky. Knock on wood. We'll, we'll hopefully keep the timing that way. Um, but again, fans, if you're not familiar with this tactical mating pattern, you know, uh, it's it should be on the top of your priority list because as you are seeing two grandmasters playing, it even occurs in these types of games. The initial indicators are that you don't have a knight on f6. That's the first recipe you need in a Greek gift to work because there's no knight guarding h7. Second indicator... You, sorry, yeah. go ahead. Oh, I was going to say that you can't stick a knight on f6. Right. There's no knight coming there. There's no knight on d5 or, or, or d7. And, and then the next indicator, as Jen was saying, is control over the e6 square because a common way to get out of this net is on king g6, queen g4, moves like f5, like Jen said, might be enough to stop the attack. There's no discovered check because the queen's hanging. But here, a move like queen h4, white's even threatening a slow plan like f4 and queen h7 with mating nets because this e6 pawn is under so much fire, right, Jen? I mean, this is... This is really, really dangerous for Black. I sh I'm kind of shocked, I have to say, that um, Ilya didn't um, think before playing Bishop takes G5 yeah. because I would have thought that he'd be scared of this. And I thought that he could potentially bail out with something like Knight E7 and maybe it wouldn't be... Obviously, his pawn structure would get weakened, but it might not be the end of the world. Right, something like Knight E7 takes, takes... As you said, the pawn structure is weakened, but you make a good point because if the bishops are traded on this b7, e4 diagonal, you know, maybe he could have survived. And what's funny is if it turns out that this mating attack is winning for white, which I think it will be, even tucking your tail between your legs after bishop f6, bishop g5 with a move like bishop back to e7 is like anything that avoids like just getting checkmated by force here. Um, I don't know. This is... Uh, you know, what I, you know what I think, Jen? I think he just straight up missed the inner mizzo. I think he saw bishop g5, knight g5 with g6 and figured, okay, I'm not thrilled, but I can defend this position. White's going to play h4, h5, but I have e5 opening up the center. And I think he just straight up missed the inner mizzo that white takes h7 with check first. I like how you say inner mezzo, inner misto. Inner mizzo, inner mezzo. Well, in her miss, though, like, I missed it, right? Well, I didn't even mean to, but I could just, you know, I'm just butchering pronunciations and accents all the time, so. Um, and you're adding, but you're adding something to it, because it is so easy to... To miss um, things like that, yeah. In her miss, though, because you're just looking, I mean, this is the greatest, some of the greatest grandmasters in our country, but right. when you're looking at a variation and you're looking far ahead, it's easy to miss what's right in front of your face. Yep. And that's that's one of the big life lessons that chess teaches as well. Yep. You know, kind of a shame here that Black can't play King H six. Here's another thing. I think another reason that Ilya might have had a false sense of security here. Yeah. Danny, that there's not that many pieces left on the board. Right. And usually, when there's so few minor pieces left, you can't uh, just do this. Attacks, attacks like this don't work. Like if F seven were defended, even just King H six would would be good. Normally right. there's a bishop on C1 that makes that move not even a candidate. No, that's a great point. And there's, um, what's the book that it's, the book How to Beat Your Dad at Chess, actually, is a phenomenal book for mating patterns. I don't know if you have that one, Jen. The, uh, you probably I, used I it. You, you probably By, used uh, it because you're, you're a better chess player than your father, so you probably learned how to beat your dad at chess. Um, that's no, that's nothing against you, Mike. Love you, Mike. Um, but, uh, <laughs> No, but you make a great point, Jen, that one of the common patterns in the Greek gift is that the dark square, uh, call it the dark square run by the king doesn't work because there's a dark square bishop on that diagonal. But um, in this case, as you said, that's not true. But I think we have I think we have almost a forced mate here. No, wait. Okay, I'm looking at queen h7, king f8, queen h8, king e7, and then queen takes g7 with threats of both queen f7 and rook takes e6 just winning on the spot. I thought you were going to try to make rook takes e6 immediately work, and then after queen takes g7, king I, d6. I would, Lady but if rook takes that. e6 immediately, I can take with the rook, I think, instead of the pawn. Oh, I meant after I meant after uh, queen h8 check, king e7. Oh, right. Okay, yeah, so let's look at that. Queen h7, king 
king f8, queen h8, king e7, rook takes e6, pawn takes e6, queen takes g7, king d6 only move. Where's the mate? Come on, puzzle rush. Look at this. I got the mate. Knight e4, king d5. Oh, I don't have the mate. Sorry. I thought I yeah, had... Yeah, that's where I stopped too. Knight e4, king d5. But I, I had I had queen g5, king takes e4, f3 checkmate, but the problem with queen g5 is there's e5. But then, but then pawn takes e5 with discover check by the rook. Okay, there's going to be a mate here. This is puzzle rush competition, everybody. Whoever finds the mate for white first wins. Because I think I think Jen's idea of queen h7, queen h8, rook takes e6 check. Oh, you know what black will play, Jen? King d7. Won't even take back the rook. He'll just run the king to d7 and get to c8. Uh, yeah. That's okay. the idea. So it's not the best. It's maybe maybe you're just a uh, quiet lethal move. Queen takes g7. Makes more sense because we just pick up two pawns or threatening rook e6. Right. Knight e6 and queen, <laughs> queen f7. Just a few too many threats to deal with, right? Well, white's going to get a winning advantage here because both these pawns are going to fall. But I, you know what I like about Nizhnik's choice here, Jen? Now that we've spent a lot of time kind of... Uh, applauding JJ's tactic and, and Nizhnik missing this, is he played it very fast. Yeah, and I think one of the one of the trademarks of guys that do well in this format, or sorry, guys, gals, all players, right? Players who do well in this format are that they, when they make mistakes, they just don't spend time beating themselves up because they create the practical situation where they may be losing, but they also aren't down on time, right? And then later on in the game, they give, they're giving their opponent an opportunity to go wrong because they kept it going. And Nizhnik, as you said, is not only one of the strongest grandmasters in our country, but he went 4-0 and in week one. Like, he's, he's one of the best players in the format, right? Um, and if he does manage to run his king to d7 and c8 gen, even if he's just clearly worse, he may actually have some long-term chances in the game because he does still have an extra minor piece uh, versus white's four pawns. That's Ooh. right, and uh, I should mention we've got a couple of results in yeah. uh, Tommy Bartel draw against... Roman Edward, um, Alex Lenderman, the yeah. first victory of the day. Uh, he won against Peter Robertson. Uh, but as it turns out, I think the deadline for the fantasy team just passed. So well, can't I, change the odds now. I was just flipping to that game on the analysis board to, just to show that Lenderman did indeed win by resignation if we want to show the final position to everybody. Alexander L. Uh, has uh, – well, he was winning on time. You know, if you look at Peter Robertson's uh, – uh, time on the clock. He only had three seconds. Um, but okay, as you said, Spinal Tap drew against Romaine Edward. That's Tom Bartell. But let, let's go. Let's stick with this crazy game here because JJ just played the move D5. And Nizhnik. Okay. I, like, I love this move, though. This yeah. move seems so. It, it really seems brilliant to me. And look at this move I, D6. Wait, wait, wait. So after queen c7, he actually just played d5, and then there was immediate knight e5. Okay, so d5, brilliant move with the idea that pawn takes d5 off the menu because queen h7, king f8, queen h8, mate. Right. Uh, very creative. So knight e5 immediately played. And now d6, This is isn't this just uh, winning? Okay, so black has to oh. take it because as Jen highlighted, if the e5 comes open, we have queen h7, queen h8 mate, and the d6 pawn is doing the same task of guarding e7. So this is all force now. And what's JJ's idea after takes, takes, queen takes? There well, must don't be we just... have rook takes e5 or something? Oh, very nice. Rook takes e5. Yeah. Nice tactic, Jen, yeah. And, and not only are you winning f7, you're mating if queen takes e5 because if queen f7, queen e8... The knight guards h7. Yeah, exactly. So it gets worse and worse. As um, I think that this was just a brilliant game by Morandi. I, yep. you know, I was I was looking at queen h7 and rook e6, but this d5 d6 concept so much more elegant and yep. just really elegant and unusual. It's not the typical tactical um, finale to the the Greek gift. Yep. And, but but it but it is also uh, one of those ones you want to stick in your pocket, add to your Greek gift repertoire, right? When you're evaluating whether these sacrifices work, you know the more familiarity you have with all the different types of little tactical sequences that you've seen grandmasters play, makes you a stronger attacker. And I I agree, Jen. D5 and D6, a super clean, brilliant way to finish this one off. And I think, okay, unless Nish, I mean, how, how does he even deal with this, right? Currently, Black is actually down material. Right, and if you don't take d6, it'll stay that way. But then rook takes e5, and it just looks over. It looks like white is just gonna finish with a with a crushing attack. So far, we have early candidates for game of the week. 
Wow, yeah, you're right. I mean, we're up in exchange. I guess we could grovel with like knight g6 and continue playing, and then you're just down in exchange, right? Right. I, I, I think he's going to do that, though, actually, Danny. I think he's going to play knight g6 and keep playing. I don't think he's going to resign. Yeah. Uh, but it b b really well played by Mirandi, and I doubt. Just because, you know, maybe something will happen. There is a knight f4 idea. Yep. I don't know. I, I don't, I, I'm going to predict a no resign, but after knight g6, is there something going on in e6? Yeah, knight g6, what takes e6 might even be possible, right? Just continuing yeah. to just just uh, not take no for an answer here. White is just going to keep trying to bust through with rook takes e6. Um, yeah, yeah, but I kind of like that. I, like, let the fans enjoy more and more sacrifices, yeah. Danny. Don't resign yet, Ilya. Yep. Keep, keep him his chances of getting a big, a game of the week keep going up if well, we get let's... sacrifice pieces, right? Let's quickly show a result that's in the books on the analysis board. You can see that Sam Sevion drew Marcus Harvey. Uh, so the Sopranos have moved after the first round of play to a 3-1 score heading into round two. But now let's go to Fabiano's game uh, because he is, uh, well, he's on the attack and way up on the clock here against Talia and uh, Cervantes and uh, and I, and I don't think it's going to end well, well here for Talia. This this is this is just out of control here. Black has the attack and the compensation now. Oh gosh, yeah. Well, what a what an opportunity for an up and coming player to play That's against true. Fabiano uh, Carano. It's really pretty cool. Uh, King F one. I, I like, don't think she feels like it's cool right now, but I agree yeah, with you. <laughs> and I'm sorry. I don't, honestly, I know that could sound really condescending. I I know it, Danny, but. I, you know, no, I, I, uh, I was only teasing you. I, I, I do yeah. think that in hindsight, you just have those moments where you say, wow, well, I just got crushed by Fabiano Caruana. That's cool, right? But right now, I think she's, uh, uh, she's really irritated with having 20 seconds and probably still getting mated on the light squares after Rook takes H2. So this is, uh, this is rough. Well, she played Bishop before. I thought she was going to play King G1, but I, I'm sure there was some uh, really strong reputation to that as well. But now Rook H2, Rook G1 looks forced. Uh, no, this isn't. This is not going to end well, as you said, Danny. I think now, just he's just gobbling up the pawns. Bishop yep. takes E4, E3 is next. King E2 played, and uh, Tali also on a very low clock as well. And look at that quiet move. Is that what you would have expected, Danny? B6. Uh, I think. It shows Fabi's class in these situations where there's probably other more forceful ways to win, but playing a move quickly, keeping his opponent under pressure, and honestly, playing a subtle move is sometimes harder to deal with, right, Jen? As you know, when you're under time pressure, sometimes you wish your opponent would just play checks and captures, because that's easy to figure out. The moment they play a subtle move that stops your only plan of C5, makes you want to bang your head against the, the time pressure wall, right? I, th I think it actually just shows Fabiano's class. Hey, Danny, I got a great idea for you. Yeah? Quiet rush. Quiet you rush. Find... Yeah, you, you have to find subtle positional moves. Great idea. Shout out to yeah. the Chess TV chat, by the way. Um, I saw a conversation going on with uh, the one and only international master, David Pruis, who will he'll be back with live commentary at some point, but he's also doing weekly PCL, which also stands now for Pro Chess Lessons, Jen. He's doing weekly educational highlights at the uh, Pro Chess League YouTube channel. And so... Um, David kind of, not necessarily arguing, but explaining to the uh, some of the fans in Chess TV chat why we why you and I don't have an engine, because it would take away from some of the educational moments we're trying to offer, not just the answer to the position. And Fabiano just, I mean, he didn't even get, I was going to say he didn't get under 11 and a half minutes, but I was wrong. He did get under 11 and a half minutes, just barely. So just a, a brilliant win there by Fabiano as black to start things off for the bishops. Yeah, it's really nice, and I, I, I think that's great that, um, David is doing instructional content around these games because one of the beautiful things about the Pro Chess League is these matches where there's a big difference in ratings and yep. a lot of those games can show you uh, positional themes that kind of harken back to classical chess games. Uh, people look at the great historical games for that reason as well because there's big differentials in strength. Yep. So really great idea. And let's move on as we've got a lot of games kind of approaching time control. Yeah, I've, uh, Ray Robson, I think, against Josh Bloomer. That could yeah, be one that... I've got the, I've got the Cordova versus Wesley So game up okay. on the board if you cool. want to go there, only because it's... And it's a current uh, 
issue on the board in the sense that Wesley Ooh, sows yeah. queen and rook are being forked. Um, but black oh, is also up a bunch of material, so I was just... What's the move? What's Wesley's next move here? I'm not sure as of yet, but I feel like black should be moments away from winning this one. Even even a move like knight d3. Yep, and as I say, he plays it. It kind of, again, another inner mizzo, as if white missed it or not, but this move is sort of just overwhelming the queen on b2, and and if she goes too far to the queen side, something like queen c3, I think... I think, okay, so then white could even, black could even just move the queen because the bishop isn't hanging. Okay, and on that note, Cordova plays queen d2, wants to make sure the bishop is under fire. And so this is a feature I don't usually use, Danny, but I just see that plus six under Wesley So's name. I'm not talking about a computer evaluation. That just means that he has an extra rook and an extra pawn. That's right, that's right. That's a good point. And that's the information <laughs> free for all. It's, uh, you can see plus six on material. And uh, that's a big... I didn't say PTL, Diamond Member Fish Moves. I said PCL, Pro Chess Lessons, like the Pro Chess League. So uh, subscribe to the YouTube channel for the Pro Chess League to get that, everybody. Um, I just got to love... I really love your inner... Miss, inter, I missed it, yo. Inter, I missed it, yo. I love that. Um, I, well, that's what... Uh, so for once, butchering a word is actually paying off for me. So that's nice. Um, let's <laughs> check... Let's check in quickly because it was the game that had our attention so closely and, and, and I think been the most enjoyable one for us to cover so far in the day. Let's go right back to Ilya Nizhnik's game with uh, Last Seven Samurai and, and see how JJ finish, finishes this one off, Jen. We left the game after Rook takes D6. The Queen took. Uh, the uh, combination we talked about was, was, was finished or, or played. Rook takes D5 and after Queen D7, White is just... This was just an easy game from start to finish here. You don't get many opportunities like this. Rook takes b5, also just a very clean... Oh, and right as I say it, the game ends. I'm glad we came here because we got to see kind of the conclusion. Rook takes b5 was a nice move, overwhelming the queen, everyone, because of a fork on d6. Um, and, uh, of course, the rook wasn't taken, but the game was finished off very nicely. So what do you think? Game of the week so far? Oh, wow. Well, we just got started, Danny, but this is really a wonderful... I, I can tell you one thing. David Proust will have a field day with this game because yep. what a way to teach people... You know, the Pro Chess League and, and Chess.com in general is attracting a lot of new players to the game. And the Greek gift, this is just a model game to, to yep. kind of explain the key themes. No, seriously. It doesn't get more instructive and educational than that. And uh, yeah. as you mentioned the Pro Chess League and Chess.com. Let's remind everybody of all the ways they can follow the league. We've been talking about the YouTube channel, but of course there is the Twitch channel directly. We will have some shows only at twitch.tv slash Pro Chess League. So I know we're at slash chess today, everybody, but please go over there and give that channel a follow so you don't miss the action. And as we've been saying all day, in live chess, that's chess.com slash live. If you, if you type that command, you will instantly follow all games in action. Um... Jen, your your uh, your choice. Choose your adventure. I've got I've got Josh Bloomer's game with Ray Robson, but where do you want to go? Um, yeah, let me take a quick look at that. Uh, it looks like uh, Ray Robson is up in exchange there, and he's going to probably convert this one pretty easily. So maybe we should go back to. Well, yeah, I mean the other games are just getting started because it looks like Emilio yep. is going to go down to Wesley. So Ray Robson looks like he's going to win up in exchange in this spot. And then we've got some games that have just uh, just just started, like Lenderman versus Marcus Harvey. Perhaps the most uh, interesting one then is is back to Wesley's Wesley's game. Not because it isn't winning for Wesley, but it's unclear enough that when I look at the position, I don't immediately see the win, and we might we might see some exciting tactics. Plus, where does that put the standings? Right now, I'm looking at the scoreboard, Jen. The bishops are up two games to nil which means they're likely to move into the second round of play with a 3-1 lead, assuming Wesley gets the job done here and Ray gets the job done um, in his, in his, on his board. Yeah, just a great way to start a match. Um, there's no doubt about that. And Ray Robson did win his game, so at least salvaging um, some, uh, some happiness for the windmills. But, uh, yeah, just uh, really, really exciting, well-played games. And this last move that Wesley played, Bishop E7, I mean, come on. Danny, look at that plus six. I, I don't see any way for White to, to do much here as yeah, I guess the, we are going to castle and we're, we're just going to force resignation because you're down a rook. I keep looking at the board thinking there must be something here. White's down a rook, but uh, you keep pointing out that it's plus six and, and there doesn't seem to be much compensation coming. <laughs> so, yeah, it's good It's good to be Wesley here. 
Indeed, indeed. And um, shout out to the chat as we've got a lot of the uh, superstars popping in. Anna Rudolph, uh, after a tough day at Tata Steel Chess, uh, stopped by to say hi. So, hola to Anna Rudolph. And we also, I think, have, uh, I thought we had Lawrence in there as well. But if we don't have him there, we certainly have him in spirit. Always. Shout out to all of our mods as, again as well. Thank you for all your help. We know it's been a very, very busy time as uh, the chess action is real on Twitch. We've got, you know, seven hours of, of Tata Steel. You're going to have another eight hours today of Pro Chess League. So thank you to all of our mods and all the work you do. I see you, Coffee Man. I see you, Chess Bay. see you, BJH. Thank you for being here. So, all right. Um, I like the skate between Sam Sevian and Peter Robertson that just got started. King's yep. Indian attack. We know that... Sam, at some point, he's gonna, he's really trying to ratchet it up and then he's gonna sacrifice something, right? That's the idea. He's got his knight coming to g4, this h6 pawn is sticking out like a sore thumb. And I'm feeling some, some, some fireworks coming yeah, along. Yeah, this, this is gonna be an exciting one to follow. Agreed town population. Us. This is a King's Indian attack for white. And this kind of idea where you've induced the move h6 is, is, uh, very typical of the line, everybody, precisely because of the tactics Jen just highlighted. Now when the knight comes to g4, you've got two pieces and the threat of sacrificing to just blow things open over there. So, um, But okay, the, black is doing what black is supposed to do in these lines to try to get counterplay, being aggressive with a pawn storm and, and uh, trying to create some avenues inward. But from a practical point of view, you can't just look at knight g4 and just start kind of uh, licking your lips, right? That This is just going to be... This is gonna be Fresh meat here very soon for white on the attack. Yeah, it does look like fun, certainly in a rapid game. I I am going to want to keep a close eye on this game. Meanwhile, Ravi Haria uh, against Tommy Bertel. That's a game that Ravi lo lost quite painfully. Yeah. And that match lost quite painfully in round one. Trying to redeem himself against Spinal Tap here. And we've got... Uh... Okay, if you're just joining us, Thomas Bartel playing for the Montclair Sopranos, drew his game against the board one for the London Lions, kind of with ease um, in the uh, in the first game of play, but he looks like he's actually got a tougher game ahead of him right now because, wait, Jen, after queen c3, if the king moves, is there bishop takes h3 and then knight g4? Yeah, that looks really strong. I was just looking at that myself. And after f6, I think that uh, the idea is still valid. Yeah, I think you can still take and play knight g4. f6 is under fire. And if you have to guard it with a move like rook f8, everybody, now this rook just flips right back to the e-file. And you've got some really dangerous stuff happening here. Where this queen on h3 is sort of sort of lost in the wilderness, right? Um, yeah, it looks like a really terrible position. Yeah, I think bishop h3 was just a, was just a bad move. I think black had had much more balance in the position until that, and perhaps just underestimated how dangerous this, this coming assault on the dark squares was, because that's what happened. White took g7, immediately played queen c3 check, and I, I'm i thinking we're going to see this idea of takes h3 and knight g4, where, where white is in great shape. And guess what? Uh, we do have the marshals and the um, pawn grubbers. Underway. Um, yeah, that's right. Al Wander Leong playing for the, the Pittsburgh Pawn Grabbers. I can't help it myself if sometimes I say grubbers in honor of the Oscar <laughs> Sarawan. Well, you can you can grab a pawn, but you can also be a pawn grubber, so I like that. Um, let's go to Wonderful Time versus uh, Sergei Azarov. Uh, that is Tuan Min Lee as... as uh, He's, uh, I believe, one of the local players. Maybe he's a free agent for the for the pawn grabbers, but not his first week. He he's played in, in weeks previous. We've got Red Nova seventeen twenty nine against Real Boy. That's uh, Wonder Liang versus Jurabek. I'm struggling with the first name pronunciation there, so I'm just gonna I'm just gonna pronounce his last name for now. Um, and uh, what else? Oh, we have Sergey Ehrenberg playing against Aaron Jacobson. That's uh, Sergey Ehrenberg versus uh, one random. I think this is Ehrenberg's PCL debut. Am I right about that? Yeah, I, I think so. I thought it was just announced that he was added to their squad, actually. So yeah. it sounds, sounds right. Story checked out. Yeah. Well, that's a big. I mean, Ehrenberg, for those who followed chess in the U.S. for, you know, the last couple of decades, is obviously a very strong grandmaster. Not as active as he once was, but... 
um, no stranger to playing in the online team chess format, and uh, maybe maybe the pawn grabbers knew they needed to get some more firepower to keep competing in the Atlantic Division. So 96, I'm looking at this game and the move 96 was just played. We're just still in the opening. Uh, Queens Indian defense, uh, just uh, which, nothing. Which game are we on? I was looking at the uh, Azarab game. Ah. Um, we've also got some kind of similar type situation in Jennifer Hughes' battle. Um, ready opening against uh, Miranda of the New York Marshals. Yeah, and let I me think... find that one. A happy pawn. First of all, what a great username a happy pawn is, right? Can we just pause and appreciate that for a second? Great username. I particularly like the handle considering that you're a pawn grabber, right? So <laughs> You know what? You're right. It's it has it has it has depth. It has uh, I don't even know what it is. It's an oxymoron by itself and and has it leaves leaves you wondering, what is she trying to say, right? What's her mission? It's about bringing the troops home. That's what it is. Um, right, you're happy to sacrifice your pawns, right? Because if you're sacrificing your pawns in the duty of victory, yep. then it's a beautiful thing, right? That's that that's my interpretation, and I'm sticking to it. There you that. go. But Let's... meanwhile, <laughs> I'm getting nervous about Robertson's uh, position in his battle against Sam Savion because I just mentioned. Yeah, I was going to say. Let's quickly go back to Konovets versus Squirrel. Lol, squirrels, 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 because I think. Uh, I think we might be about to see something something nasty here. Somebody's going to take on H6. I don't know who it is, but somebody's going to take on H6, and this thing is going to get wild. That's right. I mean, I just find, I would just find in a blitz game, this is just so difficult. I don't mean not blitz, but, you know, yep. rapid, yep. fast rapid. I, I don't know how to, I can defend against knight g4 and knight g5 and taking on h6. There's got to be some plan here. I My concern is that if I try to shore up uh, H6 with the move bishop f8, then I have to start worrying about knight g5. Well, well currently f7 is even just hanging, right? So, it, whoa. But, well, bishop f8 was played. Yeah. Um, you're right, though. I was surprised. The moment was, I, I thought queen f8 might be played to do, to take care of the job you were talking about trying to do, or queen g8 even, with the idea that if black can put the queen here and there isn't a sack, then next move maybe, maybe white. Uh, maybe black can play Bishop of Fate, but instead, Roberson plays Bishop of Fate, and, but I, I like your move just as good, Jen. I mean, Queen takes F7 I think could be played, but why not play Knight G5 and take it with the Knight, right? Yeah, I mean, you're not going to be defending uh, F7 twice in one right. move, right? I mean, not unless, yeah, I mean, you can't yeah, I, I was, I was. You can't possibly play G six knight F seven King right. G seven. Uh, if that doesn't work, it, you know, it it looks like knight G five is a really tough move to me. That's a crazy idea, though. I've actually got that position on the board. I mean, maybe. No, I mean, worst case scenario, White can even just take the queen on D eight and then take the pawn on E six with check or, or something. Exactly. So... That, this just can't possibly work. Right. So just looking really strong for Sam Sevian here as. It's kind of like the reason that Bobby Fischer started playing the Kings Indiana yep. Jack, right? Because These types of games of... right here. Yeah. Well, the so... uh, I guess the main thing here is Sevion's trying to jinx me. I said that JJ Ali Morandi's win over Nizhnik was game of the week, but maybe Sevion will do something really pretty here uh, with his attack against Roberson and prove us prove us wrong or prove me wrong. I like your knight g5 move. I also like queen takes f7, but. Uh, We'll keep our eye on this one closely, everybody, because it's probably going to get wild. Let's let's go quickly back to Spinal Tap's game, uh, meaning International Master Tom Bartell uh, against Ravi Haria, because that that queen somehow didn't get trapped over there on H3. I think that Haria missed his chance, Jen, back on move 17. Instead of taking H3 and playing Knight G4, he played Rook E1, and Bartell instantly. You can actually look at the time log, so I'm not exaggerating. The time log in the game were... Uh, Ravi Haria took a minute and 31 seconds to play a move that probably just wasn't as good, rookie one, and Bartel took just a few seconds to just take on G2 and then play queen D7. So I think Bartel got away with with uh, with this position where he could have really been in trouble after bishop H3 and knight G4. I agree, and uh, now I I still I still like white, but but not as much not maybe. Um, C5 was Haria's move just now, and 
Sorry, sometimes when I pronounce something slowly, it's because I'm trying to analyze a chess move at the same time as saying a word. Yep. <laughs> you know how it is. No no judgments, believe me. Um, yeah, <laughs> queen c6, okay, trades one pin for another, and then we got another pin, right? We got pins all over the place. Let's get a pin emote going. Come on, peeps, use that pin emote. C5, wow. the pin. Queen c6, pins the pawn to the queen, and then white goes right back with rook ed1. The pawn is renewed and pinned due to the fact that we have the double rooks on the d-file. So, I, I agree with you. I still like uh, Haria's position. Yeah. In but fact, maybe a lot. The black is kind of hanging on by a thread here, because we, we we're, at the moment we can't take on d6 because of queen takes c3. At the moment we can't play knight c4 because that blocks the uh, the interaction of the queen on c3 um, with the, the potential pain. Oh, knight c4. Right. So, rookie 5 played... I think we'll probably Bar see Bar B4, Tau. though. I was thinking about rookie 5 because after B4, you can't move this rook from the D file to try to unpin, because I think the white knight comes to C4 with tempo, and then uh, Haria will, will take on D6 the next move. So I expect white to play B4 and then try to play knight C4 um, quickly, if, if possible. Yeah, that looks like a great move to me. So B4, and then hmm. Looks, uh, looks like a tough position indeed for Bartel to play, no doubt. Yep. Meanwhile, Michael Rode versus uh, Roman Edouard. It looks like um, Roman's got the edge here up upon. He has the nice That's little... Boo786 versus Romain Edouard. Yeah, what happened here, yeah. Edouard? He's got... The problem is, not only is he up upon, but it's an outside A pawn, and he's got this beautifully placed knight on E4, which yeah. prevents the work on D2 from getting... From having any fun at all, really. Yeah, that's what I was about to say. He's got this knight on e4, which is first thing you highlight, just because it also hits f6, and so you're always worried if you're black about, you know, knight and rook getting getting jiggy with it over here and uh, checkmating the king. So I I agree. It looks like Edward is in control here. Here he's probably picking his favorite flavor. He could go king f2, I think, or king h3. Um, yeah, looks like Edward has got the better of Michael Rode here, and that's going to help the Lions. Again, if you're looking at the scoreboard there, then you know that the Sopranos took a 3-1 to one lead into the second round of action here. Uh, the Bishops, of course, have the same, although those games are actually just getting underway. As I say it, Fabiano Caruana just made his first move. Um, we'll bring that game up right now against Emilio and Cordova. And we're gonna, we got a Sicilian on tap. I like that. Yeah, is Fabi going to play a Rossellino, though? That's the question. I'm going to go with no. No, he did. <laughs> <laughs> right as you said that, you were wrong, but it's okay. That was that was awesome because the timing was perfect. <laughs> right as you said, I'm going to go with no. Um, for those of you who don't understand the inside <laughs> joke, you didn't follow the World Chess Championship. Of course, Fabiano Caruana played this system and several times successfully, right, regardless of the fact that you know Caruana did not win the title. He did not wrestle away from the Norwegian, but he also didn't lose a game in, in Classical and was better several times as white. Um, in the uh, Ross Alimo. So anyway, there you go, an interesting said, one. I, I, the reason I said no was because I felt like he was getting more out of the Open Sicilian games against Magnus. That's those, true, those, that's true. Or he had a big advantage, so I thought, right. hey, maybe we'll go in that direction. But perhaps he just thought this was a better play for the rapid time control. Yep, and good point. All right, well, there's several games we go to now. Let's check on what we haven't paid too close attention to. Alexander so Lenderman. One as it heats up because you know everybody everybody wants to watch Fabi, right? Yeah, that's true. Uh, but, we will definitely keep our eye on Fabi as it heats up. But let's go to Lenderman's game versus Harvey because we have a weird position on the board um, where I'm wondering just how much of an attack Black might be able to get here with the two rooks and the bishop facing the king. Because what's funny is White has a light square bishop to sort of match the Black light square bishop, but it's blocked, right? The bishop is blocked by the e4 pawn. So this is kind of like the sort of attack you would be very worried about if you were missing a light square bishop and you had Fianchettoed. And so, okay, rook c3 was played quickly by Lenderman, but is rook well, takes... Why can't we play rook f2? Oh, no, there's um, rook... Oh, no, there is there's no... There's rook takes b8. Rook takes b8. Yeah, okay. okay. So right now, we, right now our, our rook on... Our bishop on b8 is undertake, so we right. can't move on. So what... What do we do here then? Hmm. Maybe maybe Lenderman's doing maybe Lenderman's doing just fine. In fact, maybe he's doing good because I was highlighting yeah. the light squares. But the other real issue here is that Black has back rank problems. So so Bishop F1 play, trying to at least keep the Bishop on this kind of like nice aggressive square. 
uh, so that the ideas, these ideas of playing like Rook F2 are, are still in the air. Rook F3 is a possibility here, though, because for white, yeah, Rook, Rook takes F3 doesn't work because of Rook takes B8. And Rook F7, right? another way to try to expose the back rank. Now that True. the bishop so again after Rook takes F7, we don't take on F7. We just play Rook C8 check. Right. Another inter. I missed it. Inter Mizzo. Inter. I missed it, yo. Um, <laughs> yeah, the. Uh... The bishop having left the h3 c8 diagonal makes rook f7 a really irritating move for Harvey, and I think this is going to be another win for Lenderman, um, and meaning for the Sopranos. So it doesn't look like that attack. Is, in fact, on the next move, Jan, if White is really even nervous at all, Lenderman could even play rook g3 and just put a put the kibosh on all of this stuff on the king side. Um, I think I think White is going to be doing well. So. All right, trying to keep my eye out on the fact that we have a lot of games rolling along fast. This is what happens at this point in the Pro Chess League coverage, everybody. If you're just getting here, welcome. Thank you for being here, regardless of where you are. And you can head over to chess.com and follow the games yourself, especially at the risk that Jen and I, as we try to cover almost 16 games in progress here, uh, may not always catch the most exciting moments. Somebody actually asked on the chess.com chat if taking it on h6 is also the Greek gift. The answer is no. The Greek gift is a specifically a bishop takes h7 sacrifice. But well, let's go back to that game because somehow, somehow uh, Sam Sevian, Sevian did not, Konovitz did not convert on that attack, at least not with a checkmate attack, right? So after yeah, bishop f8, he just took with the queen instead of knight g5. Interesting. Yeah, that surprises me. Um, and then how did Black end up... It looks like Black... Black, Black, Black basically just took the queens off the board. So, I mean, in the live position, Sevion is up a pawn, but it feels like the live position is favoring Black because as you look at it, uh, the second player has complete control over the B-file. And I don't really feel like White's advantage is nearly what it could have been with that attack. And... I'm wondering if if he was just wrong to take f7, Jen, and should have played the move knight g5. Yeah, maybe, maybe I I think so. I mean, I still like white because white's up a pawn and potentially bishop h3 kind of hammering on the e6. Uh, on the e6 pawn seems a little potentially dangerous. I guess you could play knight d bishop d7. We can't take on d5. That bishop is still protected. Oh, and even but... even king f7 too. I mean, I, I agree with you. White's up a pawn, but the more I look at this, I feel like. Okay, bishop h3 was, was actually played. I, ex I expect king f7, yep, okay, it was just played. And I, I think Roberson is in very good drawing territory because this is a position that's hard for white to convert without making things worse. How, how do you ever get counterplay without the c3 or a3 pawn becoming serious targets for the rooks on the b-file? Yeah, I mean, the thing is, he keeps giving up the c3 pawn knowing that bishop d2 would be devastating. Right. So there were a couple of times where he did that. I, I, I would love to, like... Figure out a way to get my rook on f3, you know, like bishop c1, rook e3, rook f3, but I guess it's very artificial. I'm having trouble coming up with a constructive plan for white. Yeah. I really am. I, I'm like, I need to somehow make something from my position, like bishop c1, rook d 3 but, you, you know, you have rook b1 further tying me down. So yeah. it's hard for Sam to make progress, but guess what? He's going to try. And he might win if Black gets a little bit too frisky himself. If if Black, you know, gets too aggressive and White can somehow flip the script on the B-file, okay, as Jen said, then the E6 pawn is clearly a target, right? White is already up a pawn, but, but I think as long as Roberson kind of keeps his wits about him, look at the clock, Jen, as well. Sevion's the one approaching under a minute here, so this could be a huge turnaround game um, for the Lions if, if Sevion doesn't win, frankly. I mean, he's favored in this matchup, so even a draw is probably a, a bad result. Um, if anyone wants to shout at us other games, I'm, I'm looking. I got my eye in the corner. I've got... There's so many games getting under time pressure. I'm sure there's some excitement. Um, and of course, as we already said, Fabiano Caruana is already underway in his third game of the day. Uh, sorry, second game of the day. Um, let's, let's go check. Michael Rowe did indeed just resign... Um, oh. to Romain Edward, and uh, it was kind of, kind of because of the tactic we were highlighting that eventually the knight might come to f6, and as I said, we'd get jiggy with it, and this king has made it. So 
Edward strikes back for the Lions, and the Sopranos' lead is cut down. And I, I, I'm, I'm just looking at this game by Savion, and I noticed he played the move Bishop G4. I'm trying to figure out what that does. I, I like the idea. Maybe he's trying to play like rookie two, trade off a pair of rooks. Ah, okay. I, I'm, just, I'm absolutely fascinated to see how Sam tries to make progress here. Yeah. Uh, but that game's down to the three minutes for Robertson and just a little over one for Sam. Uh, if you don't mind going back to that. No, no, I'm, I'm there right now. I'm with you. I, and I uh, and I agree that it's we're going to get exciting moments. Night B3. I wonder if that was just kind of a pretend sort of tickle, if he's just going to move the knight right back and own the B file, or if Black's actually going to play rook A2 here, because that's the other advantage of the knight being on B3, is if you play rook A2, you, I think you can you can try to go after this A3 pawn if you want. So you're thinking after rook B1, he's just going to play rook A2. Um, I, I don't know. I, I, I said that the risk of where Black would lose this game is if he gets too frisky, right? If he doesn't just kind of sit and say, hey, White, you've got nothing. Because if you play rook a2, now you're... Oh, he goes for it, but here's the issue. I can he, play bishop, I, yeah, and I can also play bishop c1. Yeah. You can't play c1 because the rook takes b8. But but even if, Jen, even if you end up going for what you were saying earlier, just for... The a pawn is so slow. Okay, I have to come up with the idea, but is there some way to start getting aggressive counterplay where you have f4 and f5? Like, the yeah. risk of this approach by black is, okay, if white plays knight g6 even here, let's look at that. Right, I'm basically going to play knight g6 and f4 and f5 and try to use my extra e pawn while you're busy taking an a pawn and sort of slowly working your way forward. I think this is I think this is very risky for Black and probably probably not the right approach. But maybe he looked at Sam's clock here, Jen, and says, "Okay, I'm going to try to win this game because Sevion has created a lot of time pressure for himself." Yeah, I agree. And also, you know, the way to sometimes the way to draw a game is to be aggressive and force your opponent to to find good moves as well. So I don't know if he's going to win all three results possible here. But look at this: Simeon's getting down to almost ten seconds here, and he's played the move rookie two. Um, rook takes a three now. Bishop c one. Does that? But, but then rook a one. I but think. Then, the... But oh, knight takes c one because rook takes b eight. Knight takes. Ah, uh, yeah, two. good point. Yeah, that also works. So what's? So what's... after rook a three. Um, I think his plan is probably more similar to what you were talking about, right? Yeah, but I'm surprised he didn't just play... Maybe he wants to trap the rook, but I'm surprised he didn't just play knight g6 right away, f4, f5. Okay. I was like, this, be... this looks oh interesting, actually. He's. What a fascinating conception, Danny. I've never seen it in a position like this in my life. What What is going on? Yeah. The rook on a3 is trapped, but how do we attack it? Right. Well, and I think what White's saying is He's going to leave this all be, and now he'll go for knight g6. And I'm, again, I'm calling for this move. Surprise, Sevion hasn't played it yet. Okay, plays bishop d1, but knight g6 was actually, again, really strong, because if you take twice as black, you're leaving the e6 pawn behind, and I think that that's enough for white to really have winning chances. So I think that using using the majority on the king's side, using the extra pawn you have, which is this Freddy, Freddy Fredrickson over here on f2, that's where White's going to get winning chances, and and I um, I don't I don't know Bishop I I agree with you, Jen. This is a very obscure position. Wait, okay, so Rook A one happened, and then Rook takes A one, Knight takes A one, massively quick moves here. Uh, Bishop C one. Uh, he wants to keep an eye on that A three square. The pawn is not moving another square forward. Yeah. Anytime soon, and the Knight on A one, of course, can easily hop back to B three. Well, I think, I, yeah, I think you're right. I think we'll see knight b3, bishop a3, and then, you know, black is a little bit back to the drawing board. Maybe he can justify g5 if you're black. Um, you want what, your but, pawn back, at least. Yeah, exactly. Now I'm starting to struggle to see anything for white, because remember before you had these knight d6 ideas with e6 hanging in the end. Uh, if we want to have any fun here, we got to stick our bishop back on g4. Right. Yeah, so so maybe, maybe, actually, that's a good plan, though. Maybe that's all. Maybe that's what Sevion has in mind. Maybe he'll put the bishop on a3, put the white bishop back on g4, and try to go to work with the extra, the extra f pawn. But I just don't see it necessarily leading to a victory, though, because I yeah. think that bishop can come to d7. So now that this game isn't quite as exciting as it once was, um, let's, let's hop to some other games. Yeah, let's go. Ooh, I just saw a crazy move was played in the spinal tap game meaning international master Tom Bartel, Ravi Haria, and Bartel. Whoa, something crazy. Uh, Black just played E3. 
with only 30 seconds on the clock. But it looks like it was out of necessity if I look at the position. White was on the attack, and, and Bartel plays e3 to try to open up counterplay against the White King. Queen e5, knight d6 check. Haria is, uh, looks like in a very dangerous situation, but where's the beef? How, how does White get against this king on g8, Jen? How do we get on the king on g8? Ay, ay, ay. Uh-oh. Um, we need to bring a pawn into the game, guys. Okay, but you know what? The queen's coming off. Play, like, h4 and g4, stuff like that. Well, I think White can even play e4 here. Okay, he plays knight b7 first because he wants to threaten knight d8. Um... Queen e5 after knight back to d5. Queen e7 played. And then he just takes... And now we're in a men game where the white king is more active. And I think we, if we get e4 in at the right moment, yep. it's going to be devastating. Um, I think white's going to win this. Knight coming to d8 is also... Knight coming to a5 is also a problem. It's going to stick your knight on e7. Yeah. Well, that's then the, we're going to get active with e4. I, the, and that, that's where the game is. I'm not sure you're in the live... If you move ahead, the game's on move 58 now. 57. Yeah, exactly. Oh, okay. Great. Sorry, I, I, I was a little bit behind. You're no, right. Okay. Um, um, I, but but I don't think that Ravi took the the best approach. I actually I think this knight maneuver around was less effective than just the moment that king touched down on f3 back on move 49. I think White should have immediately just played e4 and tried to start using the majority because now Black has got this past a pawn. Which okay, uh, as I'm saying that looks like Haria feels good about his chances. This king has officially landed on d6 and Black's got problems. Um, and meanwhile, we've got a time scramble alert in Sevion Robertson as both players have only five seconds left on the clock, Danny. Oh, uh, let's and do that, it. That let's... I wrote off. Konovets, uh, like Konovets game. And look at this. Sevion broke through. Amazing. Oh, wow. I don't know how that happened. He uh, just the only way it could have happened was, was via blunders there by Black. We'll back up and take a quick peek, but you got to hand it to Sevion who... Um, Obviously, he has converted now. He's up a piece, and with Roberson about to lose on time, I expect resignation. So where did we leave it? Back in this situation here, Jen. Uh, wow, look at this plan by Sevion. He recognized at the very least, even if we were rightly critical earlier, Jen, he recognized what you said about the endgame, that with the bishop on c1, black really has no counterplay, right? This a3 square is a, is a landmine that black can never cross. And, and then what he did was he just... He brought his king over super slowly to help relieve the duties of the bishop. And when the king got over there, now he was finally able to refocus his efforts on back to the king side with a majority. And he started that by bringing the bishop to the c2 diagonal, threatening bishop g6. And I guess black panicked, because after knight e4, Sevion immediately traded, which is the right idea, just, just destroying black center. And, and now already, white is, white is in great shape. The c4 pawn falls, and... Uh, and he crushes through. So, okay, I think we were right to be a little bit critical earlier, Jen, with, with kind of the approach that, that he took. But also, it was sort of like we said, when Black played Rook A2 and kind of gave up the B file, I think that was the beginning of the end. I think Black shouldn't have been so aggressive and, and thought that he had winning chances. He should have just sat tight and just kept the B file under control, frankly. Um, but okay, easier for me to say. I don't know what I'm doing. I'm just, you know, providing commentary here, but, you know. Um, and now we've, we've got a we've got a kind of fun game going on in uh, our, our our elite battle of Caruana versus Cordova. Of course, we have lots of elite grandmasters here playing in the pro chess league. But the top player in all the league, Fabiano Caruana, number two player in the world. Yep. Let's... Um, currently facing off against Emilia Cordova in this uh, really complex situation. Danny, uh, kind of sink your your teeth into this position. What do you think of it? That queen is kind um, of on here in f5. We, we can't take, we can't trade queens to really leave the pressure because then after pawn takes f5, white would win material. Right. Um, and because of that, Cordova has just played bishop d8, perhaps to threaten exactly what you said, Jen, with this takes f5, because then at the very least, then the the knight could move safely to e7. There's also a, f a funny idea that maybe this queen avoids the trade and Black tries to trap Fabiano's queen on f5 with a move like knight e7, but I don't think he's going to have time for that. Something tells me Fabiano's about to just bust this thing open. I mean, is, is E5 on the board here? Is, is E5 yeah, threatened? I, it, looks, it looks so attractive for, for white, doesn't it? In fact, if E5, by the way, black can't take because of queen takes G6, maybe. 
Mm, good point. Actually, Why? I could be well, totally wrong. Maybe that's just a whole bunch yeah, of trades. Just because we're on D eight, D four is also defending the queen, so it yeah. might just be trades, right? But yeah, I mean, white is. I guess if we do the uh, the material count, it's equal. But it feels like white's up a pawn because of these bad pawns on the c file. Maybe, maybe Fabi can take c five with the queen. Well, I think the thing about e five is after pawn takes e five, wouldn't bishop take c five just be really good? No, because uh, you can't knight if the queen takes f eight. Oh yeah. So I I, I think e five e five c does still seem like the first question to me. Like, how do you deal with that move? If e5, Cordoba would have to take f5 first, um, but that also looks very dangerous, because now you can't take e5, knight takes, pawn takes, due to the fact that bishop takes just wins the exchange. But okay, Fabi there decides... Yeah, there must have been some way to at least hang on there, because Fabi decided to take on c5 instead. Just wins it. I mean, it makes sense. You win a pawn pretty cleanly, it looks like, and, uh, you know, you open up other, other issues here now for black. The b6 square... For the knight, the d6 square, the, the queen is currently kind of overloaded to having to guard the rook. Um, so Fabi looks to be doing well. Okay, there's a lot of exciting games, everybody. Remember that if uh, you, you want to check them out, go to chess.com's live server. You can actually just type a single command, and you will have everything you ever wanted in your entire life. That is all games starting instantly in front of your face with the command slash follow, hashtag PCL. That's right. All of your fantasies have come true with that. But real quick, Jen, the Mun match that is now underway that we have to give a quick shout out to is the last match of the day. That is the Chesbra matchup versus the Miami Champions. Ooh, um, what a what a battle that will be! As Crypto Chess has left the chat because he's been called into the action. Called called to duty, right? And uh, Eric Hansen is throwing down against Daniel Fernandez. Uh, that is that's actually board a board three matchup, I believe, which is. Saying a lot for how the bras have improved things this year with Hanson last year, Jen, having to consistently play, frankly, players a little bit, you know, just a little bit out of his league on board one. A lot of the games were just, it was just tough for Hanson to be the top board. And this year they have Saric, they have Robin Van Kampen playing more. They also have Anish Geary on their roster, though he's currently busy playing in Tata Steel. So if Hanson is board three for the chess bras all year, I mean, that's that's a big game changer for them, and it's one of the reasons I think they're atop the Atlantic Division along with the Bishop, so. Um, Nizhnik, by the way, did take care of business for the Windmills, taking down Josh Bloomer. We also have several other results if you watch the analysis board. Lenderman beat uh, beat Harvey. Sevion, as we as you already know, did, did take down. We actually have a Wonder Liang getting his first win as I just quickly showed there before the next game started. Nizhnik has already won, uh, as we said, over Josh Bloomer. And it looks um, like Jennifer Yu may go down because uh, her position's quite woeful, and she's only got 27 seconds left on the clock as uh, Miranda is just really just seems to have like kind of a yeah. dream Indian-type position in his black. Yeah, somehow Yu has gotten in, in big trouble here. It's a King's Indian dream with a dominant knight on a square like e5, hitting d3, hitting f3, and black is also broken through with, with a move like g4. So uh, this looks like yeah. big trouble. Miranda is um, is yeah, on is... on the hunt here. I mean, what do you play here, Jen? You play rook h2 first, you play g3. Um, really you can also... I... Yeah, I almost like to keep g3 and waiting because I might be able to just move in more quickly by... Uh, you also have bishop h4, broken. though, and then take e1, because if you can remove that defender, all of a sudden yeah. f3 falls. It actually looks like that's what Miranda's going to do, in fact. Indeed. Yeah, yeah, I think... Try to win tactically, because those other lines that you were mentioning were a little positional, and yeah. the whole point of getting a position like this is just get get the resigns, you know? Knight takes, Knight takes f3 is, uh, is probably enough to cause a resigns. Jennifer that's right, made. because now... F2, there's rook takes g2, queen g2, knight e1. Very nice. And Look there at you. Have... You've been rocking the puzzle rush lately or what? <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> you, <laughs> you're just like... Those, it's got to help for something. At least you're rap, like... rapid fire tactics today with Jen Shahadi. I love it. That's a new Twitch show. The people want to know when you're starting your own Twitch channel. That's, that's my... right. That's my I secret know. way to, I get to poke and prod, uh, because you already know I've been asking you privately, so now I get to call you out on camera, right? When, do you, when are you going to start your Twitch channel? It's funny, because Poker Stars is asking me the same exact thing, so I'm hearing it from everyone. Me, me and Poker uh, Stars, we're working together on this, so. 
Um, anyway, but no, great, great tactics, Jen, and of course uh, a great win there by uh, by Miranda over over Jennifer Yu. So, um, where to now? Uh, oh, one game is under crazy time pressure. Let's go to Aaron Berg's game versus one random. Yeah, that is Aaron uh, Jacobson. The position looked pretty relaxed, but the clock times don't look relaxed at all. Um, and it's it's a good bishop, but how do you make any progress as Jacobson? Uh, it doesn't look like you can. There's just no entry points, is there? Yeah. I think this one's going to be a, a draw. But uh, Aaron Berg, I mean, okay, despite the fact that you're right, he, he doesn't really have any business trying to win this position, but he's also, he's the grandmaster and, and uh, is up on the clock, so I don't think he wants to let Jacobson have the peaceful oh, result point. that easily. Good point. I at first was looking at it from the white point of view, you know, but you're right. If you look and see if there's any way for that knight to get in a square that could yeah. be five or something, like maybe C5 or something. Yeah, but you're, I mean. It's hard to get to C5 because you can't get to to um, B7. Yeah. By a B6 and B8. And the, the only square to get there is by F7. Yeah, Black yeah. is Black is gonna have to risk losing to try to win this game, and Ehrenberg might do it. But so I think he's bringing the king over here, Jim, with the idea of threatening g5. Um, and then knight coming to g6, something like something that. Something like that. If he can do it quickly, yeah. g5, pawn takes, knight g6, try to win the e5 pawn. Yeah, that, I think you're totally right. That's why king h4 was played. He he actually anticipated that idea. <laughs> Pretty impressive. Oh, he's gonna go for it anyway. And actually, this is a great idea because after. Even if bishop c2, the knight still comes to g6, I think. Or d5. Look at this. Ehrenberg creating something out of nothing. He's got Masterful. winning chances now. Masterful trickery, I have to say. You know, trying to keep the tension in the game when your opponent's low on yep. time. But is it good, or did White really find a good way to keep the balance? Good thing a for lot Ehrenberg of players. He probably didn't really risk losing with this, even if White yeah. found the right defense. And then you just got to tip your hat to to Mr. Jacobson and say, well done, sir. You defended if you're Ehrenberg, but okay, he, now what's his idea? He's going to try to run the king elsewhere? Uh, I don't think he can. Yeah, look at Jacobson. Heads up play there. King of four actually threatened g6, Jen, after king of eight, because if the king ran, g6, and now king g5, and now who's trying for the win, right? So Jacobson, Jacobson has uh, his head on his shoulders here, and I, and I think we're finally going to see a repetition pretty soon. Oh, wow. And uh, meanwhile, I'd like to draw your attention to uh, Fabiano's game against Emilio Cordova. This one is is uh, very interesting indeed. Fabi's just played the move knight to e3. Uh -huh. um, he's up a pawn at the moment. And it's a, it's a big pawn, Danny, is it's that pawn on e6. Yeah, that's... This move knight e3 is going to force bishop takes e3 because we're threatening the rook on d5, but we're also threatening knight g4. Yeah, I was oh. going to say... Oh, and... Cordova just gives up the the rook on d5. I think Fabi will probably will probably uh, take. Because c3 was losing to e7. Yeah. That's why, right? Because so you couldn't take the bishop away from the e7 square. So either way, he was going to go down. Yeah, either way, he's in big trouble. Getting a lot of questions about my hand bandage today, Jen, but I don't know that I really want to tell them the real story. I feel like you and I could make up a fake story because you know the real I, story. I think I think the real story is pretty funny. The real the real <laughs> story is pretty funny. It's it's not it's not uh, it doesn't chest, feel funny though. Injury, it doesn't. Right? What? The chess injury. I mean, you were playing so much bullet chess. That there you go. Right, hurt. that and that's it. I was playing so much bullet chess, and it was wild. There were I was surrounded. I was surrounded by like twenty guys, and. <laughs> I had I had to win a bullet game to save my family, and at the last second I succeeded, but scraped my hand on the death chamber. I was escaping. That's but what you happened. should see the other guy. Yeah. Um. All right. Well. Uh, okay. So Fabi's Fabi's gonna win. One, right? Yeah. So this was this was nice. Uh, it's it's always great to see one of the top players in the world. Like yeah, and he's. Lady. Once again, looks like he brought his A game, Jen, because he's two and zero, oh, and this is just the guys. The bishops look good, don't they? I mean, they look good. I cannot. We are building up toward a chess bra bishops match that is going to be epic because right now the chess bras look to be off to a good start, and uh, the bishops as well. So, um, speaking of the chess bras, Eric Hansen versus Daniel Fernandez. Yeah, kind of an interesting game. 
Sicilian uh, variation, both players kind of keeping pace on the clock, very imbalanced. Yeah. That pawn, that pawn on b6 intrigues me. Is that going to be a strength um, or a weakness? It all depends on whether or not we can get something into b5 and then thus to c7 profitably or yep. where pieces get traded off and it just really sticks out like a sore thumb pawn on b6. Yeah, I don't I mean, know. I mean, I, I the more I look at this, I really actually like black. I like black's position here and don't feel super confident about uh, about how Hansen got here. There's even weird tactics, possibly like the black queen coming to g5 and and threatening things on on knight h3 check and the g2 pawn. And this is this is looking pretty dangerous for Hansen. So, as I was saying, him on board three is what. Yeah, queen g5, though. I, I'm not sure how dangerous that is because... So you're saying that I can't play g3 because then knight h3 wins. But you're not running knight h3 right away because there's queen takes h3. Yeah. So maybe I, I can deal with it. I mean, I don't have to deal with anything because there wouldn't be any immediate threat. You just feel like the, the black pieces are kind of lurking. Yeah. Yeah. Although it's white on move, so does Eric have a constructive move to play like right at this moment? He's got to figure out something quickly because he, if he keeps taking time here, which is something Eric can struggle with at times, um, he's he's going to be under time pressure very soon. So, all right, we'll keep our eye on this one. Um, yeah, but you're right. It looks dangerous. Uh, White's got to come up with something to justify the material. Okay, let's, let's go back to Wesley So's game. That's one we haven't checked on yet in this yeah. round, and he looks like he's about to win maybe uh, another nice one here against Talia Cervantes. And uh, tricky position right now for Black, that uh, pass pawn on e6, also dominant. It looks like Wesley and Fabiano are trying to win in the same way with dominant passed e pawns. And the problem is that it's actually Wesley who's up material here. Knight g6 check is coming, but he didn't even want to bother with it right away, just starting with rook e1. Um, knight to d6 played, knight g6 now picking up the exchange, along with the pawn, this is going to be over any minute, any second really. Rook d5 again threatening our favorite tactic of the day, rook takes d6. Yeah. And uh, queen c5, and even, even queen takes a... We lost Jen for a second. She'll be back. Oh, there you're here. Oh, very oh, very nice way to finish it off with taking an e7. That'll do the trick. Yeah, I, I, I was thinking like even that would work, but why bother? Um, but in, if you're Wesley, so hey, you're always gonna bother with the best way, right? Yep. That's why you're Wesley, so. Yep. Okay. All right. Well. Uh, and we I'm got some comments about Wesley Snow's cat avatar. I have to agree. That is really amazing. Yeah, people and, uh, love the avatar. People love it. Let's go. Let's go to Ray Robson's game because if he also wins, I mean, I'm sitting here for good reason, applauding the uh, the efforts of the St. Louis Archbishops and what we expect from them this season. But okay, like the win windmills aren't going quietly here. I think Robson is on the verge of winning this game against uh, Ollie right. Morandi. That'll be Ray's second win in a row, I believe, if I'm counting correctly. And yeah, it looks like. He's well on his way. You know, Morandi had such a beautiful game one, but yeah. wasn't able the, to keep the it. The game going. of the day so far, for sure. Definitely. Really nice one. I mean, here I think White can even just play C4 and it's over because that, that king is simply bluffing. Okay, Ray does it this way as well, C4, and if the king takes on E2, king G3 is lights out. Uh, and that's actually a good a good lesson because you would never play C5 and then king F2. Aha. Uh -huh. So, okay, Ray, Ray teaches us a good king and pawn endgame trick there. You have to block your opponent's past pawn, especially when you don't need to be in a rush with yours, right? This pawn is already far enough um, that uh, black can't stop it. So king g3, and I think jj, meaning uh, Ali Morandi, will probably resign here after that move, and indeed he does. So, um, and, and again, everybody, the, the reason is the c-pawn is unstoppable. So a big win there for the windmills. Remember, Ilya Nizhnik already won very quickly in this round against Josh Bloomer. So that's going to be a 4-5 to five score with the only game remaining. Where is the only game remaining right now for the... For, for the, the, the windmills and the... Uh, I think 
think there's still another I'm game going, but there's a lot of games going right now that I'm. No, I, I yeah, I don't see any still underway. Um, yeah. Yeah, maybe you miscounted there, but the uh, the uh, the games between the bras and the champion and the marshals rather. And the champions, indeed, the, the bras and the champions are, are really yeah. starting to continue to be exciting as we see there the main board yeah, popping Robin. back to the uh, Hansen versus Fernandez game. Let's check on Robin Van Campen's game, who's got the black pieces against Alexander Katz. As you were saying, Jen, he was once Looks active back. in our Twitch chat, and now Crypto Chess is busy playing. So, uh, Crypto Chess is kind of going the way of Crypto lately. No, I, sh I shouldn't. I know we both these guys have so many fans, you know, that it's a uh, it's a real tough matchup. But this looks terrible for Alexander. I mean, what can I say? He's down a pawn, and Robin's pieces look really beautiful, don't they? Yeah, this looks pretty good for Black. Both and a then, uh... and I, I, what bothers me also is that King on H two super yep. exposed. I just feel like it's ready to get um, attacked by a tactic. Now, all this said, can um, Alexander get out of it in some way with a move like knight d five? But he takes him and plays rook d1, also smart in the sense that if you get the rooks off the board, maybe your king ends up not being in as much danger on the second rank, but, I mean, you highlighted the problem as well. The other issue is that black has the pawn and the compensation, right? Here, uh, Van Kampen is up a pawn and the one with a much better, much better chance here against the white king. Queen c5, a very nice move, pinning the knight to the king, and I think after the rook defends it, this knight on e4 will just move with devastating results. This looks this looks actually moments away from from white losing, even though there's still some pieces on the board. Yeah, that's why Ben Feingold tells people not to move their f pawn, right? Stuff that's like right. this. That's why he says never move your f pawn. Um, <laughs> I don't know how my, he started trademarking. Is, what is? Go ahead. I was gonna say my dad used to tell us that too. I was gonna say I don't know how Ben got got associated with the forever phrase of don't move your f pawn because it's something that all chess coaches have been saying. No offense, Ben, not taking it away from you, but. We can start calling him F pawn, fine, fine gold F pawn. I don't, I don't even know. I, I mean, his last name starts with an F. Maybe that helps this case. But, um, all right, we have a we have a result in the books. Also for the chess bras, Ivan Saric wins his game against the board four for the Miami champion. So, as he should, Saric uh, wins here with the black pieces. So that's a that's a good start for the chess bras. If Van Kampen does the same, which we sort of expect, then. Um, the chess bras will be out to an early lead, and one of the biggest games of the round will be uh, this game here between Eric like Hansen up. and Dan Fernandez. Yeah. Yes, I did not. I was starting to really agree with you, Danny, and I didn't like the position for Eric, but suddenly that B pawn is getting quite frisky, and he's just played the yep. B set. Um, I'm liking it a little more for White. It feels like this compensation for the exchange could become more real after knight a5, and it's this pawn is just very difficult to um, contest. He's played knight to d5. Plays knight to d5 quickly. I guess he wants to meet bishop a6 with knight b4. Um, so what's the deal on a quiet move like rook d2 with the idea that we're now threatening knight takes c6? Well, the, I think the biggest issue is that the e pawn is about to run for black. So yeah, rook d2 threatens knight. Okay, he goes for it, threatens knight c6, but I think black can defend c6 with, with knight e7 which also hits f5 no but you're right i mean i think this is the right this is the right practical approach by eric given that he was definitely getting outplayed in that middle game um a very strong start here for international master fernandez that's going to put the board three for the chess bras in a in a tough situation this would be a big start for the champions even though we know they have already lost uh one game and, and they're about to lose a second with van camp and a better against alexander katz but but ninety seven is so passive. Yep. I mean, I guess are you threatening to play like rook d eight or something? It's I, crazy. I'm about just... We have a second game with an exchange sacrifice in this matchup between the chess bras and the champions. Let's go over to the game between Eric Kurtz, known to the Twitch community as Mannered Monkey, sort of a a pop culture mini celebrity in the Twitch world. We won't get into it now. Uh, but he's taken on Pavel Elyanov. I don't know. If, I don't know. If I don't know if Eric Kurtz has heard of Elyanov. I mean, but he's pretty good at chess, and here he's in big trouble. So <laughs> Kurtz is known to the Twitch community, but Elyanov is a uh, 2,700 player for a reason. Looks like he's about to get a big win for the champions. 
A big free agent acquisition. Again, remind everybody that free agents are a big part of what make the Pro Chess League so exciting, that you have teams that are locally based in their, in their culture and the majority of their players, but they also have free agents competing almost every week. And El Yanov obviously doesn't reside in Miami. He's, uh, he's probably playing from Ukraine, actually. I wonder how late it is there for him. Um, so we'll, I don't know. Um, but yes, indeed, Aljanov is uh, going to win this one. But the, and I think it's probably about eight hours, seven hours plus in Ukraine. So it's got to be like 2 a.m. or something. That's going to be a big matchup. If Aljanov can help lead the champions all day today, I would say that for the first time, at least in commentary I've done for the Atlantic match, I would put him as, I would, I would put somebody favored over the board one for the bras over Sarich. I think Aljanov is very strong and also very well very well versed on chess.com plays in a lot of our title Tuesdays so I think he's going to be comfortable leading the champions today all right so back Eric, yeah I'm still I'm still fascinated by the Eric Hansen game but yep. you, were you going to go to something else the... no no I was about to say back to that game because Hansen has actually made it a real mess and now is actually Whoa, so now it's two pieces for a rook now all of a sudden. Now two pieces for the dolphin. rook, but, but black also has two that pass pawns. And that A pawn in particular looks pretty yeah. dangerous. You're right, actually, both of them look dangerous. The question is, can we get some counterplay, um, perhaps on like F7 just against the king with like bishop C4 and rook D7? Um, Knight D4 was Hansen's choice, just trying to um, give himself a little bit of protection on that E2 square. Hmm, yeah, but you got to hand it to Hansen, who's fought back here to make this thing really tricky and, and is also no longer the one down significantly on time. Um, Bishop b5 is in the air as well, so that's a concrete threat that Daniel's going to want to have to deal with. But he could just maybe deal with that in the most prosaic way possible, which is by playing a3. Yeah, I was going to say a3 looks, uh, looks kind of simple and straightforward, so... That's not think. a bad thing, is it? What? In ch in 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 blitz chess, that's not not always a bad thing. Exactly. I was going to say a lot of time. I mean, but I also lose a lot of blitz games by playing moves that I think are simple and straightforward. So you know, these guys these guys taking their time. I can't really judge it. Um, Dare okay. I say, baby? Rook a eight. That's a nice idea. He's just completely abandoning the e pawn and saying all of my chips are are in on the a pawn. There you go. First poker reference of the day. How did I? How did two hours go by before I made my per first poker reference with you on the show? I don't know. Yeah, well, that's the next one's got to be all in. Shame on, shame on me, shame on me. But <laughs> uh, Fernandez is all in over here on the A file. Uh, let's check quickly again on the game between Van Campen and Katz, Kempsey and Crypto Chess, because I saw the rook ending and first thought maybe Katz had defended well enough. But now looking that Black's going to have a lot of pawns over there on the king side, I. Uh, I think Kempsey's still actually in good shape to win this one, looks like. You know, speaking of poker, I, I've been telling my poker friends that chess is the new crypto because a year ago, all poker players were obsessed with crypto, and now they're all obsessed with chess. Yep. So that would make crypto chess chess chess, which might there's, not have There you go. I love that. There's been a, there's been a lot of, of, of chess stream, sorry, poker streamers on Twitch actually kind of uh, flirting with, with some chess on their, on their uh, regular channels, so... So yeah, um, oh, and yeah, obviously, it. I mean, Dan, you know, Daniel Negreanu, Liv Three, who we. I, have. I was just about to say, obviously, we did that. We did that show where Liv and Daniel joined us, and Liv was almost a guest of ours three times during the World Championship coverage. But she went actually on site in London a couple times. Anyway, the schedule didn't work out. But yeah, Liv is is still into chess, and we know Daniel tweets about a game and almost throwing his computer out the window like almost every other day. So we hope that Daniel doesn't actually do anything crazy when he loses a chess game. Yeah, it seems like everybody's kind of hot for chess right now, though. I know I'm pretty sure that uh, some of the top streamers are also really interested in it. So it's great. It's a good time. Yeah. I mean, it's a great time to be a chess player because yep. there's so many wonderful free content and streams. And uh, of course, uh, you know, if you want to pay for coaching or premium content, you can get better even faster. So chess, chess here chess, chess. has somehow <laughs> seemed seemed to make things at least a little bit more interesting than I would have expected. I really thought he was going down, down. Yeah, he but... still it still should be going down, and probably Black is in territory of just give up the A pawn and, 
and go for it. But but maybe that's how he'll hold is maybe Van Kampen doesn't want to do that. Sometimes when you've been kind of nursing an advantage all day, Jen, you don't like the idea of going for like a crazy calculation line, right? You kind of want things to be easy. And that might that might hurt Van Kampen because now if he's waited too long instead of just pushing the pawns when he should have, maybe he's given Katz some, some real counterplay here with the B-pawn. So I was um, just checking on my fantasy team, guys, and I was like, wait, why am I not on the first line? <laughs> I'm like, why am I not on the first What did you pick wrong? All right, well, we'll get a fantasy <laughs> update here, but I think I think you're right. I think Katz has made this a little bit harder than we thought, but let's quickly go to the Fernandez game versus Hanson because, wow, H5 was just played by Fernandez, which I think was a huge mistake because now these two G-pawns might actually create a mating net. Can you say comeback here? Hanson, Hanson might somehow make a comeback and win this game. Uh oh, that's that's a really good point. So you you hate the move H five because well, I just I hate looking at the potential of a mating net if I'm playing the black position here. Um, although like, I admit that yeah, I mean Hansen had already done a he'll play. G, oh, I thought he was gonna play G six. Okay, he takes an F seven, but now King G seven and yeah, I was gonna say where's the beef now? What's oh? Well, there's a knight, knight of three little in between her move. Stick, next up, next up is knight G five. Very nice. Okay. Hansen only has eight seconds. This is where we're staying until we have a result. This is this is uh this is where the action is right here. Play work to d6. Okay, there's been one wrap. He's gonna Time repeat to... once, and it may end up being just a whole bunch. Ooh! Oh, 96! 96. He just misses this. Just blunders oh. his rook. Wow! Huge, oh. huge comeback by Hansen. A devastating loss there for <laughs> Fernandez, who, if you're just joining us, had. Had a clear advantage earlier as Black. Um, I don't know if it was ever winning, but was definitely better. But handed handed to Hansen, who managed to work his way back in this game. Okay. Um, Knight's okay. too strong and blitzed, Danny. <laughs> well, I think I think Fernandez maybe made a practical mistake there and forgetting the Jim. We talk about the obviously the individual matchups. Every every chess game is an individual match, but the team matchup suggested that a draw was not the worst result there for Fernandez, right? And I think sometimes it's hard to forget when you had an advantage earlier in the game and just kind of let it go. And Kempsey's about to convert this one here and, and win against Cat. So what I'm saying is even though it still would have had the champions going into the next round down, it would have been a half a point difference, which could have been huge for them. I think, I think in a team environment, sometimes you have to be willing to swallow your pride and say, hey, look, I was winning earlier as black. I'm not anymore. He should have just repeated with his king, meaning Fernandez, instead of allowing the fork. You know what I'm saying from a practical point of view? I think it's I think it's easier said than done, but we see that a lot in the pro chess league format. Yeah, it's really tough. I mean, the clock is ticking, and you know you get really heated up right. in these types of situations. So well, really we... tough. It looks like I'm, I'm just taking a little spin around the games here. Yeah, so many options, hardly enough time. We've got Sam Sevillon. Taken on Ravi Haria, um, a, a, a weird game where I don't know whose king is in trouble. But the more I look, looks like Sevion might just be winning in a second if he plays Queen E6 check. I don't know. I don't know how that's not mate. Um, yeah, how, Sevion looks to be doing great in this game, and then we've got Fadi against uh, Ilya Nizhnik, certainly one of the more anticipated uh, games of the day. Yeah, this will be uh, this will be a top one. We got to watch this round for sure. That just started, but. Um, they've trotted out quite a lot of theory to get, I'm sure, I assume, because they did it in one minute each, um, to get into a, a, what what looks like a very imbalanced middle game position. So I'm really excited for this one, Danny. Yep. And, and you know, you highlighted that Nizhnik, obviously, uh, and the and the windmills do have some very strong grandmasters themselves. Ilya Nizhnik, Ray Robson, and if they're going to have any chance, somebody has to... At least Nick, if not slay the monsters on boards one and two, right? The monsters being Carwana and So. A again, if you can't beat them, if you could Nick them a little bit, maybe get a draw. I mean, that that that's your your best chance. You have to do something to slow down those two guys. Because um, right now, all things considered, if you if if the bishops have a two game lead headed into the third round of play, always, and you've got So against other grandmasters and Carwana against other grandmasters, I'll take that matchup for the bishops every time. Um, all right, and, and speaking of which, who is Wesley still playing? There you go. Wesley's got a game against Ray. So yeah, we'll definitely keep an eye on these two battles, Wesley So versus Ray Robson, Ilya Nizhnik versus Fabiano Carwana. And, of course, we'll get Fabi versus Ray in the final round. That's right. Um, coming up, so, yeah, that's, 
that'll that'll be one that we'll keep our eyes peeled for. So, in this game between Ray and Wesley, uh, you know, looks looks attractive for White. I was gonna say it looks kind of boring, but we weren't apparently we weren't finishing each other's sentences there because this one looks this one looks boring compared to the fact that Wesley's had two games where he was up a rook after like move twenty or something. So, um, <laughs> but uh, no, you're right. This this does look a little bit better for White. So Ray off to a decent start. Well, they don't stay boring for long in this time control, Danny. That's, That's true. what I like about control. They, it, it might start boring, and then it gets becomes like the most exciting thing ever, right? Right. Like that game that was a candidate for game of the week. Wasn't that a – that looked like it might start fizzling out as pieces got traded, and all of a sudden, boom. Yep. Well, let's let's check on the one game that seems to be – it could get a little weird in the end because this match is also still very close. That is the one between the Lions and the Sopranos. And right here, Tom Bartell uh, up on the clock. And if he gets – okay, actually, but he's, he's, he's up on the clock and also better. And if he gets this game, that's going to be big for the Sopranos. That would, that would push the lead to, uh, to three games as they head into the next round of play. Right, and uh, you're pulling up this game, this interesting um, yeah. in-game situation. I, I think black can even just check and go after the h-pawn. I mean, queen d1, king h2, check on h5, king moves, and then I know it's weird to play a move like queen takes h6, but if I can get away with it, a pawn's a pawn. Uh, you're uh, a pawn rubber. I am. You know, but you do it's commentary fine. You do commentary with Yasser a lot, so you're used to pawn grabbers, right? That's right, yes, That's yes. Right. You do you have to wait a couple hours until Yaz grabs grabs all the random pawns. <laughs> right. Well, <laughs> and gets checkmated sometimes. Sometimes by the sometimes end. Sometimes he man. does, but he like he, uh, Yasser likes himself a pawn or two or seven. So, um, <laughs> all right. Well, but uh, jokes aside, I think Bartel is clearly going to be considering that. The other funny move to consider is f4, and you would meet. Okay, this is this is risky. You would meet Queen e5 with f5, and the point is. If white doesn't have... Okay, white does have a draw with queen e7, king h6, and queen h4. Okay, so, no, he, he goes queen h5, and I expect him to... I expect him to get greedy here. I expect Bartel to take the pawn. Why not? Yeah, he does it. There you go. Oh, maybe I was wrong. I don't know. Maybe there's going to be a draw here. <laughs> I don't have any engine in front of me, but on the uh, the screen that previews how our show looks to the fans, there is an eval bar on that board, and sometimes I see it change, and I go, wait, I guess I was wrong, even though I don't see why. Yeah. Um, oh, I think I just saw a result come in. Uh, no, uh, I'm looking for these uh, time scrambles. Uh, queen takes h6 on the board. Oh, it's happened? No. Yeah, 30 seconds left for Roberson, by the way. He just played queen takes f7. Oh, yeah, yeah. I thought I thought you said I thought you said Roberson took h6. Um, but no. No, no, he took on f7. Got it. So White now has taken on f7. Bartel no, plays king g4. Four. God, looks. This is such a tempting position for White, where you want to be able to like calculate to make sure there's any no kind of like yep. hidden checkmates, right? But the problem is the material is so reduced. Somebody just made a comment in the Chess TV chat that fun fact: Sam Sevion was a student of Greg Shahadi, not necessarily a private student. Sam Sevion participated in a lot of U.S. chess schools, which, if you're not familiar with that. You don't know that it's one of the other amazing things that Greg Shahadi is involved in for the chess world. The U.S. Chess School is actually a, uh, a sponsored yearly, the, these days, numerous camps a year for the, bre the best and brightest uh, in America. And uh, Sam Sevion and, and Greg have a famous video online uh, that I think has over a million views, right, where, where Sevion... Oh, yeah. And so I think a lot of people associate Greg as being a coach of, of Sam, unless I, unless they were ever taking private lessons, I wasn't aware of, I don't think so, I think, I think, no, uh, no, no. no I it's think, like, it's a th three million views, Danny, I yeah. think, uh, and this is really a phenomenal video, you guys gotta watch it if you haven't yeah. seen it yet, really I, I don't, I, I don't think Sam was ever Greg's student, because I'm pretty sure Sam came out of the womb better than me and Greg at chess, so I, you know, I just, just saying, Sam, no, I'm kidding, but Sevion, Sevion's been good at chess for a very, very, very long time. But for those of you who actually are among the three million who viewed that video, I want you to send me a one word in Twitch or chess.com TV chat to prove it. You know what word it is. Send the word. Send the word. Send the word. I want to hear this. And it's not, it's not bird. 
this time. The word is not <laughs> bird this time. Bird is not the word, just pro chip. Um, okay, queen h6 buries the queen, but there was a weird threat of f3 and then queen h2 mate. So, okay, wait, f4, but now the king gets out, and where's the follow-up for Roberson? I think Spinal Tap is... is, is Wiggling his way out for the Sopranos. This is a, this is a. I mean, honestly, Jen, it's early to say this, but we haven't been hyping this moment. If, if Bartel wins this game here, I think he really kind of clinches the match for the Sopranos because this game probably should be a draw with best play. So if he wins this one and they take a three-game lead into the final round of play, that's it's pretty har hard to overcome a three-game deficit in only four games. A lot of people are trying to get the word, but nobody got it right yet. Really? Yeah, I mean, I've got seven up. I'm winning him. Those are good tries. Greece, nope. Maybe Crash bird is game. the maybe bird is the word. I don't know. I don't maybe know. To me it, it <laughs> felt like the climax of the video, but I don't know. Maybe people have their other ideas. For I, I, I'll, I'll wait a little bit longer as we let's pop over to another game. I what well, I was waiting to see if Bartel could could do it. Uh, uh I think he just uh, blundered the perpetual. There it is. Now it's a dead draw. So okay, Roberson is going to keep this one at least within striking distance for the Lions. It's going to be a 7-5 to five lead for the Sopranos heading in the last round. So, yeah, let's go to other games. Jen, your call, although let me just highlight real quick that Sergey Ehrenberg just lost really quickly to, uh, to Zurabek here. What happened here? Zurabek just won with the black pieces in, in, in almost miniature in less than 30 moves. So, Whoa. craziness. But, all right, um, that's, a, that's a big win right there for the uh, Marshals over Aramark for the Pawn Grabbers. But let's go back to Fabiano's game with Nishnik. That is kind of the marquee matchup of the round, right? Sure, and it looks like uh, Ilyan Nishnik is up in exchange, guys. Has Bobby potentially in trouble, or does he have um, mounds of compensation due to the strong knight on C5? What do you think, Danny? I, I think <laughs> he's just worse. Yeah, I agree with you. I think that... I, okay, how much worse is he when the rooks are lacking open files currently so they're not like flexing their muscles at this point against the knight but if this board becomes open you have to like nizhnik you have to like the exchange um where did let's let's use the analysis board to the bat cave let's let's go back a few moves and see what happened because on move 25 we were still equal on material but nizhnik had the bishop pair everybody bobby played queen h3 and after queen g2 traded and played b6 but that means after f4, uh, and uh, I think Fabi was just in trouble as the position was becoming open. Did he sacrifice this or lose the exchange? f5, king f7, rook d4, and he played rook f6 and just gave up the rook on f6, which I think is a bad sign. Okay, I mean, clearly it was a sacrifice if we use Dr. Evil quotation fingers, but it may have been a force sack because I think Fabiano's worse here. Yeah, I mean, it might be very difficult for White to break through, but certainly worse is Fabiano. And shout out to Vertwitch on our Twitch chat who did come up with the right word, classic. There it is. And, uh, <laughs> when, when, as soon as Sevian gets a winning position, he takes a, a big, long sip of his 7-up and says, classic. <laughs> you, you have to see it. Yeah. Uh, but this position is White coming up. The problem is this knight on e4 is so strong, Danny, and it's so hard for the king to get into the play, so is it going to be a, a kind of fortress-like girl? Yeah, it, it could be, but it could be that we're suffering from a little bit of a disease that's going around called Fabiano bias, where we look <laughs> at all positions and believe Fabiano must be doing fine because he's Fabiano Caruana. But... I don't know. I mean, it does seem like there's some legitimate um, difficulties with conversion here. I, 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 I agree, I agree. But I think Nizhnik is a strong enough GM that he's not going to lose. I think if... Okay, one idea is to play king of two, and if you can sacrifice the f5 pawn with check, something like king of two, then king e1 check after the king takes it, get your king to d2. I want to create new lines for my rooks. Um, but actually, you know, this pawn on h3 is really annoying, right? Because all of a sudden there's tactics over here where, all right, maybe we're not suffering from Fabiano bias-itis. Fabiano bias-itis, TM, just made it up. Fabiano bias-itis. <laughs> Um, okay, but he goes king of two. I actually, I like this idea by Nizhnik. I think that you have to create open lines for the rooks, or you're just letting Fabiano work you over with the knight, moving in and out. Yeah, okay, so king f2, and now 
You're saying if I take on f5, what's you're just gonna be able to play king e1 and king d2 check. But so it's now started... g4 is falling. Now g4. Knight takes five. Rook takes g4 is your prediction. I, I think rook takes g4, and if king takes f5, I have two moves. One is king f3 with the threat of e4 check. Oh, no, but then rook takes e3. Oh, but maybe not, right? You don't really want to play rook takes e3 and king takes g4 because my rook gets super active, but may maybe. I mean, I think at this point, Nizhnik has to be a, a little careful, um, but I, I don't see another move besides taking g4 as, as an option. Rook takes g4, I could also try to play knight c3. Um... Just get my knight back into the game with tempo. Okay. All right, well, so, let's keep our eye on this. We'll see if Fabiano can prove his exchange sack is not just Fabiano ah. biasitis. Look at this move, d5. Now king takes e f5. Is, look at that move. Rook takes g4, instantly d5. So he's not thinking about winning anything back. He's thinking no. about his own counterplay. Gotta well, not love only it. that, but the rook on g4 is trapped, Jen. It's like... I mean, okay, it has no. the a4 square, but then knight c3 comes in. So d5 was also... Pl okay, a4, but now king takes f5 can be played if he wants. And um, the rook is out of squares. That's right. And then we, we would have to play something like rook takes g5 and pawn takes b5. And... All right, well, maybe Fabiano will prove the exchange set good. But let's go back to the game that Jen... Jen actually predicted when I said it looked boring. And she said maybe it'll become one of the more exciting ones because now... Now this position is really interesting, and I think that Ray Robson might be better against Wesley So. Uh, cool. It's got a you got a huge center at least. You look at this center, and it's hard not to like it. Yeah, um, that bishop on b2 gives something to be desired with the pawn on c3, though. I'm, I almost want to just jettison it, just like casually swipe it yep. off the board, Manny. You would love to just give away the c3 pawn, especially if you could break through with d5. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. and. Wow, this is an interesting move. Uh, Wesley plays the move b5. It's nice, and the the really simple positional idea, everybody, is if, if okay, Ray's not going to do this, but if you take and then maybe play c5, you're giving up all the light squares, and that'll forever highlight the fact that this bishop on b2 is kind of a big pawn, as Jen was saying. So, uh, I like b5 by Wesley. Yeah, me too. I, I, it's, very, um, it's not a move that comes to your mind quickly if you're not a... A very strong grandmaster, but I think it it's it's really elegant. Yeah. You're trying to, you're trying to really play up for strength in the position and take away your opponent's strength. And if they don't have time to play d5 immediately, this does the job real well. So yeah, d5 immediately. I like it. I like b5 by Wesley. Um, Fabiano has not moved in his position against Nizhnik after the move d5 and again I'm not super surprised about that because I think he has a lot to calculate with whether he's going to play this move king takes f5 um, we'll keep the the main live board there on this game with so but let me find one that we could jump to quickly because uh, several games getting really exciting Jen let's go to the game between Sergei Azarov versus a happy pawn Jennifer you because maybe this time she will be happy she's got a happy pawn on e5 uh, but she's down the exchange. That's no bueno. No, I don't think so. I don't, I don't think there's going to be enough counterplay here because we can start uh, harassing those pawns on the, the queen side with, with the rook. Uh, obviously, we can't play rook b8, but there's got to be a way to get to them. Yeah. You know, figure maybe rook a8 to a6 to b6 or something. It's not like we're under any kind of massive time pressure. That like king of e2 uh, prevents the pawn from any on e5 from getting too frisky, so I, I just have a feeling that White's going to worm his way in with his rook somehow. Yeah. Maybe okay, let's let's take both... Rook let's, here or something. Let, let, let's but, take okay, our focus over to the Hansen game, because he's got Elyonov on, on task. That's not easy. Okay, well that's a huge battle indeed. Yeah. As we see, um, Eric had played with White last game, he's playing black now. Um, even material, even pawns, this creepy move, queen a6. Uh, g5, just played. played very quickly here by Hansen. Uh-huh, bishop g3 played just as quickly. Yep. 
By the way, I call it a creeping move because the queen can move as many squares as she wants, but yep. sometimes it just moves one square to the left, and that always feels like uh, it, it's often called a creeping move. Yeah, and and, now, and she may she may creep the next move to b7, right? Where the queen, as you said, she's the most powerful piece, but goes a6 to b7, and here there's threats on all kinds of things on the 7th rank. Okay, Ooh, and I like that idea, and that's why Hansen's getting aggressive with f5. Yep. You can't let it just be all play on the on the white squares, because then Aljana will just, uh, you know, out-strategize him. Yep. He needs to get his own play. Well, the, the queen, indeed, did creep her way to b7, and the question now on f4... Is Elyonov just going to take it and then play bishop h4, Jen, where suddenly it's like Elyonov planned it all along, where the pieces would, would meet for a date on e7? And actually, that looks really that looks really irritating for black. So I think, I think queen b7 is showing uh, Elyonov has an, has an interesting plan in mind. All right. I think he's going to take and play. I like this for Elyonov. I don't, I don't understand how Hansen is going to justify this overexpansion here, especially with this plan that... We highlighted and is now on the board. I like. Well, uh, he's got to come up with a better move uh, in this position. Is there anything? Is there any way to get some counterplay here? Um, seems you, tough. I mean, White's putting yeah. things even like Queen D7 because if the ladies come off the board, White White instantly has a rook on the seventh rank. So I think um, I think Hansen's going to be defending this one here for for a little while, hold, trying to hold for a draw. Which okay. Objectively, that's not a bad result. He is playing black against Pavel Yanov, but um, this is going to be a tough draw on rook d7. Yeah, I'm, I'm liking white. What, what classy play by Aljanov. You know, you, you got your queen on b5, and you want to get it on b7. So you get to go queen a6, queen b7, and uh, Ooh, let's... It, it's all about that weakness of the light squares. Um, you don't have a light squared bishop, and the move b6 uh, really limits your defensive possibilities in those squares. You're right, and let's go to the game with JJ. That's uh, oh, Tali, she's about to lose on time. Oh, she played that move with zero point seven seconds on the clock. Who's who? Did you say about to uh, lose on time? Ali Morandi, last seven samurai is on the attack against Talia Cervantes, Talia, unfortunately, yeah. and that's going to do it because um, he wins on time as she fails. Wow, yeah, yeah, she was yeah. she was losing on the board. So again, as we highlighted, the bishops are tough to deal with, especially when their weakest grandmaster of the day. The fact that you can even say the weakest grandmaster for their team that day, right? The fact that you can say that, that's a bad sign. Um, well, I predict, a, I have a prediction that Talia Cervantes is going to do really well in the next tournament she plays in, because after playing uh, those three players in your first three rounds, yeah, anything no. else is fucking easy, right? Right, exactly. All right, well, uh, many options. Carwana's game with Nizhnik has become... One where um, it feels like Black is probably the only one who can win now. Um, the uh, the pawns have the pawns have grouped themselves well there on the queen side. White is White is in trouble. Moves like knight e4 are being threatened. Classic Fabiano. Fabiano's game. I'm looking. Oh, geez. Yeah. What a what a difference. Yeah, I think. I think Nizhnik is just in big trouble. So, we you were not suffering from Fabiano bias itis, Jen. That's good, right? It's good to know. <laughs> I have to admit, I put him on my fantasy team. Okay, I so, knew so you had a little bit of your own bias, no? But uh, it's me and everybody else. No, not everybody. Yeah, else. Uh, most most probably smart fantasy team builders had him had him on the top board. Um, all right, but this is really tough for Nizhnik. The point is 94 check is threatened. There's no clear way to even deal with it because if you move the rook, let's say, with a tempo from g5 to g6, the black king comes to c5, re returning the favor with another tempo, rook d3, things like knight e4 check, and, and I think black is just... Black is really uh, the one playing for the win here in this endgame, so... Wow. This is the second time I've been covering a Fabiano game in this year's PCL Gen where he sacrificed in exchange relatively early against a Grandmaster and then just proceeded to completely outplay them. Um, week one was a, was a very similar uh, game, at least as far as that theme reminded me of it. So impressive stuff, and now he's up almost four minutes on the clock. What about Wesley So's game with Ray Robson? Wesley Stowe and Ray Robson. You know, before we were, you were mentioning that you kind of liked that for uh, Ray, and I, I mentioned that I, I was not happy about his bishop on b2 because yep. of the, the pawn on c3, and 
as the game has continued, it looks like uh, Black is doing my, well, yeah. Yeah, some of my concerns about that Bishop A1 have actually become accentuated as now the idea is simply to um, to pile up on that knight on E3. Uh-huh. Uh, so we're going to regain our peace. No, you were and you were 100% right. I was I was wrong on my initial evaluation. And you know this move, if we go back to move 21, B5 was really strong by Wesley, like we were saying, right? A thematic, you know, very, uh, very strategic idea, B5, to just highlight forever that the light squares will be owned by black, and you were right that uh, this dark square bishop never saw the light of day. When the smoke cleared, black did gain control over the all-critical light squares. So much so that Ray had to rush with this move 25d5, but then he just starts starts opening up black's pieces here. Bishop c5, queen c6 check, and uh, this is where we currently stand. Rook f1, and uh, my guess is that Wesley will take on a3 with the bishop in order to maintain the d-file control. Now this b5 move, Danny, that's definitely a uh, yeah. one for quiet rush. Quiet rush. Look at that. So we've had b5 and d6. <laughs> quiet rush is a thing. I'm going to make a note of that. <laughs> quiet rush is a thing. Actually, one of our I mentioned Piot, uh, our architect who quickly turned around the amazing command that fans can now use to follow everything instantly. Uh, Piot is a huge chess fan himself. He's about a 1900 rated player. Um... Uh, that is the guy who is the, uh, I call him the godfather behind the, the the server where the most chess games are played every day. He has a lot to be proud of, but he is always giving me feature ideas. And one of his ideas is something similar to this, where you basically do tactics trainer, but you're trying to guess the wrong move that was played. And he's uh, and he's been like obsessed with this idea. I don't know that it's the best idea, but I'm just saying it on air. So I don't know. Maybe we can get other feedback about it if other people like it. So. I like that. I, I, I think that, it's, but by the way, Quiet Rush, I think, is a, is a, it needs to be rebranded. Yeah, it's like, <laughs> quiet, rush. quiet Rush is like, what are we doing? Is this a sorority? Like, what's going on here? Quiet Rush, I don't know what's happening with this. Um, all right, King E7, Rook C8, okay, the bishop will go to B6, and I think Wesley is uh, in control. Actually, wait, really Rook, nice. Rook D1, okay. Rook D1, Rook D2 wins the bishop, but then Rook takes C7 would, re would return that exchange, so... So I think Wesley will probably play bishop b6 first. Yeah, it, it, it's yeah. just such a beautiful game, Danny. I have to tell you, like, this is now, I think this is my second favorite game of the day, actually. It's, it's been a really a different type of game, right, than JJ's Greek yeah. Gift, but but a really instructive one by Wesley, assuming he goes on to win it, especially with Ray only having seven seconds. So, All right, what about Fabiano's game? Look at this. He's uh, He's doing what Fabiano does. Um, oh, those four pawns look menacing, don't a, they? That's a lot of pawns. That's a lot of pawns for black. Four pawns. <laughs> yeah. By the way, Jen, we, we had a Photoshop contest the last time I covered the bishops, which was a lot of fun. Um, they uh, they often stick around and root for their teammates. That's Wesley So and Fabian Carwana. Did you see them depicted as the cheerleaders from SNL? I did see a couple photoshops. I'm not sure if I saw that one. I saw was, some really good ones. It was a yeah, good one. Was they, were the, they were the Spartans cheerleaders. And normally Wesley and Fabi, it's one of the coolest things about the team format, right? Like they're hanging out, rooting for their teammates. And uh, Wesley So and Fabiana Caruana look like they're on their way to leading the Bishops again, getting it done. That's right. I mean, there's so much camaraderie at that club, Danny. I'm sure uh, the fans are all really excited in St. Louis as they root on their Archbishops. Um, King E5 just played by Ilya, and B5. It's just you know, there's it's just too much. It's just too many pawns. <laughs> too many pawns. Too many. Four many. Four many. Four many pawns. Yep. The title of a good book. Four many pawns. <laughs> good play. Four the many pawns. Position. I shall attack. Um, um, the worst. The worst his position gets. The worse my puns get. This could be a yeah. fun, exciting That's finish, just, just to see what happens here. Like, is he yeah, gonna, totally. Is he going to take G7 and then play B3? It would probably be unnecessary, but a lot of ways to probably win this one with so many pawns. And it looks like, uh, yeah, you can keep looking at that. I'm just looking for future games for us yeah, to look at. Yeah, me too. I've got yeah, my eye on Elyonov's game with Hansen. Definitely get some attention. It looks like Elyonov is now... Uh, down. Wait, isn't he? Wait. I don't understand what happened. He's down a piece now. Well, I was looking at it like in the mini board here, and Where's he is just piece? down a piece. 
What happened to his other piece? Let's find out. All what? right, let's see. Takes f4, okay. takes. Bishop h4. All good. Queen c8, takes, takes. Rook d7, king f7, king f1. King e6, rook b7. Oh, he trapped his own rook. Rook b7 was a blunder. After rook a8, the rook has run out of squares. Ah, I see. Oh, God. Oh, rook my eight. gosh. Look at this. Rook to b7. Hansen finds... Hansen finds rook to a8, and then How bishop to f8. Oh my god, rook a8, what a move! And the rook That's is incredible. simply out of squares. But and wait, at, but... Well, I, I still don't, I, he stacks I still, the knight on e5, but that's because he's losing the rook. There's no way to stop king to d6. You mean this, his whole idea is rook a8, bishop f8, followed by knight d8. No, Danny, that's not a real idea that you can find in game 15. That okay. is unbelievable. Well, maybe You're he got not... lucky, but the point is after rook b7. What? How? How I do mean, you see that, Danny? Rook b7, rook a8. I mean, I think I think it's one of those things where... It's easy to take for granted if you're Elyonov that this rook is not going to get trapped, but the moment rook a8 happens, there was already an immediate threat on bishop f8, which was the idea of knight d8 and king d6. So even if you don't... I mean, it's already too late. It's too late. So perhaps Hansen, whether he blundered into it or found it, like with this sort of depth of, you know, I don't know, depth of... Uh, depth 30, as they would say, <laughs> or depth Carlson. There's That's genius. That's pure genius. That's you're, amazing. You're, you're... It's one of the weirdest tactics I've ever seen. You're literally bringing all your pieces to the back row. Well, Every maybe we have a new favorite game. Yeah. What an amazing, what an amazing turnaround here. As again, those of you earlier can make fun of me, but not necessarily wow. the right way. Because I, I was right to say Elyanov is definitely better here. Black is fighting for a draw, but but this move rook b7 has surprisingly devastating uh, reverse reverse problems. The rook loses squares, and Hansen. With a huge turnaround, that that's why White sacrificed the piece because there was no way to stop King D6 winning the rook on C7, and where we currently stand is a game where Hansen is about to get a huge victory as Black over Pavel Elyana for the chess bras. Absolutely brilliant, Danny. And I, yeah. I mean, the, the problem with this game is that it wasn't as good at the beginning, but yep. in terms of the conception, this is the conception of a, of the day. Yeah. I mean, amazing this is stuff. Definitely the, rook A8 is a move of move of the tr of the of the week come on how can you beat rook a8 yeah brilliant stuff i agree that although again i much. mean bishop takes a okay jj's move d5 may okay so we've seen we've seen some really good stuff today but hansen again i mean i think i think this is going to be a huge year for eric hansen in week one gen you could feel it because he had a okay he was three and oh he ultimately finished with three and a half out of four but the fact that he's got the support this year and he's not trying to fight off these 2750 GMs on board one for the chess bras, he's actually playing better against those 2750 GMs, right? The fact that the pressure, I think, in some ways isn't all on Hansen to carry the chess bras. I mean, it might be a foregone conclusion for some people to say the Bishops win the Atlantic Division, but I don't know. I mean, the chess bras are really playing well this year. This is this is an amazing victory right now for Hansen to beat Elliot. Is that the kind of move like that you get? Because um, I've never been that close, Danny. But if you're like in on 54 of of Puzzle Rush, you right. get a move to find Rook A8, I guess. Because it's like no, that but, was um, crazy. I agree. I agree. <laughs> and then I have also never been above the 50s, so I'm I'm in the same club as you. So. You said it almost. I almost sensed that you were thinking that maybe I had, and I was like, "Thank you," but no, no, I no, I've never been in that territory. Although Hikaru manages to get 55 while talking trash with chat and and singing along to Elvis. So, oh wow, yeah, yeah, that sounds like that sounds like a lot of fun. Yeah. I'm not gonna say no, but I I got a great tweet from Wandering Winder who says yeah. that he thinks that Quiet Rush should be called Puzzle Hush. Puzzle, Puzzle Hush. Hush. There you go. Puzzle hush. All right. So we've got uh, we've got Robin Van Campen, Kempsey, taking on uh, Tian Ki Wang or Wong. Tian Ki Wong. Um, this also looks like another soon-to-be victory here for the Chess Bros. Van Campen bringing his A game today. So that makes you wonder about the other two games. Um, Crypto Chess. Alexander Katz has his work cut out for him, taking on Saric here. Um, and Sarge is on the grind as well. The chess bras are 
I don't know if you remember, Jen, in week one, the Chess Bros had the match clinched before the last round of play began, and they may be on pace to doing the same here today. Saric is going to get this game, I believe. Van Kampen's going to get his game. Hansen won his game. So what about the Mannered Monkey taking on Dan Fernandez? Okay, this one looks like it's favoring the champions. Fernandez is definitely the only one who can win this obstacle bishop ending, but even a draw would be a successful result for Kurtz in this game. For sure, so yeah, maybe he holds, yeah. Yeah, we've got lots of excitement over Puzzle Hush in the chat. Puzzle we've Hush. got a shout out to Unk the Awesome who said if, he's. If we could find a way, I mean, yeah. the algorithm that makes the Puzzle Rush in our tactics, where I'm like, my brain is actually ticking with that because if we could find a way where we we actually sort of like, you know, we 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 uh, we filter the data so that the move the moves you have to find are are only moves, but always when your opponent is the one who's, like, better. And so this is the only move that equalizes. And so what we do is we filter the puzzles to be only that. That actually is maybe possible with, with the way our tech actually, um, you know, filters. It's one of the things we work actually really hard on is the algorithm so that we're constantly finding new puzzles that work and keeping it fresh and, and challenging. And I, I, I probably should get into all of how that little secret sauce works. But again, I think that we could do that if we could actually make it work specifically for positions where you're losing unless you find one move. So you're hushing. You're doing the Magnus Carlsen finger with the hush thing, right? So you're, you're hushing your opponent's counterplay with puzzle hush, TM. Uh, see, I, when I thought of it, I was thinking that's, I think that's a really good idea. And I was also thinking like something that's not a check, not a capture, and not a checkmate threat. Okay, so, but still the best move. Yes. There you go. Is it. somebody making notes of this? Are you <laughs> making any notes? Can we get a shout-out to the producer for the first time? This is Studio C, for those of you wondering where we are in the world. Jen Shahadi, of course, calling in. Shout-out to the one, the only. That's him right there. That's him. R in Hawaii, live from Studio C. You can follow the channel where Arn and I basically have our own 24-7 reality TV show going on, Jen. I don't know if you knew that, but we actually basically have a reality show from Chess.com's headquarters going all the time. Hey! Hey, Fabi! Hey, Fabi! <laughs> there you go, and you've got uh, Georg Mayer over there playing some strings on the guitar. Georg Mayer <laughs> up to write that hit song, Alone in My German Principles. Um, Alright. Okay, Fernandez so wait, is going to convert. Studio C? What? Because it's for chess? Yeah, Studio C. Well, it actually has its own inside meaning. I won't share. Um, that that's an inside joke for me and Arm. But it but Studio C stands for chess, so it worked out perfectly. But yes. All right. Very uh, good. Very good. Well, I like that. I like that wide shot. So, all right, guys. Uh, Fernandez actually has just won his game. I, that happened pretty fast as um, things turned around, and he was able to uh, to stop Kurtz from making even a half an upset. Yep. Meanwhile, we've got a bunch of games that just started. Yeah, I don't I mean, even know. I'm looking yeah, at the position. Big matchup. If this you see one, one, just shout it. Where, where do you want to go? Well, I think Ramon Edward and uh, Sam Sedion is, okay. is a huge battle for the Lions and the Okay, and the got it. Got it. Conovets versus Muggsy. Edward versus Sevion. Um Okay. The first thing that pops out to me about this game, Jen, is honestly the time on the clock. The fact that uh, Sam has gotten lower on the clock, suggests to me maybe he was slightly out-prepared because the fact that White also has the bishop pair, I don't know, I mean, but the more I look at it, knight d4 is coming for Sevion, right? That's going to be a really strong equalizing move, I think, because I think that's going to force simplification, and Black should be just fine as soon as he puts the pony on d4. And let's see, yeah. This is this must be their last this is their last game then, of course. Because we've got the two board one facing off. Yeah. Well no, but that's for the oh yeah, that's for the Archbishop's match versus the windmills you're saying. Yeah. Oh exactly. no no, but also for this one. Yes, I'm sorry, yes. It, it was a two game lead for it was a two game lead for the Sopranos heading to the last round of play. Those are the pairings, so you're right. Sevion versus Edward is board one on board one. Haria versus Lenderman, we'll check on that one right now. Roberson Road and Harvey Bartell. Harvey Bartell sounds like sounds like he's about to play the wolf character from Pulp Fiction. But um bum shh. <laughs> yes! Nailed it! Sorry, had to go. I have not made a pop cult pulp fiction reference in years. 
You are welcome, America. Um, all right. Where are we going, Jen? I gotta rewatch it. What? I gotta rewatch it. It's been too long. So good, right? The wolf. The wolf comes in to clean up. Anyway. Um, well, okay, so this is board one, Sevion versus Edward. As you said, uh, this is this is the last round between the Lions. So let's go to Lenderman versus Mesut GM. That's Ravi Haria. Lenderman with the black pieces. And we okay. see here seven, seven five uh, Sopranos. So yep. a big score required here for the Lions to yep. get those coveted 10 points or even five. Yeah, big score needed for the Lions to come back, even just to tie it up. But again, as you and I have highlighted, if we remind everybody about the format, you get 10 points for winning the match, so that's your reward. But every point matters throughout the match, and so it's more reason to fight, even if your team loses their opportunity to win that week. Every point may matter at the end of the season when we tally up all the standings at the Pro Chess League. Only a certain amount of teams make the playoffs, but the bottom teams get relegated, and they are not guaranteed a spot in next year's Pro Chess League. That's how the league works. So really, really something that keeps all of us excited throughout the whole year, Jen, right? Because then even if your team is playing badly, that last match could matter because it could prevent you from being relegated. So there's never, there's never a dull moment, never a reason for your fans to check out, even if it's not your best season. So uh, one of the things I like most. And I, I like that. I like, really like this hybrid of match points and game points because I think just doing one or the other is uh, has a lot of flaws. Right. So kind of mixing them in together seems like the optimal solution. Yep. And uh, all right, let's go to Spinal Tap's game versus Marcus Harvey. Uh, as we've said, this is the last round of play between the Lions and the Sopranos, and so we will watch this one here closely, at least until we have a clear winner. Bartel in a good position as white, Jen, I think. You agree, you agree, right? Got the bishop pair, currently threatening this h7 pawn. And, it was actually uh, good move because uh, queen c5 was just played. So if he wants to grab and go and play, he should take h7 check. But don't forget that A, we're not castled. B, the pawn on e5 has been hit. Yes. So is bishop takes h7 check, king h8 the best move, knowing that like g6 is also a threat? We right. probably have to retreat our bishop, and then you'd get to take on e5. Right. So I don't know. If well, it's, that... it's crazy, though, because you could go all-in blitz chess. You could take h7 takes and then play a move like h4, right? You give up the e5 pawn and then play h5, and you've gone you've gone full Hikaru. Never go full Hikaru, but you've but almost instead, gone full Hikaru. But instead, Queenie2 played. Yeah, Queenie2 Idea... is an indirect way to defend this pawn on e5, because if takes everybody, we have got discovered checks that win the queen. So, Okay. So Greg is trying to uh, to vote out um, what uh, what he should eat for dinner. Greg is trying uh, to that's... vote out. Greg, not everything's a vote, dude. No kidding. It's a crowdsourcing. <laughs> I just think that, that, that he gets crowdsourced sushi. Everybody say sushi, so he's forced to eat sushi for there once. There you go. Um, <laughs> so Queen E2 currently indirectly defending E5. I think Bartel still has a little edge. Yeah, but... I like this move, actually, because I feel like we don't want to give up E5. Let's no, go to the... Uh, the one game we haven't looked at yet so far in this last round play of Lions and Sopranos is Michael Rhodes' game versus Roberson. That is Squirrel Ols, Squirrel LOLs versus Boo 786. Um, huh. I like wow. this position. So um, equal material, nice, beautiful queen on D5. Yep. That, that certainly makes a good, strong first impression. But yep. that said, uh, I see some potential counterplay here coming for black as well. I like the idea of bishop d4 for for road. Just because once that bishop is no longer being threatened, there's bishop d4 and maybe threats of knight a5, which isn't even just about the greedy pawn grab on b7 if I can do it. But I wanted to get the c file. And on that note, okay, Roberson just played rook c8. That actually prevents my move, bishop d4, because then b5, and we have a, a pin emote here on the c file. So, um,. So, yeah, okay. I also think you always got to watch out for the idea of playing like rook b6, rook takes c1, rook takes c1, and queen e3. I love that. Um, I'm going to show yeah. that on the board because that's a. I think that's a real threat here. Takes everything, and then queen takes e3 is an exchange sack that immediately forks a whole lot of stuff. b6, c1, and the f2 square with check. That's a nice tactic, Jen. Well, you don't need forks for sushi, but rook to d1 was there played because... 
You're, we're you're, taking... you're, you're killing the puzzle rush and the puns today. I might as well just retire. She's got the whole thing by herself. What about we combine puns and puzzle rush? Puzzle rush. Yes, there you go. Yes, I, I need to. I need to get a, an edge with the the language because just the pure finding night forks, man. Not getting, get, not getting to fifty five. <laughs> not uh, finding rook a eight. <laughs> All right, so he played Rook D1, Michael Rowe did, to avoid, I think, the idea that Jen was highlighting. Jokes aside, I think that's actually a really nice tactic, Jen, and that's why. But Rook D1's a principal move by Mr. Rode anyway, because it gangs up against the weak D6 pawn. H5, you'd like to play H4 to say to say no-no, but if you play H4, black might look to sacrifice there, right? So you've got you got to be careful. I, one thing, oh, and h5, um, and one thing I don't like about black's position is, of course, that bishop on f8 is, is really dead as a doorknob right now, and right. I, I don't really see a lot of future for it. Well, let's go so check. Eight. I was going to say, now that we've done the full, we've gone through the full gambit here of Lions versus Sopranos round yeah. four matchup, let's go back to Sevillon's game, because I think he's, I think he's working a potential advantage here. I like the rook on b2 when I first look at it anyway, and here comes bishop c5. Yeah, I think that Sevillon playing well here against Edward in the board one matchup. Sevillon, Edward, yeah. I'm, I'm just pulling it back up as well. Yep. Yeah. Ooh. Indeed. Okay. Uh, King of two. That activity for black. I like G5 here for black. I wonder if Sevion mm -hmm. will like that as well. Um, okay, takes first. What's the idea of bringing the king to E3 that he likes? There must be something awkward. Or he's just going with the brute force method, Jen, which is that A4 is falling, and you don't have a pawn to get back. I think uh, he's just going for the A4 pawn. Yeah, after knight c5, sure. I did like your kind of ideas of g5 as well, trying to get our king into the game. You know what's so strong about this, though, Jen, is knight c5, not only are you threatening a4, black is also threatening rook b3, and after king f2, now you can play knight e4 check, hitting the g3 pawn. Right, right, because we've got two guys in the e4 square now. Hmm. g4 played. So g4 is played partly because of that, but I think Sevion, so it was a choice there Edward was dealing with, right? Guard a4 or allow rook b3, knight e4, but Sevion maybe goes for this idea anyway with knight e4. I'm, I just, it feels the game like Sevion is, is, is pulling here. Pulling for black. Uh-oh, bandage came off. We got problems. Does anybody guess uh -oh. what actually happened here? Blood oh. of the mouse! I mean, I already said it. Obviously, I battled my way through 20 ninjas <laughs> in a bullet chess game. G5. This is this is no. This is good for Sevion. Good game, and I like that he's highlighting activity and coordination of the knights and the potential threats against the white king gen over the idea of gobbling the a pawn. I think that the counterplay he's going to create against the white king by putting a knight on e4, even just from a practical point of view, is a lot harder for white to deal with. And uh, I expect Sevion to win this game, but the way he's playing right now. And how about this game between Fabiano and Ray Robson? Um, of course, I know you were probably purposely avoiding it at first because it it doesn't seem as exciting. Because it was boring. That's, you can just say it. Right. It was boring. Yeah. But anyway, go ahead. Roy Lopez Berlin events, uh, but uh, Fabi's going to go for a little something something. He's just played this move a five. Yeah. Um, look at how much time he spent on his clock, Danny. Um, Thirty seconds to raise nine. That's so. <laughs> That's pretty good, right? And it shows the difference in terms of it's it's so amazing when you think of someone like Ray Robson, who you and I both know is you know very very strong grandmaster, super talented young man from when he was young, and then you see the difference between a guy like him and Fabiano, at least in terms of how they're managing the clock right now. It's really impressive to see Caruana playing like this. Although, okay, so Ray plays h4. He's gonna he's gonna be all in over here with the attack on the king side. Yeah, I don't I don't know why this is. I, except for the clock, which obviously I like Fabi. I don't I don't know where... The advantages? Yeah, if anything, I feel like it, I'd have more fun playing black here, potentially, because I've got some pressure on the king side. And yep. I guess you're, you're going to have to try to harass my pawns. Maybe you're trying to play, like, for rook, takes and rook a7? Yeah, I think that the issue yeah. is do I how do I deal with the h1? Because if I take it and play rook a7, I mean, it there's enough fire like pro over here. Example. 
Yeah, it does. Doesn't it feel like there should be ample counterplay for Black there? With yeah, like, like, like I'm even just wanting to just play H3 straight up in a position yeah. like that, because if takes Rook F3, and now I've got a huge potential at a mating attack, so... And this, and this is what this is what Poppy's doing. Ah, so he, I like he did not this. play Rook yeah, A7. Yeah, Rook A4. Nice. Very nice defensive Swinging move. back. Because he's just looking to now play Queen G4 and snatch off the H-pawn. I... Yep. I instinctively was thinking he was going for the B-pawn, but actually different intentions altogether. Rook F4 pretty quickly played by Ray because he saw that, of course, Queen G4 would be too strong. Right. Queen G4 and Rook G4 were being threatened, and Rook F4... So defend. after Rook F4... Okay, I think he's taken with the Queen, and, and Fabiano still has something to prove if he wants to play for a win here. I mean, in a match from a match perspective, I think the Bishops are in good shape. Okay, I think, of course they are. They're up four games, and even a draw in a single game clinches the match right now for the Bishop. So that's a that's a comfortable thing if you're Fabiano. Um, well, my... Yeah, he's just played Rook A1. Now, with, with, see, the thing is, with the material getting more and more reduced, if, for some, if, if somehow Fabi can finagle a queen trade, you can start to see the potential danger here for Black yep. with the Rook becoming so active on the A file. Well, let's let's stay with the match that's about to end, I think, or at least before the others. We still don't have a a, a, a result of any kind in this last round of play between the Lions and the Sopranos, everybody. Obviously, you can see from the scoreboard that the Sopranos took the two-game lead into the last round. But, okay, Sevillon, I think, is about to clinch this one for Montclair, uh, Jen. Mm -hmm. he's, he's in a really good, really good spot here with Black. He's up a pawn. Actually, now he's up two pawns in this in this Rook and Knight endgame. And what just happened? Wow, Wesley So, we didn't even give this game enough attention, Jen, but we have our first match result of the day. Wesley So wins very quickly against Ilya Nizhnik here. Um, well, that's a surprise. I'm going to leave the live position on the Sevion edward game, but let's back up the analysis board and just take a quick look at how Wesley So made quick work over Nizhnik. We had a Kings Indian... Uh, we had a trade on D8, so an, uh, an end game full of preparation, I think, from Wesley. Um, he takes the E5 pawn. This is kind of a typical thing. If those of you thinking Nizhnik just blundered a pawn, this is kind of a typical idea. Black loses this pawn, but has not only immediate compensation on the E file to win the pawn back, but the dark squares belonging to Black because of White having traded that bishop. Usually means Black's okay, and I, so I think Nizhnik probably was okay. Let's see, he eventually does win his pawn back, but where did it go wrong? Okay, c5 takes e1. It looks like Wesley got this rook to d8, Jen, and Nizhnik could just never complete development. Yeah. Yeah, that's... that hurts. In fact, the game ends super quickly. Look at this move, bishop e6, pointing Oof. out the pin on c8 with the rook on a8. And after b5, rook e8, Nizhnik just resigns. He's just losing a piece because the knight has to move, and if it does, the bishop falls. How how do grandmasters make chess look so easy? Sometimes I feel I like this, one thing oh. to say about Wesley that I think is very similar to Magnus, and we'll see if he eventually finds himself, like Fabiano, an American maybe challenging for the world title, Jen, but I do believe that when Wesley wins games, it has this like feel like chess should just be that easy, like when Magnus wins games. Like, well, that just seemed easy. Right? And he's yeah, winning against the GM. I think Wesley has that characteristic about his game sometimes. And I don't know if that's just a stylistic thing or preparation, but when Wesley wins, he makes it look easy sometimes. Yeah, and I remember an article the year that Wesley had a phenomenal year, 2016. Uh, Gre Serper, Grandmaster yeah. Serper for chess.com, wrote an article arguing that very point about how you could look at Wesley's games instead of looking at some of the classics because he really yeah. would. Sh beautiful positional constructions but still look at the classics because it's not about chess not only about getting better at chess it's also about history right uh, but yeah also watch wesley's game <laughs> well look at this uh Sevillon is is kind of on the grind here um he probably could have played king f4 last move he decided not to but i think that Sevillon is going to win this one as black over edward and that's going to really help the sopranos achieve their mission of clinching um Okay, if you see any other games, Jen, go ahead and go ahead and shout out. Uh, what about Wonderful Times game versus one random? Of course, that is uh, Tuan Min Lee taking on Aaron Jacobson. Somebody's about to lose on time. 
Yeah, we got a lot of interesting games going on. We got a game, wonderful time. One random is down to four seconds. That's Aaron Jacobson for yep. the Marshalls. Yep, I'm on that As board right now. That that board looks like. Uh... By the way, this is the only close match of the day. By the way, so we're definitely keeping our eye on um, all the other matches. Yep. Seem you know, Sopranos looking really hot. Archbishop's already won. Yep. And of course, the chess bra is also looking totally dominant. And we'll we'll be but, able to get to the chess bras too because they were the last match of the day to start. So for those of you wondering why haven't you covered more of those games, we will get to them. But um, right now, this is a huge game, as Jen said, for the pawn grabbers because if Min Lee can win, he will knot things up at five games apiece. And looks like he should. Okay, a five was good. I think knight d seven was also good. But yeah. okay, here Look comes at that the a pawn. When the apron rushes, how you like them apples, Ooh, right? That's a, another trap of the rook. Beautiful. Beautiful. And a seven is going to end there. Uh, and we have a for apples on a eight, right? How you like them apples? Ooh. Nobody, nobody heard the reference. I got to say it again. How you like them apples, Aaron? How you <laughs> like them it. apples? Yeah, exactly. Anyway. And um, uh, we've got another great game that's going to get quite exciting in this match, though, as uh we've got Miranda Grandmaster against Grandmaster Wander the Young. Yep. Uh in in still what looks like a very tense position. That uh, is, uh Red Nova Real. taking on GM Miranda. Um Yeah, Miranda looks a little better here though. Yeah, I agree. I agree, yeah. but I'm just looking at their time and it feels like somehow this is going to end up being some kind of scramble as well. Yeah. If the position remains close to equal and both sides get under mutual time pressure, could be crazy. Yeah, we're only dealing with like five minutes left on the clock here. As, let's see, we have a happy pawn. That's Jennifer Yu. Her game in this round was already drawn. Yeah, she and drew her game quickly against Real Boy. Um, yeah. We still don't have a result in any of the... Lion Sopranos games. Um, let's take a quick look at the game on board two, which is Lenderman versus Ravi Haria. Because here looks like Lenderman is in trouble. That d7 pawn is, I think, harder to get than c2, but maybe I'm wrong. Maybe we just get a big trade. Yeah, it looks like pawn for pawn, eye for an eye here, d7 for c2, and and we're getting closer to a draw. Indeed, and then there's also that game we 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 glanced at earlier between Romano Eduard and Sam Sevian. Massive edge on the clock for Eduard, but uh, very little material left on the board. Um, yeah, and although, here we see Sevian about to win with this check and see. Yeah, that's and, uh, Bob's your uncle. Check. Yep, that's the end. It doesn't matter how much time you have on the yep. clock if. Sevian's that, getting an extra queen. He's gonna win. <laughs> with that win, the Sopranos move to eight to five, meaning they are a half a point away from clinching the match overall. Nice um, win by Sam Sevian against the Lions' top dog. Yep. Well, it's weird to call a lion a top dog, right? But top there you lion. Go. The uh, I guess you could call him Simba. <laughs> I was just at Disney. I just took <laughs> my little son to Disney, so <laughs> we're on the same page, Daddy. <laughs> Sorry, I have to try not to go down the line to make my producer smile because I just—I'm like a kid. That's all I look for is awkward jokes. Um, anyway, um, but yeah, big dogs playing for the Lions, and uh, unfortunately, they weren't able to get it done. Sevion wins for the Sopranos. They're about to clinch the match. We're still watching the Lenderman game here on the live board and now on the analysis board. But uh, mm -hmm. what are the other games? You got. Spinal Tap I got a game. Soprano. I got somebody who's trying to clinch the deal with the, for the Sopranos. Uh, Grandmaster Michael Road. I actually up up two exchanges against yeah. Peter Robertson. And uh, let's yeah, look at, let's look at that. We've got squirrels, uh, squirrel, lol, squirrels um, versus Road. But Road, despite the open king, has just got a lot of extra material. Yes, that's yeah. right, and he's on Team Dad, so he'll like all your dad jokes. Yeah, exactly. On Danny Road is of course in the chat. Shout out to Danny. Shout out to all the all the Twitch and Chess.com TV chat. We've been watching you guys, so got uh, lots of premium members in the Chess TV chat. Thank you so much, all of our subscribers and the Twitch channel. Thank you for being here, and thank you for your support. I'm not going to name all of our subscribers individually right now. I'm just going to thank all of you. Okay, so that's it. All right, look at that. We have a draw in the game between Lenderman and uh, more, uh, Grandmaster, or no, sorry, International Master, 
Ravi Haria. Fide Master, right? Got it wrong. All anyway, the point is the Sopranos have officially won the match against the Lions, even though we have a couple more games remaining. Congratulations to the Montclair Sopranos. Big match for them, and they haven't even used Ho Yi Fan yet. Let's go to Fabi's game with uh, Ray, because... Even though yeah. Ray is uh, down on the clock, I don't think he's going to lose this one. Again, from a match point of view, this is not the worst thing in the world for Fabi to get three and a half out of four today, right? Um, and uh, Wesley Wesley led the way for the Bishops today with a 4-0 score, already having beat Ilya Nizhnik, if you're just joining us um, in the last round. But I think this one's going to end up in a draw here between Caruana and Robson. Indeed, yeah, and then I agree with that, and that's so some, you know, some uh, con some consolation for the windmills, although they are, certainly did get crushed today. Yep. Uh, but let's take a look at the Miranda Leon game because the the pawn grubbers are now down by a full point, and Wander Leon is fighting fighting for his team's life here as he sticks a rook on d6 to defend d7. We got only yeah, a minute and a half left on the clock. That's awkward to see a rook on d6 there, right? Yeah, this move or case. It just it looks like a lot of fun for White with both of those knights on e5 and c5. Yep. Um, I, I'm I'm looking at an idea like g4, trying to just rest control over the b7 square, right? Like try to expand with g4 and h h4 so that you can't defend d7 anymore. Yeah, I agree. Uh, Miranda seems to have. Numerous oh. ways he could he could push the position, and Black is just really struggling to find any useful moves. You hate when your moves that you're finding, Jen, are things like Rook A8 and Rook D6 to have to guard pawns, right? Just a bad Unless sign. Unless it's Eljana of Hansen. That's then, true. Then, then, Unless Rook, rook A8 is a brilliant Rook trap in the middle of the new <laughs> coming your way puzzle hush. Coming your, <laughs> pu coming your way in, in 2020. Puzzle hush by Jen Shahadi. Um <laughs> Yeah, but other than that, rook a8 is not normally a pleasant move. Um, and uh, here, the, here the b pawn is running. Yeah, but Wander's trying his best. He knows that it's a time scramble, so anything can happen in these time scrambles. Ah, uh, uh, knight a6. Uh, yikes. I think, it's, I think it's just over now. I think there's probably knight numerous a ways white wins, but... Okay, he takes and takes a5, also clean, but knight a6 yeah. will be good there. Okay, this is this is too easy now because Rook A8 and Knight E6 are all on the menu. So that's going to put it to be a seven. That's going to put us at a seven to five score in favor of the Marshals. So where's the other game this round between um, Marshals and? Okay, there's. Um, by the way, again, to remind everybody, if you want to go to the Chess.com live server, uh, our mods can help you. And Twitch chat, if you're just getting here, just go to Chess.com/live. Use the instant command. Slash follow p hashtag PCL and I'm saying that because I'm looking at this position right now and there's like 12 games and they're all under time pressure and we can't we can't follow all of them. Um, so if you want to follow them yourself, just go to the chess.com server. All right, but with that, it looks like the marshals are in control of this match. Name a game and we will go there, Jen. If you see one before I choose one. Um, go ahead and choose. I, 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 I'm sorry, I just got tiny bit of. I missed your last couple of words, but okay. I think, I think we're all good again. I'm well, just, let's uh, just highlight real quick on the analysis board that the game here between the diagram you're seeing was the rook ending here between uh, Fabiano and Ray Robson, which was a draw. So uh, Wesley So gets the better of the two-headed monster known as Carwana So today. He goes four and zero. Fabiano goes three and a half out of four. Um, Very nice. And Greg Shahadi corrects your math as. He points out that seven out of seven five. Um, it means it's the last game of this round between the pawn grubbers there and the marshal. There you go. Which is, makes sense as to why I've been sitting here looking for another game that was didn't exist. So thank you, Greg. Um, <laughs> all right. Uh, let's go to last seven samurai's game. We haven't looked at him for a while, but this is a GM on GM action here between Ali Morandi and Cordova. Even though the bishops have clinched this match. Maybe an interesting endgame. Maybe not. Looks like Mirandi is better as black. Yeah. Uh, he's got that really nice knight on d3, and the king is is coming into b4 very quickly. And knight e5 also looks like a really strong choice. You're capturing g4, and you're threatening knight to f3. Hey, this just looks winning for black, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. Should be 
pretty straightforward, actually. Nice right. one. Let's go back and... to, to Rhodes' game. That that game looks crazy. Ah, yes, because that would, that would be the... Well, the Sopranos have already clinched, but... But it would be still a good win for the Lions. Uh, they lost a close match in the first week of the season, and uh, if they can keep things close, even losing matches again points add up and uh could be very very important for them down the stretch so well i don't think they're winning this no i, I, mean, I don't Rhodes... think so but i was wondering if they could, if he can swindle road under time pressure that's what i'm looking at here is that white right, has gotcha. no clear win white has no clear plan to win and that king is just super open over here on h3 gotcha yes yeah, so you got to be careful about like you know, tricky moves like trying to play queen f6 and then finding queen h1, queen g2, and right. takes an f6, right? So that's the kind of stuff that you're you're fantasizing about yep. for the line. Yep. Yeah. And just to show a line like that, yeah, if white plays a move like this, as Jim was saying, all kinds of crazy stuff where actually could be lots of crazy things here. All right, let's stay with the live position as it's in a crazy time scramble. Black is just picking off pawns with check. And again, this is a really hard... This is It's almost harder to be white here, right? Forget about the fact that you have two rooks. The open king, the queen's on the board. This is a much harder position to be white than it is to be black. And Meanwhile, the battle of the Sergeys, uh, Azarov uh, won against Ehrenberg a while ago. Yeah, he uh, won very... We didn't get a chance to look at that game, unfortunately, but er Azarov performing very well and and he beat Ehrenberg a big reason maybe why the marshals have that seven to five lead heading into the last round oh. I was just looking at the position of uh, Alexander Katz versus Eric Kurtz and it just looks uh like all of Alexander's pieces are just right right in the heart of Eric's position here of course this is a big rating favorite here with crypto chess at uh, over 2400 but still a uh, nice position well, let's keep the live board on this road Roberson game as crazy as happens with eight seconds. But to show the game, Jim was just talking about on the analysis board, Cats versus Kurtz, Cave, Cave, Cats versus Kurtz. I, clearly, there's a pun waiting there at the tip of my tongue, and I can't find it yet. But let okay, we got Cats versus Kurtz. Um, White's position looks fantastic. You're down <laughs> the exchange, but you would much rather have these brilliant knights. And the uh, and the darks for bishop. This, uh, where's the move here for black? By the way, if you're following that live game, Roberson has just completely turned that one around. A heartbreaking oh, finish. Boy. Heartbreaking finish for Michael Rode. Obviously, he'll take consolation in the fact that his team won pretty convincingly today. But uh, what a what a turnaround by Roberson to win that game as black. Yeah, I see where it happened. This rookie two allowing the queen takes e2, queen takes e2, knight f4 tactic. Yeah, I'm going to show that on the analysis board right here. Another another, so, another puzzle rush. Uh, another fine. puzzle rush. Rookie two blocking by road allows the trade and the fork and the simplification. Kills the uh, kills kills the road, kills the cats. I don't know. It's, it's, again, escapes me. But there you go. So the Lions make this one look a little bit better on paper. The last game in that matchup is here between Thomas Bartell and Marcus Harvey. Harvey also about to win against Bartell. So this this the final score of this match is going to be a one point difference ultimately, helping the Sopranos get the get the victory. Jen, so again, you got to tip your hat to the Lions, right? I mean, they fought hard. The last two games going to them is going to make the final score eight and a half, seven and a half, which is is really really a very very close match. That's right. Although you gotta figure that maybe like uh, there'd be like some kind of perpetual on the road game if the match was that close. But you know, hard to speculate about that stuff. But yes, the score uh, will end up being extremely tight in the end. Yep. And uh, no, you're right. I, no, I'm definitely not taking away that the Sopranos won the match. Just saying that from uh, again from the league format perspective, talking about the need to get every game. I mean, you gotta feel much better if you're the Lions, only losing by one point. Um, now, here's a wild game for you, yep. um, Danny. Eric Hansen playing black. Okay. And there. Yes. Uh, I have no idea what's going on. Whoa. I just opened up the position. <laughs> yeah, look at this. Look at this. Takes on G. Okay. Let me go back to move 18, where it really first started to get wild. After knight h4 by white, Hansen takes, 
and plays just the simple queen e7, completely ignoring anything and everything on the queen side. Just all in over here for a checkmate attack. And uh, look at this move, f4, queen takes h4, g3. Looks like Hansen is just about to win in, in uh, crushing victory. He's about to move to 3-0, which is even more impressive than his first 3-0 from week one, because he already beat Elyanov in round two, so... I think oh, I, nice game. something says, you know, that the chess bras are going to have a special year to me, given the uh, the work they've done here to, to build up for their their lineup. So they're about to they're about to clinch the match, Jen, with a win here by Hanson. That'll be eight points. And uh, OK, I guess that that'll be what the score is, though, because it looks like, as you said, Katz is going to beat Kurtz. But okay, what about Van Kampen's game versus Yeah, Van Kampen Aljanov looks pretty interesting. The yeah, move let's, H3 let's stick play. right here. Yeah, uh, H3 play, that knight on F5 looks juicy. But those pawns do too, so who's better here? Well, I think if, if you could just push the E pawn and D pawn and get your bishop to the H8, A1 diagonal, that's, that's the... Uh, that's the money right there, but I guess right now there's a threat of knight g3 check as well with the discovery, so Van Kampen has to be very careful. Um, he plays king, play king g2. He that, like that looks like a smart move. Are there any... There's no tactics here, right? I mean... Yeah, it's weird that... We have no time to try to take the knight away because there's rook takes f8 check, and it looks like all the, the, the key squares are covered. Yeah, with this I was just highlighting that, that all these checks for the black queen are completely covered um, for those uh, following the highlights there white uh, white has it all covered and so Elyanov is struggling to find some way to take advantage of this king here which means we're back to the E and D pawn pushing and then here we go and the then uh, it's, all, it's all chess bras yeah <laughs> it's the, the D and the E chess bras here it looks it looks like a beautiful position for white I really like this this quiet move, King G2. Yeah. Well, okay, if Van Kampen also pulls the upset, given that, again, describing the upset as a win over Elyanov. Um, wow. So that would be, uh, again, uh, could we could be looking at a 9-3 to three score there heading in the last round. Hansen has indeed put away the game um, against uh, Chunky Wong. Though Katz won, Saric also won on board one for the chess bras over Dan Fernandez. So that's why we stand at the 8-3 score. And I think if Van Kampen wins, um, the, match is, the match is over. So we've got a big ask here for the, the Pittsburgh uh, Pawn Grubbers. They need to go 3-1 in order to grab some match points here, Danny. Yeah. Um, can they do it? Uh, the two players playing white, um, Ale Alwander Leung, and uh yeah let's let's go Rondo. back to this one because this is the, Aaron Berg, the sorry, last Aaron close Berg. one Aaron Berg and Leong uh, they're they're certainly going to be trying that's, to win that's with where White. they need yeah that's where they need to get their points Leong and Aaron Berg that's why they have them on the team they need them to both win here in the last round for for Pittsburgh to make it close and I I mean I have to say I like both positions for White so I'm kind of excited about the potential of this math getting close now yep. don't forget that there's you know, getting one and a half out of four, um, you know, having to get, I mean, sorry, having to get uh, three points is tough because it means that you either need to win both your white games, draw yep. two black games, or get one, a victory in one of those. So I, I'm just really excited to watch this match play out, and I hope it's close. We also have the uh, board four matchup between Aaron Jacobson and Jennifer Yu. Unfortunately, Jennifer made the questionable decision to play the French, but we won't hold that against her. Um, <laughs> yeah, I know. I'm like, I like this position for white. And it's I just know. The you already like white, right? Um, but okay. So let's look at Azarov's game here against Liang. So, excuse me, Liang Azarov, given that a wonder is white. This one could get wild really fast. What white wants to do quickly, if you can, is coordinate a punch of e5. Something like rook a to d1, bishop to b1 to put the queen and bishop on this mutual... Mutually beneficial diagonal there, and then play e5. Um, and, I, and I think all of those things are, are quite possible, actually. It's hard for Azarov to, to do something against White's big center here. 
Um, because if you ever try to challenge the center with d5 gen, white's going to play e5. Um, actually, the more I look at this, the more I just love Li Yang's position, because it seems like I just highlighted like that plan you teach beginners of, here's how chess can be really easy. You put your rooks in the center with big pawns, yes. and then you put your bishop behind your queen on a diagonal, and you get checkmate, kids. But again, like, how does black stop that here? I, in I, fact, I, oh, Liang just plays e5 right away, which of course is also good, because this seems like just like a very straightforward plan for white to put the bishop and queen on this diagonal here. Well, I gotta love it, um, because it, he's making this match close. It, yep. Liang's opening looks very fun. Um, and, you know, Jennifer playing the friend, even though it's not my favorite opening, I, what I like about it is it's a rich position where you really can play for a win with black. Yeah. So, Kenny, anything can still happen in this pawn grubbers Marshalls match, and that's the only match we can still say that about. I agree. I agree. And uh, All the other matches are, are effectively over. I mean, yep. the, with the chess brows already getting the eight points. They haven't officially clinched, but Van Kampen looks like he's rolling up the board. If you look at the analysis board, yeah. he's got lots of pawns, and he knows how to use them. And he's now he's going to get active on the diagonal. So I think Van Kampen helps El Yanov's day get, go from bad to worse. Um, and uh, so, yeah, I'm with you. We're going to stick We're gonna stick right here. Let's look at Ehrenberg's game then. If, if we like Li Yang's chances, how do we like Ehrenberg against Miranda? Well, just a typical Sicilian type position yep. with uh, the move H5 inserted, which uh, kind of uh, begs the question, where is Black's king going to go? Right. And this is sort of typical, though, for Black to play this kind of flexible flexible, uh, what do we call it, a Sheveningen, I guess. I mean, it's a, a Sicilian where black has less space, so I think when when uh, amateur players first look and don't know the line, feels like, well, black just has a bunch of bad pieces. But there's a lot of squares guarded that are critically keeping white's pieces back, and it's not clear how white should approach approach the position. The idea of the H-pawn is, is, in fact, exactly what you're about to see. 95 wants to clear the diagonal for a, a piece like the bishop on d7, and then black's going to play h4 and h3 if he can, and just try to start undermining things um, in this in this position here with the bishop on the h1 a8 diagonal. So I, don't know, I guess I'm, a, I'm, I, I'm okay with playing these positions as black because I have experience, but I think objectively for sure you're right. White is, white is definitely a little bit better, and it is precisely because what you said, the king on e8 doesn't have a long-term home. And it looks even worse for black than it is, as Danny was pointing out. The reason it looks worse than it is is because white's development is so beautiful, but it's hard. We don't we don't really have a way to open up the position. If we could open up the position, we would just win because our king is safer and our pieces are so great. But we can't really play for f5 that easily because then we gift black the knight e5 square, and we can't play for e5 that easily either because you really have a a grip de a death hold yep. on e5. Should be so, noted that Van Kampen has just won for the chess bras, so they are moving to a score of 9-3, to three, meaning they have yet again clinched their match before the last round of play. So the chess bras come into play here in the 2019 season of the Pro Chess League. Uh, they uh, Will they win by a big enough score to overtake St. Louis today? I think they might, Jen, because 11-5 to five means they need to win... They need to get at least two points in the next round to maintain pace in the standings with the Bishops, given that they won 11-5. to But they might get more than that. They might overtake St. Louis for the lead in the Atlantic before the day's over. I I think this is that'll be an interesting contest to watch. Will, will it be the Bras or the Bishops that get the most points today and who will be the, the leader? Yeah, um, we're, we're, we got to circle the date. I, give, I need to find out on the schedule. Greg, maybe you can let us know in the chat. Hate to give you something to do, Kamish, but when do the chess bras and the archbishops play? Because that's that would be uh, everyone needs to circle their calendar for when that head head to head matchup happens. Wait, what just happened in the uh, uh, Ehrenberg game? It looks like he just snatched a pawn off on b6. I didn't think that that was going to be allowed. Uh, that was that, that that was just a straight sack. I don't so get it. Maybe just blood so the pawn. Just straight. I up. doubt. Maybe he just. Queen d4 was played, threatening b6, and black just castled. Well, but I, after queen d4 is an awkward enough move that maybe you're not familiar with the tactic. But actually, if you look at the, if you go back to that position after queen d4, Jen, how does black even guard b6? Because if you move yeah, okay, the rook, maybe, that's what it is. maybe it's just because you yeah. can't use a rook because then a6 hangs. Yep. 
But this is just good for, uh, it's very good for Sergei then. Yeah. So there, there you have it. You called it, Jen. So if Ehrenberg gets a win here, that was the recipe for the for the pawn grabbers today, is they needed their top boards to put to get them in a position. And so Ehrenberg getting a win. Ooh, look at Liang's game. Look at this move, Ooh, E6. Yes. Oh baby. Yeah. That looks like some good We we could have a rival for Mirandi's game of the game of the day here because this is looking crazy. Knight of four I was gonna say, why is Liang not just winning a piece straight up? I think I think Azarov blundered this movie six. I don't know what, but after Bishop B one, G six and E six. Again, chess looks simple, Jen, when we go back to that position of move twenty where we were highlighting how clear Liang's plan was. Put the bishop on the diagonal and play e5, and that's all he did. He busted open the position, and Liang is just completely crushing in this game. He's just, oh my. just, just up a piece. And so, so Danny, if, if Ehrenberg and Liang do go on to win their games, we're talking yep. about 7-7 seven, seven, uh, between the marshals and the pawn grubbers, and that leaves us with two games. That leaves us with... Uh, uh, that leaves yep. us with Jen for you. Well, let's Against go look at the Aaron other Jason. ones then. Yeah, well, let's first look at... And Real Boy versus Wonderful Time. Yeah, let's look at Min Lee's game versus Kamrakulov Jurabek. Um, let's try to say that five times fast. Kamrakulov Jurabek. Kamrakulov no, Jurabek. There you go. We did it. Did it. <laughs> and, Together, uh, we, we achieved five times. Super Saiyan status. Um, but, but the thing is, okay, so... White looks good here because that... I'm, I see that the material is equal, and yep. the knight on g5 just looks like such a beast here. Yep. Uh, I can't help but really prefer white here, and that means that, and, and I have the same ideas as a Wander Leong hat executed of getting e6 in. So, yep. I agree. Uh, Kam Kamara Kulab would save the day for the marshals if he were able to win this game, and then it would okay. all come down. Game. Well, it saves the day, but then it comes down to Jennifer Yu's game, right? It saves the day to keep it close, but still not necessarily a clinched match. Um, and but, even this game, I mean, I love white, but I don't think black is toast yet. I'm sure yeah. there's some way to defend if, if we play rook d6. The thing is, we can always consider playing queen g4, the bailout move, right? And because you're we're talking about in, uh, Min, in Min Lee's game. Yes. Yeah. yeah, so you might have a bailout with queen g4. Yeah, I guess queen g4 is a good point, because if you can get the ladies off the board, you might have... Decent drawing chances, although, again, we've said this a few times today. Here, white has the pawn and the compensation. It's just up a pawn here is white and better. So, okay, but let's say Jurabek is definitely favored there. That means it puts us at a potential 8-7 score, and a happy pawn, Jennifer Yu, would need to win here in the French in order to keep keep the pawn grabbers in position to tie the match. She does have a decent position here, though. I agree. As much as it pains me to suggest that the French was a good choice... Maybe you're right, Jen, that from a dynamic point of view, um, both sides have winning chances here. Black can even play h4 in this position, Jen, after knight f4, and consider sacrificing the exchange and castling long. Something like this, you go to sack town, and if you can get castled and maybe get the rook to the g-file, you've got outside ideas that this bishop kind of creeps it way, its way into the light squares. I mean, okay, there's there's some interesting tactics to keep your eye on here so jennifer you so all these games though i mean we've mentioned that like ehrenberg looks good but he hasn't won the game yet he's up upon good position um a wander liang who's the closest to actually winning in the game a wander right because Li liang is liang is just up a, up a piece and i and but honestly ehrenberg's game if we go back there is just also just super clean i mean he's up a pawn and Again, also in a better position. Um, so I think those top two boards are going to get it done. Again, uh, Kamrakulov Jurabek is also in a good spot. So I think it's really going to come down to whether Jennifer Yu can get a win here with the black pieces. And I, I like her chances. It pains me to say that in a French, but I really do. I like her chances here to play Rook D to G8 and to punch the H pawn through and get an attack. Also, also, black has f6 in a lot of these French positions to try to undermine the lead e-pawn here, everybody. And because if, if this, just to use your imagination, let's say if this trade happens, the next trade that comes is probably on e5, and black is sort of slowly opening the position here to get counterplay against the white's king. So, so okay. 
Yeah, I hear you. This is going to be one. Strap ourselves in because yep. this could really determine the the pond grubbers versus the marshals. The one super tight match of the day. Night H four played. You're expecting Rook to G eight. Yeah, Rook D to G eight, and indeed she plays it, playing. and she's playing quickly. This is key, right? Yep, she's ahead two minutes on her opponent. Yep. Queen H four is the threat. He's going to have to move his king. Queen takes H four, wins a piece because of the pin emote on G three. There's also a threat of rook g4, even if you stop the threat, right? King h1, rook g4, and black is renewing an idea of perhaps sacrificing the exchange on h4, which... Uh... And, that, and that did happen, by the way. King h1 did happen, and okay. Jen back on move. Yeah, I, w I would expect rook g4 to be played relatively quickly, unless I'm missing some kind of tactic. Um, rook g4 looks interesting. Yeah, rookie four. Yeah, I just I, don't know that there's there's any other way to keep threats going here. So, this just looks like the way to actually kind of can increase the yeah. pressure in the position. Sure. All right, well, let's go back to uh, wonderful times game. That's uh, international master Min Lee taking on Kamrakulov Jurabek. Oh, he's just played the move queen c4 check. But he I'm also but black that. moved his f pawn despite Ben Feingold's advice. Black <laughs> moved the f pawn, and uh, this could be a problem. Yes. So queen c4 where does check. that king go? King g7. And then what's our follow up? Is why we can just take on f6, and that looks really good. So I guess we have to play king h8. Yeah, but if you play if you play King H eight, there's Knight F seven check. Yeah, well, I mean, there's Knight F seven, Knight D six coming. Yeah. Okay, so he so, has to so he F6. has to go King G seven. But as you said, taking F six with check seems pretty tough to deal with because you follow that up with a move like Knight E six check, just winning the exchange straight up. So yeah, I mean, I think Jurabek is about to. Okay. He's about, he's about to be better here. I think right now he can pick between his favorite flavor. A good uh, good position here for White. So it, I, I think it's all going to come down to whether Jennifer Yu can hold the match tie for the pawn grabbers by getting a victory as black in this French game versus Aaron Jacobson. And she did play Rook G4, as you recommended. Queen yep. to F3 played. Both players with about seven minutes on their clock. Yep. And yes, I mean, we're, we're looking at this from Jennifer's point of view because, you know, we like the drama and the tension of potentially tying up the match. But let's try to look at it from White's point of view. What is your active plan here for White? Is there a way for us I, to... I actually of... really like Queen F3 by Jacobson. There's yeah. threats on both F5 and D5, right? Uh, you have to start to look at, okay, if Black plays some sort of random move here, everybody, there's ideas of Knight takes F5 followed by Knight takes D5. Now the queen is spying the a8 square. Okay, super double-edged to ever go for tactics like this because you're immediately opening up diagonal problems, right? And you've got a lot of them. But these are these are things we have to be aware of. In fact, maybe Jennifer, just from a prophylactic point of view, makes the disciplined move, puts the king on b8, right? To um, I think it's just a slightly safer square for the king and avoids avoids some of the potential issues of this queen spying the a8 square. And yeah, she did play King B8, as you mentioned, and... Huh. And the last round of play officially underway here for the Chess Bras versus the Miami Champions. Eric Hansen right, got, versus... Yeah, we got some more games starting, I noticed. Yep. Uh, uh, unfortunately for the Champions, they have already lost the match, yep. but still plenty of game points to pick up, and each game point, as you point out, Danny, is so important. So you never want to get discouraged. But yeah, I got to keep my eyes on this uh, this pawn grubber match because it's always exciting in the Pro Chess League to get a match that's really close, right? We were so yep. blessed in the finals to get so many of them, Danny. But it's in this in, in our, this particular day there were a lot of blowouts. Yep, a lot of blowouts, a lot of exciting games though, right? A lot of a lot of oh, yeah. games that impressed us. So we get. Get one for the other, I guess. Not as close finishes, but uh, but we may get we may get what we asked for here, right? This exactly this could be a that... close finish. So, 
That's but, my idea of like a of a beautiful day of chess commentary. A lot yeah. of slashing wins and creative uh, ideas, and then also at least one tight match, and that's yeah. what we're getting here with the pawn grubbers versus Marshall. Let's keep Marshall. the live position here on Jacobson versus you, and I'll bounce around the analysis board a little bit to uh, check Jack in on some of these other games. In fact, Jacobson versus you. So what what happened is the rook seemed to have retreated back to G8. Yeah. After. I Queen e3, uh, Jen decided to bring her rook back to g8. Yeah, I'm not sure what the plan here is for black. I mean, I, the one thing I will say is that... Okay, that could be about to change. She has been up on time throughout the whole game, and if she can maintain that feature and get the game into, into mutual time pressure, she's got good chances there, I think, because at this point, there's not a clear plan for white. Although a3 is preparing by Jacobson to make a move like b4, and try to force things open here to try to uh, try to make some magic happen on the A file, and then all of a sudden we might be talking about a, an attack for White. So the more I look at this one, the more I'm thinking that if Jennifer couldn't make something happen with the breakthroughs we highlighted, Jen, we were highlighting exchange sacrifices on H4. We were highlighting moves like F6. She hasn't gotten those things, and now White is preparing to open up the queen side, right? So you start to feel. You start to feel better for the marshal's chances here. Yeah, I see what you're saying. And speaking of feeling better about chances, I mean, I don't even think it's all that clear how he wander is going to win. Uh, he's down five minutes on the clock, uh, and it's seven pawns to five pawns, so there's already some compensation in material-wise. And yep. it's just not that easy to get a pawn going, and obviously... The, the goal here is to start picking up some pawns for white, but I just don't see it being that easy. Yeah, we're showing that, that uh, game on the analysis board here. White is up a piece, but as Jim was highlighting, uh, black's got several pawns. you got a pass C pawn. The knight is currently very well positioned right here in the center. I think a wonder has to think about whether he can get A4 in and try to create some avenues for this rook to get into the game. Um... And well, I'm assuming in a classical time control, this should be winning for white. I'm just saying, like, three minutes to seven minutes, I, it's not in the books, Danny. Right. Definitely not Completely in the books agreed. Yet. All right, so and knight to b3 comes here by Azarov, going to force rook a2. All right, well, one good piece of news, if you if you are a Pittsburgh Pawn Grabbers fan, if you look at the board on the, ana the analysis board here, this is Aaron Burke's position against Miranda. This seems to be getting cleaner and cleaner. White is still up a healthy pawn, but also just much better. Isolated weaknesses on, on d5. And uh, so, Ehrenberg seems to be in good shape. Liang is still up a piece, so you have a hard time imagining him losing. But honestly, the more we look at the time pressure here, Jen, like you said, this is this is not so easy. And oh, moving the analysis board once again to uh, Jurabek's game with Min Lee... Oh, wait. Uh, did Jurovic just blunder this move queen f1? Wait, where, 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 where? What? Oh. I'm looking at a position where the queen is on f1 attacking both e2 and g2 checkmate. Oh my gosh. What? Yeah, let's, let's, let's take, let's take the action over here. Okay. Oh, but at least he has f3 so that after queen yeah. e2, queen takes f6. Very, very key. Uh, f3... A lucky inner Mizzo, so it turns out that uh, didn't miss it. But let's take the live board over there to Jurovec's game versus Min Lee. So and that, that did that. happen. The queen takes f6, but... Yeah. Oh, yeah, this looks... I'm trying to think, think see, like, a knockout blow for white here. Yeah, it, it seems it seems imminent. Like, um, 90, 96 strong, threatening queen g7 mate, forcing you to play... I like that move. Mm -hmm. Knight 96 also threatens things like knight f8, where you cut off the queen from guarding h8 mate as well, right? So knight 6 in fact, as we there say it, Zurevec loves it. And then queen g8 is the only move. you got to stop queen g7. Yep. And queen now g8. I'm wondering about a move like knight, what about the simple knight f4 threatening knight h5? You well, can't take with the pawn because it's other, The other simple move here is just g4, actually. g4 threatens g5 oh, nice. checkmate. And, well, G5 and Knight F8, yeah, G, mate. G5 and Knight F8. I actually think Jurabek will play G4, unless he sees something better than we do. But Yeah, because after my, my idea was Knight F4 
take and then takes on h5. I love this idea of king takes h5, queen g5 mate. Yeah, that also but very you're nice. Right. I like the, in, in principle, I like g4 more because we're bringing another piece into the attack. Right. When well, you have such great domination of the uh, positional factors of the game, you can just use a pawn as an attacking piece. That's a lesson here. Yeah, black's pieces are, are completely frozen here, so g4 becomes really strong. Uh, but as you highlighted, knight f4 would be a fun move to then, you know, black makes some move, you take h5, and, and that's made, so I think uh, Jurabek can choose his path to victory. Really nice idea, Danny, though, g4. such such in, So instructive, you know. When I, when I first got this idea that a pawn could be used as an attacking piece, when you had enough positional yep. domination, it was really an eye opener. And there it is, G4 and it was on the played, board. And I actually get a chance to use my emote. It's my favorite emote. I have a G4 emote. Oh, I thought it was going to be I, I was right emote, and I was like, I bet you don't get to use that often. Exactly. <laughs> Sorry. I don't. I don't use an I was right emote. <laughs> although I should have one just for the irony of it. The irony of using. <laughs> it. Um, but no. Okay. There's my G4 emote. Um. And uh, Zurabek is going to win this one, which is really going to put the pawn grabbers up against the wall. But okay, back to Liang's game. It looks better than it did before. Uh, Red Nova versus Azarov here. The Rook has finally gotten active for, for Liang. So I feel like this is better than it was before, but, but maybe still not as, as clean as this victory once was. So, yeah. All right, well, but again, if Ehrenberg wins, I think he should. Uh, Red Nova still is probably the only one who can win, but it, it does still feel like a lot's going to come down to this game between Jacobson and you, uh, more commonly known as one random versus a happy pawn. Um, That's right. They, all, they both have, they're both keeping pace on the clock. I mean, this is really a, a well-played game so far, I think. Yeah, but... I agree. They're playing good moves, and they're also um, both at three minutes. You know, it's not one of those games where one person gets into massive time trouble, kind of teasing the other one to try to blitz out their moves and win on time. Yep. Well, let's look at this one here between Jacobson and you. Um, well, we're we'll seeing one. one. Yeah, so he's trying to attack on the side of the board where Jen, Jen seems like she has some weaknesses, but she also has some strengths, right? Yep. That nice kind of uh, blockade on the c4 square, you can't, because our pawn's on a4, it's really posted up. And yep. traditionally, that light square bishop is such a problem piece in the French, but here, it has nothing to cry about. Yeah, no, it's it's definitely well placed. I think the biggest issue for black is that because the, the king side play gen didn't turn into attack with the open g file or, or maybe these ideas we were highlighting of trying to open up lines, that means that you're really worried about these pawns being weaknesses instead in the long term, right? Instead of the attack, Black's rook on h8 is kind of forever stuck worrying about h5. I mean, okay, at the same token, you could argue White's knights are stuck over there doing that, right? I mean, but it's it's an interesting dynamic here. Um, and, and there you go. Aaron Jacobson kind of just playing the simple approach. He might just take h5 now with the knight. Um... And you have to be you have to be careful about that if you're if you're you because he might just take the money and run, grab h5 and get out. Mm. So that's well, it's always it's always going to be messy in this time control. I, I I just I have these visions of the bishop somehow landing on e4 one day. <laughs> I agree, and, and no, that was something I was saying earlier that if that's what you could work, you'd be very happy as black. But I think it's I think it's hard to figure out a concrete way to do that, and now. Now I think white's going to play knight h to g2. Um, because you no longer need that knight on h4 like you did before blockading. Right, right. That's a good idea. So queen g5 played by Jen, defending the pawn on h5. Um, queen e3 instead was Aaron's choice. Trying to try, Again, trying not to get behind, too behind on the clock. Is we're now playing a two-minute game yeah. in this kind of closed, rich position, Danny. So and, it's, and I it's feel well like the time far, pressure... I feel like the time pressure battle favors you, and maybe that's just because I, I think that, you know, she's a very good Rapid and Bliss player. She's played a lot on our side. I don't know why. I felt like if the position stayed roughly the same, but mutual time pressure ensues, that she would be okay. And maybe I'm, maybe I'm totally wrong. I mean, we'll see how that goes. Uh, um, Queen, Queen G4 played by Jen. That's, that's risky. 
White can even just play h3 to kick the queen out. Um, for the record, everybody, uh, the game between Real Boy and Wonderful Time, i.e. The, the g4 mating that I did, was, is over, so that's why you see the score of 8-5 to five for the Marshals. Um, so the other three games Spurs are all still going, though. Even the score. And uh, by the way, I I heard that uh, we call Count Dracula Kamra Kolab. Is that his nickname? What a great yeah. nickname. I think we should go back wow. to Azarov's game against Liang, though, because now, now this one takes on even more significance. We officially have the uh, the win for the Marshal, so the, so the pawn grabbers need a clean sweep here to tie this match. They need to grab every pawn left on the board. <laughs> yes, that's Last right. Last game of the year, Dan. Don't hold any puns back now. That's um, possible. Yeah, no, but I think Liang is, is in decent shape here. He's blockaded the two pass pawns. It's amazing how painful this position is, Jen, about the doubled F pawns. If you literally just change one thing about this position for White and move that F4 pawn to, say, G3, and White can actually use the pawn majority, it's just an easy win. And But here, here White, White yeah. lacks counterplay because of the horrible structure. Right, we're an active way to try to win. Yeah, yeah. And, it, and that might be the difference, actually. Just the lack of a healthy king side preventing white from using the three-on-two majority. No, no pass pawns for you. And this is, and this is what a wanderer is struggling with. Is he gets down to just twenty-three seconds on the clock? He knows that he needs to win this game, but yep. can he? Okay, well, we got to keep on all three. We're, we're about to have a photo finish here. Will the pawn grabbers? Get a clean sweep. Let's check quickly on Aaron Burke's game uh, against Miranda. He has a better rook ending, but not nearly what it once was. Uh, well, okay, I think White is still the only one who can win, but it's not over yet there for Miranda. Unfortunately, I'm looking at this. Oh, look, he won the F5 pawn. Back to the Liang game. He played bishop c2 and managed to take f5 and at the perfect time because Black can't play b3 without c3 falling. That's why Ooh. the bishop was on this diagonal. Okay. Well, so this I, looks. I think Liang is going to win now. I think he did it. Yep. Rook b3 played, but it's, it's actually getting. It's actually peeling big time. So my hand hurts. Sorry. Aww. It hurts. Chest injuries. I need Chess. another band aid. Thank you. Don't you don't remember when Wesley so uh, his hair started he bleeding? Actually bleeding. Like, yeah, this is this is this is how <laughs> rough the day has been today. You know, just moving the mouse here. Um, all right, but look at this technique there. I like it. F five. So Liang does find a way to use these doubled F pawns, right? Freddie, eat your heart out. Here we go. Gonna get a queen there. Um, ah, but we have bad news if we're in the world of the marshals. Jennifer drew her game with ah. with Aaron Jacobson. You mean for the pawn grabbers? It's the, good news for the marshals. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, yes. Bad news for the uh, pawn grabbers. But interesting decision for her to just repeat like this. I think, uh, I mean, kind of a poor one, if I may be so bold. You know what I think, Jen? I think she did, if you look at the repetition, I don't think she realized that the position had repeated three times. Because it, ah. it got there in such a unique way. Like, go back to move 30. Okay, when the position first occurs with the knight on b6, the rook on c7. So after queen d2, rook h c8, that's one time. Got it, yeah. Two Maybe. times. Three. That could definitely be the case. And now that's uh, that has clinched the victory for the marshals. Well, I'm trying to see. what Was there a draw offered here? Pittsburgh pawn grabbers uh, put up quite a, quite a tough battle. I was trying to look at what happened if there was a draw offered because I didn't actually see the three move repetition, meaning I would be oh it what did occur sorry it occurred right here queen e three king b eight queen e three there and then queen e three again yeah so I think she just didn't realize she was creating a repetition, and that's a good lesson for everybody a lot of players new to the game of chess think that the threefold repetition draw rule only occurs if it's the exact same moves back and forth but it's not the case it could be. In theory, it could be 25 moves in between. The same exact position occurring three times is a threefold repetition. And here, that's uh, that's indeed why. Not to say that you would have gone on to win, but I, you know, she obviously didn't want to take a draw because she just clinched the match for the marshals. 
Yes, although honestly, I mean, in the beginning of this match, it looked kind of more promising, but now yep. it seems like everything has to go their way because yep. even the games that we kind of had counted out for, for Black uh, are looking pretty tense. Well, I think, uh, I think Liang is going to win his game, and I think, okay, Aaron Burke's game looks like it might end in a draw, so it may end up being a final score of 9-7, to seven, not 8.5, 7.5, but... Um, still a very close match here between the pawn grabbers and the marshals. Meanwhile, um, of course, our, our final match of the day is the chess bras, the champions of chess bras have clinched that match in the last round, but Indeed. plenty of drama still there because we are sweating um, whether they will top the archbishop's bishop's 11 points to um Ultimately, uh... ultimately, yeah. The uh, the bras are fighting for first place overall. Looks like Aaron Berg is just going to settle on the draw. Indeed, he does. So we are officially done covering the pawn grabbers and the bishops. So let's go to board one first of the chess bras. We have Elyanov with the white pieces versus Saric. Elyanov seems to be rebounding against his fellow 2700 opponent here after losing back-to-back -back games. If you're just joining us. Elyanov lost to both Eric Hansen and Robin Van Kampen, so the chess bras really bring in it today. But Elyanov is much better here as white. Just a beautiful queen on e5. But don't forget, I mean, Elyanov really played a really nice game against Hansen in the the first part of the game, and it was a this astonishing turnaround. Yeah, it was a, it was an, an accidental brilliancy, as we call it, right? I don't even well, know. I I don't even know that, that Eric fully... I mean, I, who knows, right? But at Rook A8, yeah. either an accidental blunder with Rook B7 or accidental brilliancy, right? I mean, it was a very, very great game. Obviously, um, it'll probably be included in a lot of post-match reports. So if you are also just getting here and want to know everything that happened, uh, go to chess.com slash news. You can also join the official Pro Chess League club on chess.com to stay up to date with everything. Um, okay, Elyanov is the only one who can probably win this game. Look at... Look at uh, Van Kempen's game versus Kempsey because this is this is crazy. Uh, Fernandez has a brilliant position here on the attack, and I think just about to win. I think Van Kempen has just got himself in a world of hurt. That's right. I knight h5. Look at queen e5. Played instantly. Very strong move there by Fernandez. Oh. He's hitting everything. Hitting h5. Hitting g7. One of the big issues, Jen, is that knight f6 now fails to rook takes g7, king takes, and queen g5 lights out. Winning. Lovely victory here coming in from Daniel Fernandez. The an upset yeah. victory. I think this one is. Uh, I think it's Red Rover. I think it's over. Yeah. Uh, Sweet. Well, th that's a nice way to to gain some honor back. As of yeah, course they got the champions. Every point matters, right? At this point, because you don't want to have a, a lopsided defeat. So, could be a very big win here for them. Well done, Daniel Fernandez. So he'll take back on d6. Probably going to win the attack. Let's look at Hansen's game versus Alexander Katz. Here, Hansen in a very comfy position, comfy and cozy with two bishops. Pointing at the enemy king. This is this is how we like it. I mean, White can play queen c3, queen c5, and just inchworm her way into a into a battery. And Hansen's also up eight minutes on the clock, so uh, really, really playing playing well today. And is he on the verge of going 4-0, or did he draw his last game? I think he. I, think he drew yeah, I, was trying, I was trying to. I was asking the same question myself. Yeah. yeah. I don't remember what happened in Hansen's last game. I know he won his first two games against Fernandez and Elyanov, respectively. I forget um, what happened in the last game, but I, I think he won. So I think he's on the verge of going 4-0. Yeah. Um, if, but if he wins this game, yeah, or you you think it's? What do I you think, think I think this is just almost over. I too mean, good. this because, is like, I think he played Queen B4. Yeah, I don't think that Black can deal with the threats on b7 and the dark square bishop here. I mean, yeah, uh, I'm one move away from from blundering mate, or worse. You're right. I mean, groveling type. Yeah, I mean, we some of these moves. It's hard to even kind of come up with good groveling moves here, Daddy. Yeah. <laughs> it hurts when you can't even grovel, right? 
Yeah, I'm like, oh. Elyanov might restore a little bit of faith in uh, him in the sense that he didn't perform well as a hired gun for the champions in, a, in, in the free agent sense today. But again, we saw this a lot last year, Jen. Um, again, I'm expecting Elyanov to do okay here in this position against Sarge, but last year the St. Louis Archbishops hired Fedoseyev as a free agent, and consistently, you know, he was joining, he was joining them when it was, you know, 2, 3 a.m. in Moscow. And right. um, unless you're unless that's your thing, that's your lifestyle. A lot of people don't operate that way, at least in terms of their best chess being played at that hour. And Spoken and I like a true dad. You know, you're all, <laughs> well, I mean, ultimately, the Bishops did make the Final Four, our live final in San Francisco. And if they had Fabiano Caruana instead of playing in a small tournament known as the Candidates, um, you know, they might have still won. The Bishops uh, would have, but. I don't know that I don't know that Fedoseyev was the best free agent acquisition ever, and this year they have a better plan, which is two American St. Louis-based GMs on boards one and two, and then some. They actually have some lower-rated free agents, and I like that by the Bishops this year. Um, anyway, I, I'm just I'm just providing a little bit of context to my opinion that I think it's hard for some of the Western-based teams to hire to hire the 2,700 hired guns from Eastern Europe like Elyanov because he clearly didn't have his best chess today. Yeah, I guess it just really depends on the person, whether yeah. that, that'll bring your, your A game or not. Uh, yep. We're getting a lot of comments in the chat in uh, praise of Hansen. BJH13 says, Hansen's MVP this week. Yep. Reverend says, watching Hansen get adopted by Naka multiple times these past couple weeks, it's easy to forget how ridiculously strong he is. Yeah, exactly. And People forget. It's easy to forget how ridiculously good. I mean, when you go up against a car Nakamura and Blitz and Bullet, the bad things happen. Bad things. <laughs> that's, I mean, right? Enter at your own risk, as they say. Um, but again, Hanson. But that's the mark of a champion, too. Wanting to always play against the best. Yep. Well, you, Hanson's you about to put this one away. You can see the live board. I'll move the analysis board back. So if he wins this, that's a 10 to 3 score. I do believe Elyanov will, br Elyanov will bring the champions to a 4 score. He looks like he's doing well against Saric. So. The question is whether Fernandez will get this victory with the white pieces. Looks like he will. Um, and that means we're probably just going to have a tied score again. I think we're going to see the chess bras and the archbishops move into the next week still completely dead even. They're not only the two best teams so far in the Atlantic Gen, they're winning their matches by the same exact score. I'm predicting right now the bishops and, and, and bras will both win today by a score of 11-5. to five. And, and so... Really interesting to see how tight how tight those two teams are. Twinning. They're twinning. Um, again, we'll, we'll show the standings one more time before we're done today. Just remind everybody what the score was heading into today's play. Uh, but uh, So Fernandez wins. Hansen's about to win. Um, and a big reminder that um, after our show is over, we've got uh, Alexandra Botez and Robert Hess covering... Uh, right. Another slate of of games until uh, until midnight. That's right. We've got a full slate of pro chess league. Still, there's four. It's hard to think that you and I have been doing this for four hours, and there's four more hours of chess left. Yeah. You know, I gotta I gotta go coach basketball right after this. I'm actually already a little bit late. So you know what? Hashtag dad life. Hashtag thug life. They're very close. <laughs> They're very comparable. Dads <laughs> That's and a thugs. Good day, though, isn't um, it? All right. Well, the one thing that could prove me wrong, I guess, is if Kurtz pulls the upset. And gets a win here against Tian Tian Ki Wong, and and actually this is this, that's not outside the realm of possibility here. So Fernandez has beaten Van Campen. If you're just getting here, that's over. Hansen indeed just beat Katz. I'm expecting Elyanov to win, but this is not this is not a very clear position. All although after Knight takes d6, did whoa was Bishop takes g4 possible there? Maybe both Kurtz and Wong just mm -hmm. missed that. Um, that's, a good, that's a good one. Bishop takes g4, followed by knight takes with check. I felt like there was a potential mating that. No, I'm just dead wrong. Okay, never mind. Never mind. Okay, so Kurtz is defending here. All he needs, though, is a draw to, uh, to perhaps... Right, he was defending against a knight f3 idea. Queen c3, queen f2 played, uh, and now your bishop g4 idea looks like it could get nasty. Yep. Maybe. Uh, I don't know. I don't know if 
it's, it's enough because your queen so adroitly defends those key squares. Queen g3 played, but obviously black's not going to trade queens. Queen c5. Kurtz is, Kurtz is actually in trouble now down on the clock, so maybe maybe I am wrong to believe they're going to win by the exact same score yet again because if, if Wang pulls this off, then... Uh, then actually the final score will end up being, I think, 10-6, to 6, meaning that the bishops will have their first clear lead of the season. No, I don't think so. I think it wouldn't it be 11. Oh, wait. Because I'm, I'm, I'm predicting Elyonov wins against Saric. Ah, right, 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 right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But okay, this I, game could be a draw. I mean, right now Saric... That game's still going on, right. Saric has created the G-pawn as enough counterplay to, to maybe just get a perpetual, right? The point is so maybe have... ten and a half, ten and a half, uh, five and a half. Yeah, Which seems possible. Another though, possibility yeah. for sure. Yeah. Okay. The uh, the yeah. D-pawn is super dangerous, and I I still think that Elyonov or White should be winning, but you know, computers playing this position might see it differently. Maybe Black has a chance at a perpetual check. Combined with threats of the G pawn racing with the D pawn, um, the the real okay. Here's a question: If Sarge played Queen F3 check, can White play Queen E3 check as a response, Jen? Like, what happens in this King and Pawn ending with two outside passers versus White's C and D passers? That's a that's a that's a puzzle. I, it's not even puzzle hush or puzzle rush. I don't know what it is. That's just long calculations. Long calculation. <laughs> the, the, my, my old enemy. Calculation and hard work. Um, my old nemesis coming back. Um, all right, what about, what about Kurtz's game against Wayne? Looks like Kurtz is actually in more trouble than, uh, than I first thought because the open king and not a lot of time on the clock makes me nervous. Yeah, it looks like they've been... You, you're talking about the curse game, right? The curse yeah. wang game. Now, now is their bishop takes g4. You got to be considering if you're wang. No, he doesn't go for it again. Bishop takes g4. Now, there it is. That's the, that's the ticket. The fork happening. He finally got it in. Finally got it in, and that's, that's going to be tough but, here for Kurtz. What about moving our queen away while threatening a trade? Or ignoring it, right? Move the eight ball. Yeah, we go. that's what he chose. Uh, not a huge fan of that move. I think I think Black can probably take f5. Although I guess Kurtz has a creative point. He's saying you take my knight. I'm not even going to spend a lot of time calculating that you may have something with your queen and knight because I'm just purely trying to open up this bishop so I can so I can push a6. So it's an interesting idea. I mean, and and Wang Wang buys it, decides to back up. Queen B8, forcing King G1. Or compelling King G1, rather. Oh, we, we, uh, we're going to find out the answer to my query. We have the queens traded in the Sarich game versus Elyanov. And actually, what in the world is going on here? Sarich manages to get it and maintain the more active king. Holy shenanigans. Is black... There's no way black is better in this endgame now, right? Um, um, maybe it's a standstill. No, but now, because there's all these outside ideas where you abandon the D-pawn and go checkmate white. I actually think that this is, I think this is winning for black. Because white, white is stuck. You can't How? push the D-pawn. How do you do it? So you can't push the D-pawn, can't push the C-pawn. So that's out. And the point is, you get one step closer on... Okay, what ends up happening is both sides are going to get a queen and black is going to mate. I'm just going to show you a line. Like, okay, so g3, a4. Okay, maybe it doesn't work. Oh, look at that, b5. That's how he does it. Oh, yeah. Just undermines immediately. Okay, I was looking for an idea to just leave the d-pawn and mate white, but just immediately. Oh, my gosh, what a day for if you're Elyanov. Are you kidding me? But instead, c5, king d5, a3 played. I think black is still winning. with. He brings the king to f5, yeah. which is within the box. Everybody pay attention to some king upon ending knowledge here. You always want to keep your king within the box. And this is what I mean by box. You can draw arrows 
to all of the corresponding squares in a straight line. So if the king stays within a box, that means that this pawn is never threatening to push. It will always get caught, right? So once the king gets to f5, the king goes here. Now how do you win? Because the mo okay, he goes for it. I'm trying to do it before he does it, so I can actually look like I know something. But let's be honest, I'm not going to know anything or look like it. But anyway, but this is already instructive for everybody. The king is within the box, so this is not a threat, and that means. But how do you win, Jen? Where's the win? You have to find a way to come forward and checkmate White, but and then abandon the c pawn. Something like yeah, king of two. Yeah, that's right. Okay, watch this. Yeah, he's got it. King of two, g three. A6, and now when the king goes back to G2, it's over. King G4, C6, H3 check, king G1, king F3, mm -hmm. king over, H2 check, king F2, C8 queen. Both sides get queens, and white gets mated at the end of the line with queen to G3. This is how these endgames are won. All right, well, let's see. It's going to be a very move-by-move move here. So you're saying king G2, not on the board king yet. G king G2, king G4 is over. I think it's, it's already Four. over. Black's winning. Because if king e3, it's the same thing. g2, king of 2 h3. Eventually, black is now in position to abandon the c-pawn and get checkmate. So that's where white blundered. And if king g2, the line I showed was king g2, king g4, c6, h3. King moves anywhere. The point is I'm coming forward with way too many tempi. With queen g3 mate. Yep. Yeah. And it's just, and it's just mate. OMG. Okay, this is just obviously a really rough day for Elyonov, but... Um, well, at least the good news was that uh, uh, Kurtz did lose that game, so, so it is more point. Well, good news, obviously, if you're the bishops, hoping hoping for it, but I think the chess bras were hoping to get their clear win, which they clearly... clearly uh, not, not going to happen because of the Kurtz loss, but I believe that Elyonov is... He's going to be scratching his head about how to play better in the Pro Chess League at 3 a.m. Because he may end up being a free agent that, that the champions regret. Because right now it's just not looking good. Okay, this this is also winning. What is he doing? Now. Okay. It, oh, my God. Wait a second. No, it is winning. Okay, the king can come to e4 first. All right. And it's yeah. still winning. You get a queen with tempo. King e3, and now king we're starting e3, to play h1 queen c6, again. h1 queen and king of 2 Yeah. To show the line, everybody. c6. You force the king off the square by sacrificing the queen. Um, so here's why Here's why white resigns. c6, h1 queen, king f2, c7. And then the line that uh, we've been talking about to bring it home. Jen, this was quite the day. This was some exciting chess today. Yeah, it's all about B5, you know, and Rook A8, right? All about B5 and Rook A8, but also the Greek gift early on. Uh, let's, let's remind everybody exactly what the standings were headed into today so that they appreciate exactly the drama that we just had there um, with uh, both the Archbishops and the Montreal Chess Bras winning by a score of 11, and 11 to 5. They will remain tied atop the Atlantic Division, which, okay, I think you can make arguments right now as to which is the strongest division in the league, and the Chess Bras and the Archbishops are making a very strong case, because I think you have some really good teams below them that just um, can't even keep pace yet, right? I mean, the the windmills are really good, but it's just hard when you go up against a team led by Carmona and so. So, very exciting stuff. Uh, I don't know that we have much more to add, and that's mainly because the next round of play is right about to begin, Jen, so this has been... A crazy exciting day. The Atlantic Division doesn't see a shakeup at the top of the standings, but we did also have some brilliant match victories by the Montclair Sopranos and the New York Marshals over the uh, the Pawn Grabbers. So, um, any final thoughts before we say so long from Studio C and pass this on to Robert and Alexandra? Well, thanks everybody for for watching and for your comments. I had a blast, Danny. Can't wait to do it again and uh, go coach that basketball team. Yeah, I'm gonna run out right now. Uh, Aaron's going to throw it out. I'm only 15 minutes late, so that's not too bad. And uh, have a good one there. Give give Fob, young Fabi my best. And uh, Aaron, I think we're ready. Take it home. So long, everybody, from Studio C. We'll see you. I will see you on Thursday. And, uh, right? And, uh, Jen, have a great night there on the East Coast. 
And take it away, Alex and Robert. Bye, guys.